Das ist ein Spiel, die machen viel Gnade. Ah, ja. Honorable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous people. Documents. Clark. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sitting of the Senate? Yes, Clark. To committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. Senator Thorpe. Senator Cash, are you seeking the call? Senator Thorpe. I seek leave to move a motion in relation to approvals for new coal mines and gas projects. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Senator Thorpe. Pursuant to contingent notice standing in the name of Senator Waters, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to approvals for new coal mines and gas projects may be moved immediately, determine without amendment and take precedence over all other business for 30 minutes. Mr President, this matter of utmost urgency, let's right now do what needs doing. This is the last chance that we can debate Australia's climate targets before the Prime Minister goes off to Glasgow after being shamed into attending. The Queen, the Queen herself, said she was irritated that leaders like our Prime Minister were, attending in, were intending to not go to Glasgow. It's urgent we debate this matter today, right now, before the Prime Minister further isolates and embarrasses this country on the world stage. Mr President, it is of the utmost importance that the Senate of this country make a commitment that we will not allow any more new coal oil and gas. The Pope—get this—the 
the Pope, the Pope himself, just last week, and this is a direct quote, get this, in the name of God, I ask the great extractive industries, mining, oil, forestry, real estate, agribusiness, to stop destroying forests, wetlands, mountains, to stop polluting, to stop poisoning food and people." End quote. That was the Pope. Come on, we just did prayers. <laughs> the Pope sees the urgency of this issue. The Queen sees the urgency of this issue. The Senate surely must see the urgency of this issue and suspend standing orders. It is our chance right now to send the world a message. Article 2 of the Paris Agreement requires member countries to pursue efforts to limit global temperature increases to 1.5 Celsius <clears throat> above pre-industrial levels. Everyone else got the memo, the Pope, the Queen, but our Prime Minister and his junior coalition partner in the government, I don't know what happened to their memo, by suspending standing orders, we can force the government to take the action we need and fast. Mr President, it is critical that senators in this place suspend standing orders to talk about this now because there is no other part of this parliamentary program where we can debate the need to stop any new oil, coal and gas projects. The government's most recent resources and energy major projects report currently has 72 dirty coal projects and 44 dirty gas projects listed in the construction pipeline. This is unspeakably reckless. Mr President, I just sat here and heard you and everyone else acknowledge country on behalf of the Senate. The Senate acknowledges just now that the country is important to our people. We need to suspend standing orders right now because First Nations people, climate change is a matter of the most extreme importance. Oil, coal and gas are causing our planet to cook, and our people are being impacted by this right now. Zenat Kez, also known as the Torres Strait Islands and the surrounding seas, is the home to, tr to traditional owners who have lived with a deep connection to land, sea, sky, water and culture for over 60,000 years. This is destroying them and everything Senator that Thor, they connect your to. Your time has expired, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And um, the, I can indicate that the opposition will support the suspension uh, today, even though uh, we weren't given the heads up that this was occurring. Um, uh, we do believe that this is a, a matter of utmost importance that the nation is is dealing with, particularly in the lead up to COP. Uh, 26 in the Glasgow meeting, and that this is uh, worthy of the Senate's time um, for debate. I would also indicate that the motion, as it stands, that we also didn't see until it was circulated in the chamber this morning, which um, goes to some of the questions about the Greens' motives here, uh, isn't something that we would agree to, to uh, every word to. I'm just reading it on my feet, though. So. Again, um, you know, I would like that on the record, and I, I would say, you know, I mean, there is some frustration on the from the Labor opposition about the way the Greens are conducting uh, this. I mean, if you were genuinely interested in reaching a consensus or having a debate, I think there are other ways that you would be managing this other than pulling this stunt at the beginning of every sitting morning, uh, particularly talking to us at least about what you were planning on doing. And I would further submit that it appears to me there's no interest in bringing consensus 
position to this chamber about action on climate change. It's not in your political interests to reach consensus. I mean, the Greens' political interest is to continue the fight, is to continue to create, to, to, to stoke division, to stoke division, even with those of, you, of, of us who would share similar views, not exactly the same, but who would want to see effective action on climate change. I would submit that it's not in your interest to see that happen and that we will see the Greens continue to do this and do what they did in 2010, 2013, 2016, 2019 and stoke division. You know, because it's in your political interest to do that as opposed to actually dealing with the issue of climate change and reaching a national consensus that will move this country forward, protect the environment. And, and grow the economy. That's not in your political interest. You want to fight with us, you want to fight with the government, and that's displayed by the tactic here this morning. And I would submit if you want real action on climate change, change the government. Change the government. Don't do it this way by trying to, to have a fight with Labor Order. and have a fight with the government. It, it didn't work in 2010, it didn't work in 2013, it didn't work in 2016, and it's not working now. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, well, well. The Labor Party, uh, as part of the precursor to the Albanese Bant coalition government, calls this a stunt. And the Labor Party is exactly correct. It is a stunt. The number one issue here is integrity and the Greens' lack of integrity, complete lack of integrity. They have never provided the empirical scientific evidence for their claims. First, it was Greta. We'll rely on Greta. Then it became, we'll rely on the Queen. Now it's, we'll rely on the Pope, and most of them are atheists. My goodness, what are we coming to in this country? This mob is hijacking jobs, manufacturing jobs, coal mining jobs, farmers' jobs. This is an absolute disgrace because they show no integrity towards the people of this country. They show no integrity towards this parliament. None whatsoever. They tell lies. And they make up stuff. We see, now, we see now them calling for the science. I want the science. I want the science. I challenge Senator Waters to provide the empirical scientific evidence, evidence that proves carbon dioxide from human activity affects the climate and needs to be cut. Eleven years ago, she failed to provide it. She ran. Senator Roberts, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe, on a point of order. Order, uh, uh, President. Um, Senator over here has uh, called us liars. So I think that is unparliamentary. I think is it? Uh, Sen Senator Thorpe, he was referring to the Greens as a whole. My view is that uh, that is not unparliamentary. I will check with the clerk to be sure, given I'm relatively new to this role. No, my my ruling is correct. Please sit down, Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, there is no point of order. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you. Let's make it clear. I did not call the Queen or the Pope a liar. I called them not scientists. They're not scientists. But this is what the Greens rely on in, in the fact that they cannot provide the science. The Greens show no respect for science, no respect for humanity, no respect for, for the people of this country, no respect for hard-working Australians and the farmers that they will gut with this 2050 net zero. I also remind it's day now seven, 772 since I challenged Senator Alyssa Waters and Senator Di Natale in this, in this parliament to a debate on the, on the empirical evidence and also on the corruption of the science. I point out that there is no science that backs this up from the CSIRO, and I'll have more to say about that next week. There is no science from the Bureau of Meteorology, none from the chief scientists. I can tell you a story about the chief scientists if there is time, the previous chief scientists. The Australian Academy of Science, the IPCC. In fact, we had the Labor Party, Kevin Rudd, dancing around in 2007 saying 4,000 people in white, white lab coats endorsed his claim. The reality is only five academics in the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change endorsed the claim of warming. And there's doubt those five were even, even scientists. We'll hear, we'll hear more rubbish from the Greens claiming that they have science, but the one thing that they always, always are consistent on, they never produce the empirical evidence to justify their claims. They see a picture of a tree frog, a picture of a koala, a picture of a dolphin, and they say, this is the science. That's it. It's complete rubbish. 
11 years, Senator Waters, this is going on. Let me point out, Senator Gallagher, the issue that is of utmost importance is the integrity of this parliament, the integrity of this country, the integrity of state parliaments, the integrity of the people of this country and their jobs and their livelihoods. That is of utmost importance to One Nation, and I wish it was of utmost importance to every single person in this Senate, but clearly it's not. Senator Austin. Would the question be put? The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the question be put. Those, without a, those ayes will pass to the right of the chair, nose to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 24. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Uh, therefore, I will put the question, the motion as moved by Senator Thorpe. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion uh, moved by Senator Thorpe be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator Dean Smith, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. We will return to the order of business. I will give senators a moment to return to their position. And I will call oh, Senator Smith. You're seeking the call. Just on, a, just on a matter of point of order, Mr. President, I draw your attention to Standing Order 193. 1932, which states a senator shall not refer to the Queen, the Governor General, or the Governor of a state disrespectfully in debate, or for the purpose of influencing the Senate in its deliberations. So I hope you just keep that in mind uh, for the future debate we might hear later in the course of today's deliberations. Thank you for that, Senator Smith. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one: migration amendment strengthening the character test bill 2019. Second reading debate. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to contribute to the debate on the Migration Amendment strengthening the Character Test Bill 2019. From the outset, I want to make clear that Labor strongly supports the current powers to cancel or refuse visas on character grounds or criminal grounds which exist under Section 501 and Section 116 of the Migration Act. In 2014, Labor supported amendments to the Migration Act which strengthened the character test and gave the minister the power to cancel the visas of non-citizens and deport foreign criminals. This Thank included you. people convicted of serious crimes and violence involving violence, sexual offences, weapons offences, breaches of AVOs and offences against women and children. Since 2014, the government has cancelled thousands of visas under Section 501 alone. If non-citizens in Australia commit these crimes, the government can and should cancel their visas. In fact, the extremely broad discretionary powers that already exist, thanks to Labor's support, mean that foreigners do not even need to spend a day in jail or be convicted of a crime to have their visa cancelled. Furthermore, the minister also has the powers under the Migration Act to refuse the visas of people of bad character before they can even come to Australia. The government can do this if these people pose a risk to the community or they have a violent or criminal past. The minister can also refuse a visa if there's a significant risk to an individual who would vilify a segment of the community or incite discord or represent danger to them during their time in Australia. All of these powers currently exist. Let's talk about the bill and let's talk about a minister for immigration whose word can't be trusted and a prime minister who would rather play politics with domestic violence than get an outcome that would actually make life safer for women and children. First of all, the minister for immigration, Alex Hawke. Let me say up front, I like Alex Hawke. I acknowledge since he took the role of immigration minister, he and I have been able to work together on a number of bipartisan initiatives. Changes to the Distinguished Talent Visa that would let Quade Cooper and other distinguished Australians, yes, people who should be Australian but currently aren't, be able to call Australia home. Quicker responses to visa applications during the height of the Afghanistan crisis, important to many Labor MPs who represent large sections of the Afghan-Australian community. Minister Hawke and I work together. These examples of bipartisanship in the national interest mean it is all the more disappointing that yesterday the Minister for Immigration reneged on a deal 
to work with me over the next two weeks to come up with a plan to get an agreement on this bill. Yesterday at noon, the minister and I met. We struck a deal to negotiate a final position on this bill and bring it back for the final sitting fortnight of this year. At the heart of that deal, Minister Hawke and I agreed to work on Ministerial Direction 90 and to consider changes sought by the Temporary Visa Working Group, by the National Advocacy Working Group on Women on Temporary Visas Experiencing Violence, and by the In Touch Multicultural Center Against Family Violence. The minister sat there in his office and agreed with me that he and I would work together over the next fortnight to finalize these changes to the ministerial direction to keep women and children safe. The minister also agreed that he and I would work together over the next fortnight to consider what, if any, changes we might make to the government's own amendment to its own bill to ensure that low-level offending was not inadvertently captured by the bill. That was at noon yesterday. Just before 5 p.m., the minister's office called mine and pulled that deal. Extraordinary. A minister, a recently promoted cabinet minister, no less, makes a deal to work with the opposition to deliver real changes that would make a real difference to real women and children who experience domestic violence. And then the minister yanks it just a few hours later. And do you know what Minister Hawke said when I spoke to him last night? He said that Senator Ann Rustin had told him the bill had to be voted on today. He blamed the Senate leadership for forcing him to renege on that deal. I don't believe that for one minute. There is only one person who can make a cabinet minister renege on a deal and that is the Prime Minister. Clearly, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, has yanked Minister Hawke's chain. The Minister for Immigration made a deal. The Minister for Immigration entered a real, bipartisan negotiation with a genuine intention to make life safer for women and children who are victims of domestic violence, and just four hours later he pulled it. The Prime Minister pulled his chain. Extraordinary. A negotiation, an agreement in good faith with a cabinet minister to defer this bill to the next sitting fortnight and to land a deal overturned within a few hours. Senator Rustin didn't do this. The prime minister did it. And I say the minister's behavior was extraordinary, but this is all too predictable from Prime Minister Morrison. He always looks for the political game. The prime minister never cares about the outcome. The Prime Minister doesn't care about Australians, and the Prime Minister would rather play a political game than go to get a good outcome for victims of family violence. The Prime Minister overruled his Cabinet Minister just so he could run a political wedge on Labor and the crossbench. The Prime Minister is leaving domestic violence victims, women and children, behind. We know, because the, minister, the Prime Minister's own colleagues have told the media, at the heart of the Morrison government, it's a focus group. As Senator Faravanti Wells told this Senate last week, this week, it's not the Prime Minister's office, it's the Prime Marketing Office. The Prime Minister is so obsessed with serving his own political agenda that he is willing to shame, embarrass, and weaken his own cabinet colleague, Alex Hawke. I almost feel sorry for Minister Hawke. He's had the rug pulled out from under him. He's been shown to be weak in the cabinet. He's been shown to be a minister who cannot keep his word. This is a prime minister whose character constantly reveals to the Australian people he is obsessed with politics, and he never delivers. So let's understand this. No matter what the government members might say in this debate today, this bill does not need to be finalized this week. You're going to hear from those opposite breathlessly declaring this bill is so urgent and vital and we need to get it resolved today or tomorrow. It certainly can't be left to the next sitting fortnight. Let's understand any claim that this legislation is somehow considered urgent by the government is simply untrue. The government first introduced this bill in 2018, 2018, more than a thousand days ago. They never brought it to a vote. 
Then they reintroduced it after the 2019 election. I wrote to the then Immigration Minister, David Coleman, in September 2019. I outlined the three things that Labour sought from the government in order to secure passage of this bill. And I never got a response. Never got a response. I didn't hear from Minister Coleman. I didn't hear from Minister Tudge. I'm now on to the third immigration minister of this tired eight-year-old government, Minister Hawke. And he only raised this bill with me last week. For the first time, we exchanged letters. We had a conversation. We agreed to meet. We met yesterday. We agreed yesterday at noon to a process to settle this bill in the next sitting fortnight. Three years since the bill was first introduced, two years after I first wrote to the immigration minister, Finally, an immigration minister in this tired government decides to engage in a genuine constructive dialogue and then within four hours welches on his word. This isn't a genuine legislative process by the government. It is a political running gun game, a political ploy from a prime minister that only serves his political interest, not the national interest, and certainly not the interests of women and children. If this bill was so urgent, the government would have dealt with it when they first introduced it, when I first wrote to them or indeed would have dealt with it genuinely, as Minister Hawke sought to do yesterday. So what is the intent of those opposite trying to pass this legislation? They have brought this forward in an abhorrent gutter politics at its very worst, a new low for this tired eight-year-old government that's plumbed new depths under Mr. Morrison. If there has been a single instance of domestic violence in the last 1,090 days that could have been prevented by the government actually engaging on this bill constructively with the opposition to get it passed, well, then that incident sits on their heads. Today, today, this is another effort by Scotty from Marketing, the Prime Minister from Marketing, to change the narrative to fix up his own failures. His failures on quarantine, his failures on vaccine rollout, his failures to lead. This is the Prime Minister. It's not my job. That's a matter for the states. I don't hold a hose, mate. Too little, too late. It's always a political game. Let's talk about this bill. First of all, I'm a little concerned that the Minister for Immigration fails to understand he already has the power to deport perpetrators of domestic violence. He fails to understand that women and children who are the victims of domestic violence, whether they are on temporary visas or Australian citizens at the hand, who suffer violence at the hands of visa holders, they are often at risk, those women and children, if they report domestic violence. Their visa status is also, also at risk. Sometimes you have Australian children with a mother who's on a visa, and those children are at risk of being separated from their mother. These are real things that happen. And the minister yesterday agreed to work with me to resolve them, and four hours later pulled that deal. Now, in relation to this bill, Labor has outlined two years ago to the government the three concerns that we had with this legislation. The removal of retrospectivity, a concern first highlighted by Jason Wood and the Government Controlled Committee on Migration. And Jason Wood called for the removal of retrospectivity. Labor also highlighted the concern that low-level offending would be inadvertently captured by this bill. A concern the government has acknowledged is real. They're moving an amendment to their own bill. I don't think it goes far enough. Minister Hawke and I agreed yesterday to talk about how we can improve that amendment. We agreed we would work over the next two weeks to fix it. But no, as we noted, the minister had the rug pulled out from under him. Not by Senator Rustin, I don't believe that for a minute, but by the prime minister, who would rather get a political game going than deliver a pragmatic and practical outcome to help keep women and children safe. And Labor raised the concern about the effect this bill, the disproportionate effect that it would have on our friends in New Zealand. The New Zealand government has made a submission and appeared at Senate inquiries. The New Zealand government does not just randomly appear at government inquiries, but they said that this bill would, quote, make a bad situation worse for New Zealanders and therefore New Zealand. This is one area of people-to-people -people relationships where the New our Prime Minister, the New Zealand Prime Minister, is pointing out the corrosive effect, and we don't want it to be corrosive to our political relationship. 
Those are the words of the New Zealand High Commissioner. This bill could put our relationship with our most close neighbour, our dear friends, in jeopardy, which is why Labor has asked the government to review and revise the ministerial direction. And we're not the ones that first raised this. Jason Wood raised it in the government-controlled committee. Jason Wood said that this ministerial direction should be revised to lessen the impact on New Zealanders. These are all matters that Labor raised two years ago, and we only heard back from the government this week. So in conclusion, what I say to the Minister for Immigration, come back to the negotiating table. You and I, Minister, had a constructive conversation yesterday. You and I discussed how we were going to make life safer for women and children who are victims of domestic violence. You and I, Minister Hawk, discussed how we were going to work together to ensure that this bill did not capture low-level offending. And then you welched on the deal. Your Prime Minister pulled the rug out from under you. Well, stand up to the Prime Minister and tell him just this once. He doesn't get to play a political running gun game. He should deliver a real outcome, a pragmatic outcome an outcome that would make women and children safer, an outcome that would ensure low-level offending is not captured, something you've already agreed, Minister, is a problem with your own bill. And frankly, Minister, you should ensure that our close friends and neighbours in New Zealand are not disproportionately affected, and you should not corrode the relationship with New Zealand. So I say to the Minister, come back to the negotiating table. Now, if we get today to the committee stage, I flag that we have amendments. We have amendments to deal with visa privatization. We have amendments, and by the way, visa privatization, the government's raised a concern about electronic tourist visas in terms of our amendment. I say to the government, fine, we'll fix that up. But you should rule out visa privatization. And we have amendments that seek to deal with New Zealand. But what I say to the government, before we get to a final position on this bill, what I say to the minister, come back and do your job, mate. Come back and engage in a genuine legislative process. Don't just kowtow and be the water boy for the prime minister who would rather play a political game. You know this is wrong. This chamber knows this is wrong. And we can do better to make life safer for women and children. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, we've seen a few government bills that lapsed at the proroguing of the last parliament introduced into this parliament in a better form than they were previously drafted in. Sadly, this is not one of those bills. This bill is identical to one tabled in the previous parliament, which the government did not bring on for debate in the Senate because it knew it didn't have the numbers to pass it. This legislation, the Migration Amendment Strengthening the Character Test Bill 2019, is police state legislation. It's legislation that seeks to make a Minister of the Crown judge, jury and jailer. This is another, yet another, piece of legislation introduced by the government to solve a problem that doesn't exist. This is wedge politics at its absolute lowest. And despite the government's hyperbole and its out of control rhetoric on the issue of crime in this country, crime rates in Australia are in fact decreasing. This bill is far more about stigmatising and persecuting particular groups of people than it is about public safety. And it's about, of course, throwing a massive wedge at the Australian Labor Party. It's also, sadly and extremely disappointingly, about increasing the, extra the extrajudicial power of the Minister for Immigration. Now, we know this government's got a problem with migrants, and in fact, 
just yesterday, this Senate failed to disallow a regulation introduced by this government to nearly double the fees at the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal for people to appeal uh, certain migration decisions that this government makes. Pricing migrants out of access to justice. That was just yesterday. And now we get another anti-migrant bill presented to the Senate today. Because there's nothing, or I should say there is very little that this government likes more than scapegoating and demonising migrants in Australia. As submitted to the Senate inquiry into this bill by Cheryl and others, this bill will possibly increase the number of people captured by Section 501 of the Migration Act 1958 by a factor of five. Of particular concern, this will clearly catch people who are highly unlikely to be any kind of an ongoing threat to, Australian, to the Australian community. Round them up and kick them out is the mantra of this government. This is the behaviour of a far-right government, a government in early-onset fascism. This is not the behaviour of a contemporary liberal democracy. This is not the behaviour of a government that believes in the rule of law. This is the behaviour of a government that believes in extrajudicial authority and a government that seeks to actively undermine the rule of law in Australia. Of the hundreds of visa cancellations made uh, by Minister Dutton using the last tranche of draconian Section 501 powers bestowed on him by the parliament, most have been made against people of New Zealand background or Pacific Island background, many of whom have spent most or all of their lives here in Australia, most of whom have extended families here, many of whom have little or no support networks in New Zealand or the Pacific Islands. More than a third of all New Zealanders who have had their visas cancelled under Section 501 in recent years haven't set foot in New Zealand for over a decade. As New Zealand Prime Minister Ardern appealed during her visit to Australia last year on the matter of people with stronger ties to Australia than New Zealand being deported under Section 501 as it currently stands, she said this, send back Kiwis, genuine Kiwis, do not deport your people and your problems. That is what she said to Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison. But unfortunately, deporting our people and our problems is exactly what this corrosive and unfair legislation does. But not everyone ministers have targeted under 501 powers have been of New Zealand or Pacific Island backgrounds. Some have been First Nations people of this country, of our country. I remind colleagues that uh, cultural heritage in Australia provides evidence of Aboriginal culture stretching as far back as 80,000 years on this bit of land that is now called Australia. But apparently this is not enough of an argument for people who are Aboriginal to stay in Australia, according to this government. The Love and Tom's ruling in February 2020, where the High Court quite rightly ruled that Aboriginal people are not aliens under the Constitution and therefore cannot be deported, sought to ensure that such travities of justice could no longer be entertained by a colonialist government. And I remind folks that this country was stolen, this land was never ceded, and we still do not have a treaty or treaties with Australia's first people. I remind folks that for a large part 
of this colonial period in Australia over the last 220 odd years, uh, a white Australia policy existed. So it's with high levels of concern that the Greens note that Ministers Hawke and Andrews, the Ministers for Immigration and Home Affairs, Home Affairs respectively, are now working to overturn that landmark decision of the High Court. What an absolute disgrace that is, and I can assure the government the Australian Greens will have a lot more to say on that when the time comes. Under this legislation before us today, every permanent resident in this country, even if they've spent practically their whole lives here, who are products of our schools, who've worked in our communities, who've got families here, who've paid taxes here in some cases for many decades, every one of them, if they have a misdemeanour conviction against their name, they'll be worried. They will now, if this legislation passes, be squarely in the government's crosshairs. No matter how long they've been living in Australia, they will fail the character test if they've been convicted of a designated offence at any point in the past. Even if this conviction happened decades ago, while the person was relatively young, and even if the person has no recent convictions whatsoever, they can be kicked out of the country under this legislation and not allowed back in. Retrospective laws like this are highly inconsistent with the rule of law, and that's why the Australian Greens are pushing back so hard. This bill, of course, will also impact on the rights of welfare of children, rights and welfare of children, and is in clear breach of our commitment to international obligations to the protection of children, like the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Already we've seen existing Section 501 powers ripping apart families and separating parents from children and grandparents from grandchildren. This bill will also move the so-called character test away from an individual sentence-based model to an arbitrary penalty model. So rather than being tested against the sentence a judge actually imposed on someone, knowing all the facts of a case, they will now be effectively tried by the government against the maximum length of time a designated offence may be potentially sentenced. Most of the people this bill targets are people who already have significant challenges accessing justice. People who have no access to free legal assistance, and the provisions in this bill will only further restrict their access to justice. It is a blatant targeting of migrants and a blatant attempt to bypass judicial process and the rule of law. It does this as the bill was, current, uh, as the bill was initially tabled by lowering an already low bar for refusing or cancelling the visas of non-citizens for reasons such as sharing intimate images, verbally threatening someone, associating with particular people or even holding a rock in a threatening way. I note, after many years across two parliaments, that yesterday the government circulated an amendment to tidy up the definition of designated offences in the bill to provide that the offence must cause or substantially contribute to physical or mental harm to another person or involve family violence as defined by the Family Law Act. Because the government, quite extraordinarily, now seeks to pitch this as a women's rights bill. The flagrant disregard for the rule of law aside, if this government really wanted to get tough on domestic violence and do more to protect women in Australia from being harmed and in far too many tragic cases being murdered by men, there are far better and far better targeted ways to do that. And the Australian Greens would welcome that long overdue conversation. The government's also argued that this bill would make it harder for decisions to deport people to be defeated on appeal. And here we go. They've said the quiet part out loud. This is about denying people access to justice. 
because this government seeks to undermine the rule of law. This government seeks to increase the extrajudicial powers of the Minister for Immigration because it doesn't like it when its vindictive, poorly made decisions are overturned on appeal to the AAT or into our court system. The government, of course, is still smarting after its decision to cancel the visa of a 73-year-old who would spent his whole life in Australia was overturned after it was unable to prove that the minister had spent more than 11 minutes considering the case. Yes, this man had committed a heinous crime, but for all intents and purposes, the man was an Australian, the product of our society here in Australia with an Australian education and an Australian family, someone who was rightfully tried and sentenced under Australian law and did his time in an Australian jail. As Prime Minister Ardern said last year, do not deport your people and your problems. But that is exactly what this bill seeks to do. This is another shameless power grab to provide the government, and in particular the Minister for Immigration, with powers to circumvent and veto the rule of law and our legal system and our court system in Australia. This is another step down the dangerous road to a pre-fascist state in Australia and continues this country down the dark path to being a police state and a surveillance state. This bill is yet another strong argument as to why Australia needs a Charter of Rights. We remain the only liberal democracy in the world that does not have some form of legislatively enshrined or constitutionally enshrined Charter or Bill of Rights. And this government uses that gaping hole in our statutes to continue to erode fundamental law, uh, rights and freedoms that many Australians, including some of my ancestors, fought and died to protect and enhance over the last hundred years. And here we are, this government continues to undermine it and take this country further into pre-fascism and further down the dangerous and dark path to a police state. The Greens oppose this legislation. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Van. Madam Acting Deputy President, as we move out of an environment dominated by COVID-19, which has unfortunately been characterised by border closures and lockdowns, like in my home state of Victoria, we must once again set our sights on what a return to normal will look like. <clears throat> Considering how well the Morrison government has handled the pandemic and the fact that our economy is in a position to continue to grow past COVID-19, Australia will once again become an attractive location for foreign citizens to come and visit, whether it be for tourism, work or to live. Australia is proudly a multicultural nation and a large part of our success has been built on the back of migrants from around the world attracted by some of the, the great many benefits that Australia has to offer. However, unfortunately, not everyone who wishes to come to our shores has good intentions in mind and who do not wish to subscribe to the many values that we hold dear, such as the respect for the rule of law. The respect for the rule of law is a fundamental value that underpins our society. It is what keeps Australians safe and our nation prosperous. The Morrison government is resolutely committed to upholding these values, ensuring that those that enter our borders share, and respect, our, share our respect for the rule of law and value the benefits that this brings to our society. Consistent with the views and expectations of all Australians, the Morrison government has no tolerance for criminal behaviour. Those that engage in crime and who pose a threat to Australians in their homes and communities have no place entering our borders. Once the number of people crossing the border into Australia again begins to increase, 
so too will the threats to our security increase. It is not a right of non-citizens to enter into Australia. It is a privilege. This privilege that we bestow on those entering Australia is one that we must carefully manage. Australians expect that we, as the representatives of the people, have in place the right rules and regulations to ensure that this privilege is not taken, away, taken for granted by those who wish to do us harm. The Morrison government has shown that it is resolute in this commitment to keeping Australians safe. We have recently passed numerous bits of legislation designed to keep Australians safe from, from foreign threats, such as the Independent National Security Legislation Monitor Amendment Bill, the Foreign Intelligence Legislation Amendment Bill, the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identifying Disrupt, Disrupt Bill, and the Counterterrorism Legislation Amendment Sunsetting and Other Measures Bill. And all of these I have spoken on recently in this place. These are just a handful of recent examples of legislation that has passed through the parliament aimed at keeping Australians safe and free from the threat of violence. Recently, as everyone will be aware, the AUKUS announcement was made. This trilateral defence pact can be seen as one of the greatest achievements towards strengthening our national security in recent history and one of the greatest steps taken by an Australian government to keeping Australians safe. These announcements outline the Morrison government's achievements over recent times that go towards keeping Australians safe. This commitment to keeping Australians safe is extended today with the bill before us. We are a welcoming, multicultural, open and cohesive society. At the same time, we need to ensure that we remain safe and secure. The Australian community expects that the Australian government can and should refuse entry to non-citizens or cancel their visas if they do not abide by the rule of law. It must be clear to those who wish to travel to our shores that if you choose to break the law and fail to uphold the standards of behaviour expected by the Australian community, that privilege of residing in Australia will be taken away from you. Madam Acting Deputy President, the purpose of this bill is to amend the Migration Act of 1958 to specify that a person who does not pass the character test, that is, that they have been convicted of a designated offence, may have their visa cancelled or visa application refused. The character test, in one form or another, has been in the Act since 1992. What the Morrison government is doing is ensuring that this test remains in step with the rest of our society and our values. The Migration Amendment, strengthening the character test bill 2019, will ensure that non-citizens who are convicted of certain serious offences and pose a risk to the safety of the Australian community do not pass that character test and are appropriately considered for visa refusal or cancellation. The bill broadens the existing discretionary powers to cancel or refuse visas under the character test. The amendments will allow for discretionary visa refusal or cancellation where a non-citizen has a conviction for a designated offence punishable by at least two years imprisonment. Designated offences include violent and sexual crimes, breaching personal protection orders like AVOs that protect women and children, using or possessing a weapon or assisting with any of these crimes. These, are crimes, these crimes are some of the most serious offences that can be committed and pose a direct threat to our community. The amendments address gaps in the current character test to capture non-citizens who have been convicted of a serious criminal offence, punishable by at least two years imprisonment, have received less than 12 months imprisonment for their crimes and pose a risk to the Australian community. By moving the character test to, onto more objective grounds, the bill will broaden the circumstances in which visas may be cancelled or refused and reduce the likelihood of such decisions being overturned on appeal. The last thing we want is for an individual whose character has been deemed unfit and who poses a direct threat to the Australian community to have their visa cancellation overturned on appeal. By focusing the sentence on, on the sentence available rather than the sentence imposed, the bill also captures offenders 
given sentencing discounts by judges due to plea, be plea bargains, guilty pleas or simply to avoid mandatory visa cancellation thresholds. This responds to precedents set out in Victoria, Queensland, Tasmania, the ACT and South Australia, which gives judges discretion to reduce criminal sentences where an offender may be deported due to their offending. As this power is discretionary, the government will have flexibility to focus on serious crimes perpetrated by criminals who pose a, a genuine and present risk to the Australian community. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, why the Labor Party would oppose this is beyond me. Opposing this bill is essentially saying that you are okay with convicted offenders who pose a threat to our citizens, walking the streets amongst the, the, the community. You've had two years to negotiate. It shows that the Labor Party is not serious about ensuring uh, that our citizens are safe and that their priorities are Order. wrong. The last time the Labor Party was in government under Prime Minister Rudd and Prime Minister Rudd and Gillard, they only cancelled and refused a total of 1,128 visas on character grounds. The Morrison government is not okay with this and will pull upon every lever we can as a government to keep Australians safe in their homes and in their communities. The coalition government has a strong record when it comes to combating crime and keeping our streets safe. Since significant reforms were made in 2014, this government has already cancelled and refused visas of over 9,900 serious criminals. 9,900 serious criminals. That's almost 10 times as many criminals kept out of the Australian community than under Labor. Of the nearly 10,000 cancellations and refusals, uh, offences, they range from murder, child sex and child pornography offences, rape and serious sexual offences against adults, armed robbery, drug offences, kidnapping and other violent offences including assault, grievous bodily harm, reckless injury, domestic violence, stalking and intimidation, use of a weapon and attempted murder. I think all Australians will agree we don't want those people in our community. Furthermore, the government has cancelled or refused visas to over 320 organised crime figures, including members of outlaw motorcycle gangs. Each one of these visa cancellations or refusals was a great accomplishment and made Australians and our community safe. This is something we should all be proud of, and we on this side are very proud of it. No one here should be comfortable with a person who has proven to be capable of horrendous acts to be walking around our communities. Labor's position that visa cancellation should only be triggered by the sentence received rather than the sentence available shows that they do not take the threats to our community seriously or that they are just simply playing politics. <laughs> to me, however, it seems as if both those assumptions are true. It is a fact in uh, 2011, uh, Chris Bowen from the other place passed laws with the coalition support which focus on the sentence available, specifically for where crimes are committed in immigration detention as opposed to the broader circumstances covered by today's bill. If Labor believed that it was necessary for this type of action to be available for crimes committed in immigration detention centres, Madam Acting President, it makes very little sense to me as to why they believe it should not be applied to crimes committed in all other areas of our community. Even Mr Albanese, the Leader of the Opposition, when first asked about the bill in 2019, he said, and I quote, is it a good idea to deport people who break the law in Australia? Yes, it is, he says. Labor's backflip is essentially showing that they are backing foreign criminals over Australian citizens. As I said earlier, the Morrison government is committed to ensuring our communities are safe, and that is why at the 2019 election, as part of our plan, our plan to protect our borders to keep Australians safe, committed to strengthening the character test for foreign criminals, even further to enable visa cancellations where a non-citizen has been convicted of a broader range of violent and sexual offences. It was our election commitment. We're keeping it here today. This government intends to keep that commitment 
and ensure our communities are safe. An Australian visa is a privilege and that our laws must, and that our laws must deny to those who pose a threat to the safety of all Australians. Ensuring that Australians are safe and free from the threat of harm is one of the fundamental tasks that the government must undertake. Madam Acting Deputy President, without this security, citizens cannot prosper. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Griff remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. At first glance, I can understand why the government has put forward this bill, misguided though it is. I can see why the minister would be tempted to increase his powers and make his job easier while arguing that it is all for the greater good. But in the case of this bill, he wants even more freedom than he has now to keep out or more boot out anyone he deems of poor character and a possible threat to the safety of fellow Australians. What is harder to understand is why the minister is seeking to set the bar as low as this bill does. Under this bill, a non-citizen would fail the character test and have their visa considered for cancellation if they are convicted of a designated offence against another person, no matter how minor the offence and even if they serve no jail time whatsoever. Even if their conviction only results in a fine, they will still fail the character test, as long as the crime is punishable with two or more years imprisonment. Designated offences, including murder and kidnapping, which are already well dealt with by existing laws, as well as threats of violence, breaching an AVO, processing or threatening to use a weapon, and being an accessory to the offence. The minister argues this bill will target people convicted of serious offences and who pose a risk to the safety of the Australian community. However, existing laws already deal with serious offenders and people who pose a risk to others in the community. This bill will only serve to capture convictions for minor offences because that is all that is left. It could mean someone who has lived in Australia peacefully for 30 years as a permanent resident, but then does something stupid, like many of us do, like making a verbal threat or getting into a scuffle with another person could potentially be deported. The Senate's inquiry into this bill heard from many submitters who again and again made the point that Section 501 of the Migration Act already gives the Minister and his delegate very broad powers to refuse or to cancel someone's visa on character grounds. These powers are so broad that Section 5016C is almost a free-for-all. It allows the minister to refuse or cancel someone's visa if the minister decides that, due to their past and present general conduct or criminal conduct, they are not of good character. Under Section 5016D, non-citizens also fail the character test if there is a risk that they will harass, molest, intimidate or stalk another person in Australia or vilify a segment of the Australian community, or incite discord, or pose a danger to the community because they might get involved in disruptive or violent activities. Under Section 5013A, there is a mandatory cancellation of a visa for non-citizens who have served 12 months or more in prison over their entire lifetime. 12 months over their entire lifetime. Visas are also automatically cancelled for anyone convicted of sexual offences involving a child, regardless of the length of any sentence. Otherwise, the minister only needs to reasonably suspect that the person does not pass the character test under existing laws. And that visa can then be cancelled if that person fails to convince the minister or his delegate otherwise. They will also have no rights whatsoever to a merits review if the minister is satisfied that the visa cancellation is in the national interest. No rights whatsoever to a merits review. If that's not enough, under section 1161E, the minister may cancel a visa if the holder poses a risk to the health, safety or good order of the community or the health and safety of an individual. This section allows for cancellation of a temporary visa or permanent visa once the holder travels outside Australia. According to New Zealand's submission um, for the identical 2018 legislation, Section 116 of the Migration Act 
has previously been used to deport New Zealanders for a breach of restraining orders or one-off assault charges. So what more does this minister need? The Migration Act already gives the minister broad powers to boot out pretty much anyone who could be deemed a real threat to the community or individual safety. In reality, this bill isn't about making the community safety, safer. It is about making the administration of the existing laws easier. Lowering the bar to ensure anyone convicted of a designated offence against another person that fails the character test takes the hard work out of the process. It provides an automatic and low benchmark. It means discretion is instead focused on when not to cancel or refuse a visa. It will mean these visa cancellations and refusal decisions can almost become a tick box exercise. While this might be a bureaucrat's dream, this alone is not enough justification for lowering the bar as low as this bill does. The bill is also retrospective, so it will immediately have implications for all visa holders if passed. There are also some serious unintended consequences that might arise from this bill, not least of which is that would potentially be separating families and disrupting lives by cancelling or refusing the visas of people who pose no real or ongoing threat to the community. The bill's explanatory memorandum says the reason the offence must be punishable by at least two years in jail is to make it clear that a designated offence must be a serious offence and not merely a minor or trifling offence. But the fact is that no custodial sentence is required and a lack of safeguards in the legislation, even for children, undermines this attempt at reassurance. Not only that, the bill will lead to a substantial jump in visa cancellations, which will lead to greater pressure on the already slow and overstretched tribunal and court systems and place more people in onshore detention while they wait the outcomes. A submission from a field of experts, including former Immigration Department Deputy uh, Secretary estimated the bill could lead to a five-fold increase in cancellations, five-fold increase. The number of visas cancelled on character grounds has already increased 11-fold since 2014, when the Migration Act was reformed to strengthen the character test. Around a quarter of the people in detention are there due to visa cancellations under Section 501, and those that challenge these decisions often face prolonged detention at significant cost. As the Law Council said in its submission, a decision to cancel or refuse a visa will almost always have a profound and a direct impact on people's lives. For many people, it would mean permanent separation from family. And this power should not be expanded without robust justification. What is missing in all of this is a demonstrated need for these laws. No compelling case had been made that the existing laws are insufficient to protect the community from real risk. That is why I will most certainly be opposing this bill. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Henderson, remotely. Thank you very much, Acting Madam Deputy President. Australia is an open nation. We are a welcoming people, and we stand towards the world with open arms. We have a proud multicultural history, and there is no doubt that the vast majority of immigrants to Australia have greatly enriched the story of this nation. These immigrants uphold Australian values, support our way of life, contribute to our democracy, and feel proud to be Australian. And these are people of good character who think Australia is a country worth protecting. However, it is simply common sense that we must be alert to the inherent dangers which accompany our otherwise generous immigration policies. It is an unfortunate truth that not all who wish to come to this country do so with honesty or integrity. Serious and hardened criminals often attempt to enter this country on false pretenses seeking to do us harm, threatening the safety of our children, undermining our social order and corroding our way of life. 
It is the duty of every government to provide for the safety and protection of its people, and this government will not shirk that duty. This bill stands as a testament to the government's commitment to see Australians safe and secure from any threat which lurks beyond our borders. Before I move to the substance of the bill, I just do want to challenge the Greens' extreme opposition to the bill and some of the unfortunate remarks made by Senator McKim, which I won't repeat. Uh, but I, I do say this in relation to his advocacy for a, a Bill of Rights. Over the past 18 months, we've seen many what I regard as fundamental breaches of human rights here in Victoria under the guise of health restrictions. People being locked in their homes with no warning, no medication, as happened with the public housing towers in Flemington last year. People, Victorians, being locked out of their homes for weeks on end uh, under the guise, again, of border protection, under circumstances where people were effectively forced into homelessness and where some people were denied the right to seek medical treatment from their own doctor. And of course, there's the overnight curfew, uh, which uh, has been for such a long time uh, impressed upon the state government that this is wholly unnecessary. So there is a Victorian Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities in Victoria, and this made absolutely no difference to constraining the exercise of power uh, these draconian restrictions under the guise of health orders. Uh, and it is disappointing, I note for the record, that the Greens have not raised their voice in relation to some of these serious tr transgressions of human rights. I now move to this bill, which uh, amends section 501 of the Migration Act to provide that a person will objectively not pass the character test if the person has been convicted of a designated offence which carries a maximum sentence of not less than two years. The minister and his delegates within the department will then have the discretion to cancel or refuse a visa on that basis. A designated offence, and I reiterate, and particularly given the remarks of Senator Griff, a designated offence is not a minor offence. It is an offence which involves violence against a person, non-consensual conduct of a sexual nature, breaching an order made by a court or tribunal for the personal protection of another person uh, and uh, or, or using uh, or possessing uh, a weapon. Uh, any offence which commands a jail sentence of a minimum of two years is a serious offence uh, in this country. So this is no free-for-all. In making a decision to cancel or refuse a visa on this ground, the department will need to take into account a wide range of factors contained within a binding ministerial discretion. Uh, those factors include the protection of the Australian community from criminal or other serious conduct, the best interests of minors in Australia, expectations of the Australian community, Australia's international obligations, and the impact on victims, and the nature and extent of the person's ties to Australia. The bill provides a clear standard for anyone seeking to enter this country as to what kind of person we expect them to be. The bill also enables the minister or his delegates to prevent criminals, including people convicted of violent assault-related offences, from coming to this country who might otherwise slip through our current legal regime. By strengthening the character test in the Migration Act, this bill strengthens Australia's security and protects the Australian people. Uh, moreover, it does this in a sophisticated way. For example, the proposed subsection 5017AAB provides that a person's conviction for an offence of common assault or an equivalent offence is taken not to be a conviction for a de designated offence unless the act constituting the offence for which the person was convicted causes or substantially contributes to bodily harm to another person or harm to another person's mental health within the meaning of the criminal code, uh, in both cases temporarily or permanently, or involves family violence as defined by the Family Law Act by the person in relation to another person. So let me reiterate, this means that low-level assaults, including threats that neither cause or, or contribute to a person's bodily harm or harm their mental health and do not involve family violence, 
will not cause a person to fail the character test. However, if a low-level assault does involve family violence, then this will constitute a designated offence. So as I say, and as I reiterate, uh, this is not about minor offences. Uh, this relates to more serious offences to ensure, as I repeat, uh, that Australians and the community, the Australian community, um, does not come under any threat from any person who has slipped through the net. So not only does uh, this bill reflect the government's attention to concerns that the designated offences ground of the original bill may unintentionally capture low-level offending, and we, we certainly have addressed that, uh, it also demonstrates the government's commitment to combating family violence wherever it occurs. Um, we have heard that there are some, including from senators opposite and from some members of the crossbench and the Greens, uh, that this bill is wholly unnecessary, that, that it unduly gives the minister too much power to restrict immigration. There are some who even argue that the bill is problematic because it might harm our relations with other countries. Uh, to those people, I say, where is your concern for the Australian people? Um, this is first and foremost about protecting our community. The bill gives the minister the power to stop convicted criminals entering this great country. That is not overreach. That is not unnecessary. Far from it. It is wholly right and good that the government does everything within its power to safeguard our freedoms and our way of life. The government's record on this issue is impressive and it far outstrips Labor's paltry efforts. The Rudd Gillard government only cancelled and refused a total of 1,128 visas on character grounds. In contrast, after significant reforms in 2014, as we heard from the excellent contribution from Senator Van, this government has already cancelled and refused visas to over 9,900 serious criminals. That's almost 10 times as many serious criminals kept out of the Australian community than under Labor. And of the 9,900 cancellations and refusals, 216 were for murder, 1,372 were for sexual offences, including 905 for child sex and child pornography offences, 467 for rape and serious sexual offences against adults, 498 were for armed robbery, 1,701 were for drug offences, 37 were for kidnapping, um, and uh, nearly 4,000 were for other violent offences, including assault, grievous bodily harm, reckless injury, domestic violence, stalking, intimidation, use of a weapon uh, and attempted work, uh, murder. Furthermore, the government has cancelled or refused visas to over 320 organised crime figures, including members of outlaw motorcycle gangs. These figures demonstrate the government's commitment to keeping our community safe. Um, th this bill also would not result in the automatic cancellation, and this is an important point, or refusal of any visas at all. Rather, this bill gives the minister and his delegates the power to review the visa status of any non-citizen convicted of a serious criminal offence. The bill also makes sure that visa applications are reviewed carefully and in accordance with clear criteria. This is prudent. As far as our relations with other countries are concerned, the government's first and overriding duty is to the people of Australia. It is not to the governments of other countries or their representatives. The government was elected by the people of Australia, and we intend to govern in their interests, cognizant, of course, of the important role that our government plays and our country plays in the global community and the responsibilities that we have uh, to other nations. The government is proud of its efforts and its success in protecting the people of this great nation. We know that the Australian people value common sense legislation when it comes to protecting their communities. And this bill is exactly that. Common sense dictates that, it is, that if nefarious people wish to enter this country, uh, we must stop them. It is simple as that. 
Even a leader of the opposition, Mr Albanese, agrees that serious criminals should be who are visa holders should be deported from this country. This bill also affirms that other, that other maximum, maximum of common sense, that entry into Australia is a privilege, not a right. It is a privilege to enter this country, partake of its freedoms, enjoy its democratic culture and flourish in its egalitarian spirit. This is a critical bill and the current proposed amendments are crucial to ensuring the government meets the expectations of the Australian people that non-citizens wishing to enter this country who have been convicted of serious crimes will be appropriately dealt with. It is of paramount importance that we pass this bill so that the government can do its great work in protecting Australians from threats to their livelihoods, to their families and to their wellbeing, and to first and foremost keep Australian communities safe. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Henderson. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Migration Amendment, strengthening the Character Test Bill 2019. I associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, Senator McKim, who has laid out in no uncertain terms how damaging and toxic this bill really is. This bill amends the Migration Act 1958 to specify that a person does not pass the character test under Section 501 and may have their visa cancelled or visa application refused if they have been convicted of a designated offence. There has been organisation after organisation who have stood up and opposed this bill. The Refugee Council, the New South Wales Council of Civil Liberties, the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre and many more organisations, the Law Council. FECA has pointed out to the dire consequences of those who are deemed to fall to fail the character test on arbitrary grounds, in particular refugees and long-term permanent residents. FECA states that an individual may be removed to a country where they do not speak the language, where they have spent little time or never lived, or where they have no familial, social or economic connections. Further, those who are unable to be returned to their country of citizenship, for example, refugees and stateless people, risk indefinite prolonged periods of arbitrary detention. This bill has been sitting around for two years. It passed the House of Representatives in September 2019. Before that, an identical bill was also introduced into the House in October 2019. You really have to wonder why is the government finally bringing this on now? Even if you accept their argument that this bill is critical to protecting Australian safety, how does this square up with letting it languish for three years? The only explanation I can think of is that bringing this bill on now, months out from an election, is pure politics. The government sees political advantage in having this debate now. We know that they rely on drumming up fear and anxiety about migrants and criminality on the eve of an election. It's the oldest play in the book. They want to portray themselves as ones who will be the toughest on borders, the toughest on migrants, the toughest on crime, and they are cynically and shamefully trying to spin all of this as a big problem. Once again, you are playing with the lives of migrants as you use us as pawns in your political games, because that's all you care about, your political advantage, and you're sacrificing people already at risk the same people you have dog-whistled against and dehumanized and demonized. But what more can we expect of this government? During COVID, pandemic responses targeted and stigmatized communities in Western and Southwestern Sydney with police operations, military presence and curfews like no other community in New South Wales. The only people who were left out of the pandemic support were migrant workers, temporary visa holders and international students. They were left high and dry in precarious employment and dangerous work situations because you did not lift a finger to help them. Why? Because they can't vote. Why? Because they don't look like you. They look like me. Why? Because you don't give a damn. But you are all fine with using international students as cash cows harvesting their money when it suits you. You are fine with migrant workers doing the hard work that others won't do. 
driving taxis, being late like night workers at 7-Eleven, serving your food at restaurants, cleaning your buildings as security guards providing protection at all hours. You take, 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 and you give nothing back in return. The truth is, whether we have the blue passport or not, our citizenship, our belonging to this country is conditional. Our Australianness is conditional. It is conditional on us keeping our heads down and our mouths shut. It is conditional on us being grateful for being let in. It is conditional on agreeing with those in power. It is conditional on giving up our identity and assimilating. And even then, you're not happy. And you want to grind us down even more by bringing bills like this to Parliament. We have, and we should have, the same rights and privileges as anyone who lives in this multicultural country. And here's another truth. Multiculturalism in this country is just skin deep. It is measured only in the economic value migrants bring here through their business, their expertise, their skills, their food, and their culture. Politicians use us as photo opportunities at our cultural festivals. They use us as voting blocks when they need us in elections. They come to Diwali, to Eid, to Besaki, stand with us and make promises that they never fulfill. They never address the issues we face, exploitation at work, racism, unemployment. When those issues come up for us every single day, you are nowhere to be seen. You'll take our money, you'll take our hard work, you'll take our vote, but you won't listen to us. You won't give us a seat at the decision-making table either. You keep telling us to wait our turn, to get to the back of the queue. And I'm afraid that I do have to look at labor as well, because that's exactly what you are doing in Fowler, one of the most multicultural seats in Australia. You do a lot of talking, but little walking. We are not here to be used, abused, and marginalized. We deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. Shame on you liberals for bringing this toxic, destructive, damaging bill into the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Um, I did cut back, no. Uh, so, sorry, Senator Mullen, we, I've got Senator Steele drawn remotely on my list next. Uh, I'm just looking to the Greens whip for guidance that he's withdrawn from the speaker's list. Has withdrawn? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Mullen, you have the call. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting, uh, uh, acting, acting uh, President. Um, this is a very important amendment to a bill. Uh, I see it as a continuation of the support for the border control and stopping the boats, which has been such a successful, totally successful aspect of how this country runs itself. I see it as a very important part of operational Operation Sovereign Borders, uh, of which I was co-author and one of the people who made that policy work. This is probably the single most successful policy in regards to uh, what's, uh, in regards to this country defining itself as a sovereign nation, and sovereign nations control their own borders. Greens and Labor got that appallingly wrong over a very long period of time. We've just heard Senator Faruqi say that these are political games we're playing, and all that we care about are exploiting. All we care about are exploiting uh, newcomers to this country. What an appalling statement! What an absolutely appalling statement. I took part in Operation Sovereign Borders for the, sim for the simple reason that Labor and the Greens had lost, had caused the deaths of 1,200 people through their incompetence in applying border controls. We have saved time and time again. We have saved many multiples of that 1,200 uh, that, that were lost at sea, women, children, 
that our sailors saw on a daily basis, rotting in the sea and taken by sharks. So this is an essential manifestation of being a sovereign country. And there are various reasons that we can look at as to why uh, we, should, we should proceed with this bill and with this amendment. The first one is, is that it is a national security issue. The people of Australia must have faith in the fact that the borders will be controlled. Border control is not an easy policy. It is a difficult policy and there are aspects of it which are very, very unpleasant. For the Australian people to have faith in how our borders are managed, it is critically important it is critically important that we continue to maintain that. Uh, criminals or non-Australians who do not subscribe to the Australian way of life, which is to obey the law, have no right to remain in this country. So that's the first point, Acting Deputy President. I wonder if, if, if I can hardly hear myself talk. Order, I wonder Senator if there Hanson could be some Young quiet, order. please. The second reason is to keep Australians safe, and we've heard an awful lot about that. We've gone through the numbers of murders, the numbers of rapes, the numbers of the, the amount of, of, of family violence. The second reason is to keep Australians safe, and that is the ultimate obligation of any government. The third is to support victims, rape victims, uh, members of the families of those who have been murdered, and any number of of commendations of this bill have been given by people who have made the simple statement that if this bill existed, their family member would not have been killed, raped, beaten. And the fourth, uh, and, and I will limit my presentation to that at this stage, the fourth reason for this is respect for citizenship. Respect for citizenship. We have an extraordinary welcoming country. We give citizenship. Uh, to, to uh, anyone who comes here legally uh, after a period of time, and we are very, very generous in it. But it's not a right. It is a privilege for people who are prepared to obey Australian laws, and that is what the character test is all about, whether you are in fact willing uh, to, to obey Australian laws. And this is illustrated most specifically, I believe, by figures, and it, it, it's illustrated most specifically by the figures of the, the simple figure to begin with. That is, the Rudd-Gillard government only cancelled and refused a total of 1,128 visas on character grounds. We are very proud of the fact that, by contrast, after significant reforms in 2014, this government has already cancelled or refused visas to over 9,900 serious criminals. And if people don't think that these are serious crimes, if people don't think that these are serious crimes, then they really haven't looked at the detail of what is going on. Let me just run through once again, for the benefit of Labor and the Greens. Of the 9,900 cancellations and refusals, 216 were for murder. 216 were for murder. <coughs> 1,372 were for sexual offences, including 905 for child sex and child pornography offences. So, who are, whose interests are we looking after? by claiming the rights of these criminals, non-Australian, non-citizen criminals, to stay in this country? Are we looking after those who were, the families of those who were murdered? Are we looking after the families of the child, 905 who had committed child sex and child pornography offences, or the 467 who had committed rape and serious and or serious sexual offences against adults? This is absolutely appalling. And this is, a, this is an incorrect focus on where the mind of this country should be. It is faux, uh, faux civil rights faux and faux humanity to say that these people have any right to stay in this country. Uh, 498 were for armed robbery. 498 of the 9,900 were for armed robbery. You know, we, we, are, we are deeply concerned at the moment that during the COVID-19 period people have lost their income. 
Well, we see time and time again the impact on individuals, not just trauma, but the economic impact on individuals who have been subjected to armed robbery. Nearly 500 cases amongst the 9,900 people who have had their visas refused or cancelled. 1,701 were for drug offences. 37 were for kidnapping. For kidnapping. 3,908 were for other violent offences, including assault, grievous bodily harm, reckless injury, domestic violence, stalking, intimidation, use of a weapon, attempted murder. You know, uh, if they were Australian citizens, they would be treated differently. But they have elected not to be Australian citizens, regardless of how long they may have stayed in this country. They have elected not to become Australian citizenships, and that is a decision that they have made and for the consequences of which they have to suffer. So I say, uh, uh, in conclusion, I say that this is a, a bill and an amendment to the bill that is worth uh, supporting. It should be supported, if for no other reason, for the victims of those who have been deported, for the victims of those whose visas, the privilege, the great privilege of Australian citizenship has been removed from them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mullen. Uh, the Minister. Thank you very much. And I rise to sum up the debate on the Migration Amendment strengthening the Character Test Bill 2019. And I uh, thank all members for their contribution uh, to the debate on this bill. The bill amends the Migration Act 1958 to provide grounds for non citizens who commit serious offences and who pose a risk to the good order and safety of the Australian community to be appropriately considered for visa refusal or cancellation. We recognise that certain offences have a significant impact on victims and their communities. Like the Australian community, the government has a low tolerance for criminal behaviour and believes that entry or stay in Australia should remain a privilege granted only to those of good character. We remain committed to upholding the good order and safety of our community and protecting our residents. The amendments allow for discretionary visa refusal or cancellation where a non-citizen has a conviction for a designated offence punishable by at least two years' imprisonment. Designated offences include violent and sexual crimes, breaching personal protection orders like AVOs, using or possessing a weapon or assisting with any of these crimes. The amendments address gaps in the character test to capture non-citizens who have been convicted of a serious crime punishable by at least two years' imprisonment, have received less than 12 months' imprisonment for their crimes and pose a risk to the Australian community. The bill is specifically designed to protect women and children from family violence. That's why it targets violent and sexual crimes, as well as breaches of personal protection orders like apprehended violence orders. Furthermore, the existing ministerial directions set family violence as a primary consideration for decision makers when they apply the character test. Under the Morrison government, foreign criminals have been deported at record rates. We will continue to keep Australians safe by seeking to ensure our laws allow us to deport even more serious criminals. Anthony Albanese and Labor should either back these changes or provide a much clearer explanation as to why they will not. The bill deserves the support of all members, and I commend the bill to the Senate chamber. Uh Thank you, Minister. The question is uh, that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Uh, ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith, teller for the ayes, and Senator Green, teller for the Senator Green, teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 25, noes 25. The vote being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. Clark. Government business orders of a day number two. National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Improving Supports for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021 Resumption of Second Reading Debate Senator Rice Thank you um, 
I'm ris in rising to speak to the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment Improving Support for At-Risk Participants Bill 2021, I want to start by particularly acknowledging the important and valuable work that my colleague, Senator Steelejohn, has done as disability rights and services spokesperson on both this bill and in this portfolio more generally. I want to start by just setting the framework of what the Australian Greens' position on people with disabilities is. The Australian Greens believe that disabled people have a universal, a universal and immutable right to agency, to safety, to bodily autonomy, privacy, education, employment, housing, social support and health care. They have a right to participate in decision-making and policy creation in their communities. And as Greens, we want to see the removal of all environmental, social, cultural, attitudinal and communication barriers to the full and equal participation of disabled people in all aspects of life and community. I wanted to start there because, in addition to commenting on specific provisions in this bill, I want to also link how the government's failures in relation to this bill link to a broader pattern of the rights of disabled people sadly not being upheld. I mean, clearly, this bill came about because of the horrific circumstances, the horrific manslaughter of Anne-Marie Smith that really shocked the nation. And certainly, on the basis of the speeches we've heard here in the parliament today, every one of us just was filled with horror at the, at the torture, essentially, that Anne-Marie was put through. So we then had the Robertson Review that led to this bill that's currently before us. And this, of course, occurs within the context of the broader review of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. And the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS has heard evidence of further reforms that need to be made to ensure that the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission works for disabled people nationally. Now, I want to particularly highlight some of the process concerns that have been raised by stakeholders as part of this um, review, including through the Community Affairs Inquiry also into the Disability Support Pension. In a submission from the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations, they particularly noted the lack of consultation. They said, in responding to the death of Ms Anne Marie Smith in South Australia, AFTO was contacted by the Robertson Review to provide perspective on how to improve support for vulnerable participants. That was the sole point of consultation in this process that led to Minister Reynolds seeking changes to the NDIS Act to improve supports for at-risk participants. In receiving the review report in September 2020, it is AFTO's view that the Quality and Safeguards Commission had a responsibility to once again involve people with disability and disability representative organisations in consultations regarding what changes to the NDIS, NDIS Act might be needed. And this did not occur. It is AFTO's view that the lack of consultation about the recommendations of the Robertson Review and the proposed changes to the NDIS Act has led in this particular circumstance to a missed opportunity. The missed opportunity here for AFTO was discussion about improving supports for at-risk participants, such as those detained under order in state and territory forensic facilities. And in our additional comments that we made through the, to, to the inquiry, the Australian Greens noted, this legislation has been brought before the parliament without appropriate consultation with the disability community at a time when co-design and community involvement are key issues. This is not okay. This is not acceptable. And the government must work to remedy this immediately. Nothing about us without us is consistent across the entire spectrum of disability policy. And it is no different in this instance. The disability community was not consulted with in the drafting of this legislation. They found out about this legislation on the 3rd of June 2021 when it was tabled in Parliament. The Greens are strongly of the view that the government and its departments and agencies must at very least properly consult with the disability community and their publicly funded disability representative bodies and publish exposure drafts before introducing legislation. 
to ensure that policies, systems and services are designed by and for disabled people. This ultimately ensures that our systems are effective and fit for purpose. And that were, were part of our additional comments to the inquiry into this bill. So this bill would change the way that participant information can be used and shared. And I want to quote here from the submission by People with Disability Australia and their perspective on these changes. And they say, currently there is an extremely high threshold that the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission and the, and the NDIA must meet before protected and private information is disclosed about people with disability. The NDIS Act provides that disclosure is allowed only when it is necessary to prevent or lessen a serious threat to an individual's life, health or safety. We find it highly concerning that the bill ratifies quite expansive data sharing on the alleged basis of keeping people with disability safe from future unknown possible events or given past potentially irrelevant events which then enables unspecified actions to be undertaken without a person knowing or the ability to appeal. And this potentially secretive breach of our privacy could mean the NDIA or its data managers have access to our private health information, psychiatry records or other private records, potentially for the purposes of defending legal actions, such as administrative appeals tribunal hearings, Centrelink prosecutions and other legal action. This breach of our privacy is in a direct breach of the international human rights law that Australia is signatory to, including Article 2020 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So the right to privacy is incredibly important, and this is something that the Greens pointed out in our additional comments on the Community Affairs Committee report, where we said that the Greens are concerned that the privacy rights of participants are being put at risk and that there could be significant consequences for the safety of participants should their information be mishandled. And peak advocacy bodies who gave evidence to the inquiry also expressed deep concern about the two-way information sharing provisions being proposed. I also want to highlight another distinct concern, and that's about renew reviewable decisions. As our additional comments noted, that item 42 of the bill inserts a new subsection that prevents a decision maker reviewing a decision that they were personally involved in. However, it allows for a decision maker to review a reviewable decision made by a delegate of the decision maker. And the practical effect of this change hasn't been clearly explained by the NDIA. They must provide transparency in relation to their processes to ensure that any conflicts of interest, particularly where managers are reviewing decisions made by their staff, are, are concerned, are addressed. I mean, given the concerns with this bill, I also want to take the opportunity to reflect on the evidence we've heard through a separate community affairs, affairs references inquiry about the disability support pension. And this is relevant to the, this NDIS bill because it goes to the heart of the government's failure to remove all barriers to the full and equal participation of disabled people in all aspects of life and community. I mean, everybody agrees that disabled people should be valued, respected, treated with dignity and be able to live fulfilling and meaningful lives. I, mean, I would say that to a person, everybody in this place would say that, of course that's right. Of course disabled people should be able to live, live their lives to the full. And everybody that we have heard speak on this bill today, everyone was horrified about the horrific treatment of Anne-Marie Smith. But sadly, Anne-Marie Smith was not an isolated case. I mean, her tragic death was an extreme case, but she's not the only person with disabilities being badly treated by this government. And much of this mistreatment is not being addressed by this bill or even by the broader review of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission. The basics of ensuring that disabled people aren't living in poverty is under attack by this government. And the disability support pension leaves people with hardly enough to get by, particularly when the extra costs of having a disability are factored in. And eligibility has been massively tightened up in recent years, with more and more people found to not be eligible despite living with really significant disabilities. 
I mean, more and more people with disabilities who are deemed to have a partial capacity to work are left languishing, living from hand to mouth on job seeker, not able to afford the basics of food and rent and clothes. And in the um, inquiry into the disability support pension, which is currently underway by the Community Affairs Reference Committee, we've heard so many stories of people who are just really struggling. I mean, one that sticks in my mind with the story of Doug from East Gippsland in Victoria. Doug was almost killed in the catastrophic 2019 fires, but he's had his DSP application rejected. He's living with chronic physical injuries and PTSD. Doug had 37 referrals to psychologists and other health professionals, but he actually couldn't even get an appointment with one of them for over a year because he lived in an area, a remote part of Australia where those professionals just, didn't, just weren't there. And because he couldn't get that assessment, he couldn't complete the application. And then, even when he got to completing the application, his application was rejected. In their submission to the DSP inquiry, the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations said the DSP application review processes serve as a vehicle for systemic harm, wherein the power of the Australian government is leveraged against some of the most vulnerable people with disability. And people with Disability Australia have said that rules and processes have evolved to gradually erode the safety net for people with disability. Either the government's policies are working as intended to prevent people with disability from getting the support they need, or their negligence has left a system in place that harms us. That is powerful, damning evidence. And so, you know, through the inquiry process to date, we've heard stories from people who have been forced to pay the cost of their medications using afterpay, being pressured to undergo medical sterilisation so that they can be considered fully diagnosed, treated and stabilised. And awful accounts of people being forced to choose between treatment and feeding their families, of not being able to get treatment for cancer because they can't afford the transport to appointments. I mean, poverty is a political choice, and the choices this government is making have left people trapped in po poverty. People with disabilities trapped on an income support payment that's below the poverty. That's unacceptable. It shows that the concerns that we raised about this bill aren't isolated, that there is a pattern here, that the rights of people with disabilities are not being fully considered and given the import that they deserve by this government. They reflect a systematic failure by the Liberals. So, I mean, as foreshadowed in our additional comments on the committee report and reflecting the amendments that have been circulated, we believe that this bill should only pass through the parliament if it is amended to re reflect the significant feedback provided by the community during the course of this inquiry. But sadly, once again, the Morrison government has failed to consult disabled people in the drafting and design of legislation. And this repeated indifference and deliberate exclusion of disabled voices in policy processes, it's frankly ridiculous and it continues to endanger the safety and the lives of the people who are affected by these changes in legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator McKim. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And <clears throat> the uh, point that uh, Senator Rice made uh, just before um, she resumed her seat is an absolutely critical point for uh, this chamber to consider, and that is that uh, this legislation has been brought before the parliament without appropriate consultation with the disability community. And this is particularly egregious, given that a um, co-design of uh, legislation such as this and genuine, genuine community involvement in the drafting of legislation like this is absolutely imperative. And we see time after time where uh, this parliament uh, passes legislation that has a significant impact on the lives of a group of people in this country without having adequately engaged with those people around the drafting of the relevant legislation. And that is not okay. That is not acceptable. 
And the onus here is on everyone in this chamber, but in particular the government, to ensure that when the government presents legislation to this chamber, it has done the often time-consuming work of genuinely engaging with the people who are going to be impacted by that legislation. And the government's got a lot of lessons to learn in this area, and it's got to work to improve the way that it engages and consults as a matter of urgency. Something that's consistent across the spectrum of disability policy is the adage, nothing about us without us. And that absolutely encapsulates uh, what should be the way the government approaches legislation such as this, but all too often we find that the government does something to people without adequately engaging and consulting with them. Now, the Greens want to acknowledge and thank uh, those organisations and people who submitted evidence to um, the committee inquiry and gave um, their time, their effort, their experience and their expertise. As I was just saying, community-led policy is fundamental to ensuring that we collectively uphold the rights of disabled people and that we empower disabled people to occupy and lead in the decision-making process and in the places where decisions are made. Nothing about us without us. I want to acknowledge uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Steele John, um, for the way that he has conducted himself um, since he arrived in this chamber uh, as the Australian Greens portfolio holder and as a disabled person uh, who genuinely um, leads his community by a genuine engagement with that community. And it is absolutely inspirational to see the way that he has done that. And there are lessons that all of us could learn from Senator Steele John in the way we represent people in this place. Now, there are a number of key recommendations that have emerged uh, through the inquiry into this legislation that we have to build on to ensure that the rights of disabled people, as stated in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, are upheld. And I want to say here that this government has made an absolute art form of ignoring its international obligations. It is quite happy to sideline its international obligations when it suits them politically. And we see that time after time and in issues that I speak on often in this place, such as the rights of people who are refugees or who seek asylum in Australia under the provisions of the Refugee Convention. And this country, shamefully, on a bipartisan basis, turns a blind eye to the obligations that we have signed up to under the Refugee Convention and abuses most terribly the human rights of those people. And we need to stop turning a blind eye to our international obligations. We have given our word as a country on the international stage that we will abide by these international obligations, and we have a lot of work to do to make sure that the rights of disabled people that are enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities are upheld. Now, uh, a key issue that frames the conversation around this legislation is around the, the dichotomy of rights safety. Now, this dichotomy often forgets the fact that the enforcement of people's rights and strong accountability are critical elements of ensuring people's safety. And that, colleagues, is what we need to focus on, those critical elements that ensure the safety of disabled people. It is absolutely critical when looking at the broader safeguarding framework in Australia. And safeguarding is a critical area 
in need of reform. The Robertson Review produced a number of key recommendations for improving the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commission, and there remains an ongoing discussion about how best to implement those recommendations. This legislation proposes changes that carry serious implications for the human rights of participants and, critically, for the privacy rights of participants. And some unanswered questions around the practical effect of the two-way information sharing arrangements. The National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commission and the National Disability Insurance Agency need to understand that it is incumbent on them to improve the way that they explain in plain, easily understandable language what this legislation seeks to do and how it will affect participants. And again, this goes back to the principle of genuine engagement with the people who are impacted and affected by any piece of legislation. Because that engagement doesn't, shouldn't only happen as the legislation is developed and drafted and ultimately debated in this parliament. It needs to keep happening if the legislation passes to make sure that the people who are affected by that legislation understand what the impacts on them will be and to understand what their rights are, whether they be human rights or privacy rights or any other rights. The changes that are proposed in this legislation emerged from the horrific manslaughter of Anne-Marie Smith. The Robertson Review, from which this legislation has sprung, was commissioned in response to those tragic circumstances. The Greens want to note that there is currently a broader review of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission being undertaken by the Joint Standing Committee on the NDIS. And we understand that that, um, that uh, committee has heard evidence of further reforms that need to be made to ensure that the NDIS uh, Quality and Safeguards Commission works properly for uh, disabled people nationally. Now, in regards to um, a lack of consultation, we want to place very firmly on the record that, um, as I've said, the disability community were not adequately consulted as this legislation was being drafted and, in fact, shamefully found out about this legislation on 3 June this year when it was tabled in Parliament. Now, that is a completely unacceptable way to treat people. The Australian Federation of Disability Organisations stated in their, in their evidence to the committee inquiry that the exclusion of people with disability and their representative organisations in putting forward the amendment bill and the failure of the minister to adequately include the substantive amendments being called for by the community in response to participants who were vulnerable and at risk of abuse and neglect is absolutely inappropriate and has caused this amendment bill to fail in its objectives. It is our submission, they go on to say, that the minister has a duty to consult with people with disability and their representative organisations when making and amending laws which directly impact them. The minister has failed to do so and, as a consequence, there is a serious and significant threat to the human rights of people with disability." End quote. Well, that lays it out pretty starkly for colleagues here. And it reiterates again um, the arrogance of a government that thinks it can come in here and legislate in a way that has impacts on the lives, the lived experiences and lives of disabled people 
without adequately consulting with them and their representative organisations. And that is uh, such a shame. And in fact, it's just the attitude that, us led, that has led us to where we are now, to a Royal Commission. And again, I want to thank and congratulate Senator Steele John for his leadership ensure, in ensuring that that Royal Commission uh, was established uh, and his leadership in ensuring um, to the greatest degree possible that it is being run uh, in a way that respects um, the rights and the needs of disabled people. Because, of course, looking after the rights and the needs of disabled people is exactly why that Royal Commission was established in the first place, because we haven't been doing that for so long in this country, and we are yet to get this country to a place where we can all say that we fundamentally respect and deliver on the rights of disabled people in Australia. Uh, in the short time that's uh, left to me, Deputy President, I want to make sure that I uh, do actually move the second reading um, amendment that has been uh, foreshadowed by Senator Steele John uh, on behalf of the Australian Greens. So I do uh, now so uh, move that amendment uh, and just urge uh, all colleagues um, to support um, that amendment, which goes um, to the very heart of the way that the government um, has failed um, to consult on this legislation and expresses uh, extremely clearly uh, and allows the Senate to adopt a view that the government and all of its departments and agencies must in the future properly consult with disabled people and their representative bodies and that that consultation should be genuine in that it, it uh, needs to ensure that exposure drafts of legislation are published before legislation is introduced and puts disabled people at the very heart of designing policies, systems and services that impact on their lives and their lived experiences as disabled people. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I foreshadow that I will be moving a second reading amendment in Senator Hanson's name. Oh, that's it? Yep. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. First of all, let me thank most sincerely all uh, colleagues across the chamber for their heartfelt contributions and very sincere contributions to this most important uh, bill. And also, I thank them all for their acknowledgement of the significance of this bill. And I think the debate that we've had on this bill is a really important reminder to us all of the great good that we can do uh, for some of our most vulnerable when we come together in a common cause in this chamber. I commence my remarks by recognising the tragic circumstances in which South Australian NDIS participant Ms Anne Marie Smith died. And I also recognise all the circumstances in which an NDIS participant has been subject to abuse, neglect or exploitation. And as all colleagues in this place who have spoken have acknowledged, Ms Smith's death continues to be a source of deep distress for all Australians. It is my most sincere hope that this bill provides comfort and assurance to participants, to families, to their friends, to their carers, that this government, with the support of all in this chamber, is taking action to better protect them, to reduce the likelihood or the risk that such an horrific event could happen again. This bill makes changes to the NDIS Act 2013 in response to issues identified in various inquiries in, into recent cases of abuse and neglect of people with disability, including the independent review conducted by former federal court judge the Hon. Alan Robertson, Senior Counsel, into the tragic death of Ms Anne-Marie Smith. The review was done at the request of the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commissioner, and the report was a report to the Commission 
and not directly to government. Specifically, this bill strengthens information sharing arrangements. It allows conditions to be attached to the approval of quality auditors. It enables the NDIS commissioner to further specify reportable incidents, and it makes a range of other technical cha changes designed to improve the op operation of the NDIS commission. In summary, these amendments will help to ensure the well-being of NDIS participants, including those who are at greater risk of harm, and ensure that the Commissioner has clear and effective powers to regulate NDIS providers and respond to incidents of violence, abuse, neglect and shameful exploitation. I cannot possibly overstate this government's commitment to improving protections and safeguards for NDIS participants especially those most vulnerable and at risk of harm and exploitation. This includes recognising the importance of continuing to review the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework to ensure a quality, a quality and safe market for NDIS participants through providing nearly a million dollars for a framework review in last year's budget. This key review will consider the framework's effectiveness in the context of NDIS policy development and the evolving nature of the NDIS market to identify any further opportunities to strengthen protections for, participant, for all participants with the report due by the end of next year. The government does not support the second reading amendment by the Greens, and I'd like to explain to all in this chamber the reasons for that. Uh, we've heard uh, from the Greens that there hasn't been sufficient consultation and I would like to refute that most strongly and sincerely. And let me explain why. The amendments in the bill relate to recommendations, as I've said, from the Robertson Review, a review by, requested by the Quality and Safeguards Commissioner and actually delivered to the Commission. And in, importantly, in informing his views, the Honourable uh, Alan Robertson invited public consultation in the context of his investigation. The recommendations that he delivered were very well received by the sector, including by people with disability, and all major political parties have called on the Australian government to implement these recommendations. And that is exactly what we are doing here today. During his consultations, 46 submissions were received either verbally or in writing. In addition to the sub uh, submissions received, Mr Robinson also wrote to 38 individuals who may have an interest, as a courtesy, to inform them of his review and the terms of reference. This bill here today responds to this consultation and the recommendations. And it is an important next step, and I highlight that this is just a next step, but a very important one. Discussions were also held between the Department of Social Services and the Australian Federation of Disability Organisations on the 16th of June this year to discuss these very amendments and to get their input into the proposed bill, but it also provided a policy explanation of the intent of the government in these recommendations. Additionally, a further consultation will occur where amendments to NDIS rules are required to implement these legislative amendments during the scheduled review of the NDIS quality and safeguarding framework later this year. So there remains many other opportunities on an ongoing basis for the sector, for participants and all of those who are interested in improving how we care and safeguard NDIS participants. In addition to this consultation, the bill was scrutinised by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Senate Community Affairs Legislation Committee where sector representatives were able to provide comment and speak to their concerns at the public hearing. And I thank each and every, every one of you who provided that input, because it was very important input into the development and finalisation of the bill uh, that we are dealing with today. I'd also like to note that while the government is not supporting uh, Senator Hanson's uh, second reading amendments, uh, it is not because we don't agree with the sentiments uh, in those in that uh, amendment. The government is very grateful for Senator Hanson's engagement uh, in the NDIS to ensure its future sustainability and viability. 
So lastly, I thank the Senate Standing Committee for the scrutiny of bills, the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and the Senate's Community Affairs Legislation Committee for their consideration of this bill. But most importantly, I thank each and every one of you in this chamber and in this place more generally who have uh, contributed to this bill to go to today. Because if there is anything to unite all of us in the chamber, it is this bill today to make life safer for NDIS participants who are at risk. So I say to everybody here, for Anne-Marie Smith and every single NDIS participant that has been subject to abuse, neglect and exploitation, this bill is for you. And Madam Deputy President, I commend the bill. Uh, thank you, Minister. So uh, we'll deal with the second reading amendments first, and we'll deal with the second reading amendment in the name of Senator Steele, John, which uh, Senator McKim moved. So the question is: um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bell. The question before the chair is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint I will give the whips a few more moments, in fact. Point Senator Giacconi, tell her for the eyes, and Senator Davey, tell her for the nose. The result, the result of the division is eyes 19, nose 27. The question is resolved in the negative. I believe there has been a second reading amendment foreshadowed by Senator Roberts. Is that correct? Senator Roberts, you have the call. I move Senator Hanson's second reading amendment. So the question is that uh, the second reading amendment moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. No. I believe I only heard one voice, Senator Roberts. So we will move on. Because there's no. Uh, Senator Roberts? Could I have my name recorded as uh, supporting that amendment, please? Yes, Senator Roberts. We certainly will. All right. Now, I believe amendments have been circulated, so I will need a. We need to put the question on the second reading. The question is that the second reading be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes no. have it. Now, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act 2013 and for related purposes. Now, I will need a temporary chair. President. So is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The, uh, Senator McKim. Um, thank you, um, uh, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I uh, seek leave to move um, the amendments one to three. Uh, on sheet 1443 revised together. Is leave granted? 
There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Move the amendments. Minister. Oh, I no, think Senator, Senator Patrick. Patrick, you're seeking the call? Yes, I am. Just briefly, I just wanted to uh, just make a statement in relation to uh, uh, One Nation's second reader. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, do a second reading speech. Uh, it, it was seeking to uh, constrain the amount of money that is being spent uh, on the NDIS. And, uh, it was ambiguous in its nature. I just want to put on the record that um, the NDIS scheme, the providers to that scheme, only ever pay the maximum rate. There's no competition. If you rock up and you seek a service uh, and then basically mention you're on the NDIS, the, the full tight odds are paid. And there needs to be some uh, mechanism used to address that because uh, that means that people uh, don't get uh, the maximum service for the money that is available. It means the money is getting chewed up more quickly than it, than it uh, normally does. And I'd ask the minister to consider how that problem might be addressed. It's the, it's the typical, I'm here for a wedding, therefore uh, the price will be, that, that, that will be paid is, uh, is very high. Senator Roberts. Oh. I will defer to the uh, minister okay. if she wants to address Sen Thank Senator you, Patrick's minister. Thank you. And can I thank Senator Patrick for his uh, question and his comments, and also for your support for the NDIS and the safeguarding framework. So thank you. In relation to the particular point that you raise, it is something that has been raised with me frequently now as, uh, as the minister. There is currently a pricing review underway. Uh, by the NDIS to have a look at uh, the whole pricing structure and rates for the, uh, for the NDIS. Uh, the government in the last budget uh, is also having a look at how we uh, better integrate the workforces, but, so the workforces themselves between uh, disability veterans and also aged care. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that currently, uh, and Minister Hunt um, and Minister G, is that we do pay. Uh, the same providers for similar services, very different rates. And um, I think we, we absolutely need to improve that so that we move towards a single rate um, that, is, that doesn't actually uh, not only inflate the cost of participant services, uh, but also one that doesn't uh, push people out of the market inadvertently, such as veterans, which um, has been reported to be the case. So thank you very much. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Uh, Chair. Minister, I echo Senator Patrick's comments in many ways. Senator Hanson and I have been very strong in our comments because we see the need for protecting people with disabilities and supporting them, but we're afraid that the system as it is, the NDIS as it is, has been built on very poor foundations. It was a thought bubble by the Labor government to get votes. That's the way we assess it. Uh, it has never been properly designed, and now it's too easily rorted and it's too, control, too bureaucratic in its control so that people who deserve um, Thank you, support Senator Roberts. do not have it. It being 12.15, uh, the committee shall now report. The committee reports progress. Um, we'll now move to Senator's statement. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. A net zero transition provides Australia with an abundant opportunity because of a fallacy, and that is that uh, net zero equals zero emissions, the common debate around emissions reduction has been tarnished by this government's political opponents, who either do not understand or willfully ignore the fact that in a net zero future there will still be emissions generated. The only way that many developed states will reach the net zero target is by purchasing carbon offset credits and through the use of nuclear power. The use of these abatement credits allows these states to quickly and cheaply slash their emissions without having to invest in the structural change that it takes time to take effect and actually cut emissions. This approach can be described little more than greenwashing on an international scale, and they are already pur purchasing carbon offset credits from countries around the globe. Now, this is in stark contrast to Australia's approach where we have built in structural changes into our uh, energy systems and our other industries and economy-wide 
that will actually bring down emissions and has been bringing down emissions on a scale that most other countries can only dream about. And this also provides Australia with a unique economic opportunity. This is because we are developing the technology to reach net zero. And as we are all and as and we will have an abundant potential to sell offset credits to those other nations. This practice is already underway in Australia through the Emissions Reduction Fund, which is going from strength to strength. And this year the thousandth thousandth project was registered and the millionth ton of abatement was credited. I want to be clear that Australia should be netting as little as possible as it approaches its low emissions targets. However, we should be um, working to become a, an economic powerhouse in selling those carbon credits. And we are developing the technology that will fuel a low emissions economy. In the transition to net zero, we should not be abandoning the, the exports that underpin our regions and we should be acknowledging the fact that net zero is not zero. It is the difference between giving big parts of agriculture, heavy manufacturing resources no future and a bright future. For these sectors, our economy, uh, for these sectors of our economy that support thousands of jobs and provide a vital role in Australian society, we need to ensure that in a net zero economy they are able to thrive. The market is already adjusting to a future where coal is no longer the, the main source of energy generation. But that is not going to happen overnight. And until it is no longer needed, coal mining must continue to support our economy and continue to provide good jobs to thousands of, of Australians. The transition to net zero provides Australia with bountiful economic opportunities and our technology, not taxes approach, ensures that the Australian economy will continue to thrive in this transition as we drive down emissions. Investing in the development of low and no emissions technologies will not only help Australia reach net zero, but will importantly help our friends and partners around the world also reach net zero. By driving down the cost to produce low or no emitting energy sources, developing countries will no longer have to make the choice between emissions reductions and development. These two processes go hand in hand. Emissions reduction is a global challenge, and only by driving down the cost of clean alternatives, such as producing hydrogen at below uh, $2 a kilo, or producing green aluminium at uh, under $2,700 per tonne, and green steel under $900 per tonne, will these low emissions options be competitive with their traditional alternatives. At these prices, low emission alternatives will be available for everyone, not just Australia. Australia will become an, uh, an exporter of these low emission alternatives. These technologies will allow the globe to transition to a low emissions economy. It is only through a global effort that this can be achieved. Developing these technologies, which our energy technology investment roadmap clearly sets out, will allow Australia to remain a next net exporter of, of energy. However, it will just be a different type of energy. This will ensure that the benefits of the coal export boom that we have seen recently will not be lost and we will continue to reap the benefits of selling energy to states around the world. Similar to the LNG gas revolution, which saw Australia become the second largest LNG exporter in the world, I see no reason why we cannot Continue, well, we cannot be a global low emissions hydrogen or green steel exporter. The energy transition towards net zero presents Australia with vast opportunities that we should be grasping with two hands. It is clear from the technology investment roadmap that work is well underway in Australia to support an economy that is not reliant on coal both as a source of energy and income. That technology investment roadmap sets out uh, our priority low emissions technologies and economic stretched goals. Those priority low emissions technologies identified are clean hydrogen, energy storage, low carbon materials such as steel and aluminium, carbon capture and storage and soil carbon. In our efforts to reach clean hydrogen under $2 per kilogram, 
conservative estimates for, the, uh, for our national hydrogen strategy indicate that a domestic industry could generate over 8,000 jobs and $11 billion a year in GDP. But this is not going to happen overnight. We have phases that we're going to go through while we achieve this. At the moment, blue hydrogen is a competitive um, energy source, but we're working hard to be, get green hydrogen under that price. But that will like, likely take 10 years. But we should be doing that work now. And the uh, exporting of our coal is funding the investments that need to go into that. It's $1.9 billion investment package into new energy technologies, which includes commitments that will support hydrogen, including $1.6 billion in new funding for ARENA, a $74.5 uh, 74 future fuels package, and a $70.2 million fund to activate regional hydrogen export hubs. This will build on over $500 million committed towards hydrogen projects by the government at the launch of the Na National Hydrogen Strategy. Establish establishing hydrogen as a priority technology and working towards this stretch goal will reinforce these commitments and ensure Australia can capture a significant share of the growing global export demand for this technology. Thank you, Madam Deputy Pre President. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Dep uh, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the rampant warting of uh, government money by the Morrison-Joyce governments. Sports rorts, and I acknowledge the uh, presence of my colleague uh, Senator Farrell here, who led the charge into the dark underworld of what goes on with this government. The only colourful part about it is the, the colour-coded sheets that uh, align with marginal seats. This is a contemptuous set of programs that this government have advanced, and I'm particularly speaking uh, today on the commuter car park one. We need to ensure, as a House review here in the Senate, that we oppose the spending of billions of taxpayer dollars as though it's Liberal campaign money to buy themselves yet another term in office. I want to speak specifically about my home region of the Central Coast and how the Liberals' failed plans and broken promises have left the region that I live in worse off than it even was before the announcement. The local member for Robertson, Luke, Lucy Wicks, and my duty seat of Robertson, um, was gifted, supposedly, two commuter car parks. One was proposed to be in Woi Woi and another in Gosford. Yet recent FOI documents reveal that this so-called commitment is yet another Liberal lie. In the case of the Woi Woi commuter car park, which was supposedly to uh, uh, draw a sum of $5 million. That announcement was made on March the 27th, 2019. Well, on the 23rd of July 2021, two whole years later, the community news on the Central Coast reported uh, Wicks said the concept design for the commuter car park at Woi Woi was expected to be finalised this month with Transport for New South Wales conducting a rapid viability assessment of the possible sites for the Gosford car park. And that's how this member talks. She speaks about all the other agencies that are responsible for it, finds other people to blame and puts other agencies and other levels of government in it. And it's all just a cover-up of her failure to act and the falsehood of her commitments, so-called commitments to the people of the coast. A recent gipper for, of Transport, New South, Transport for New South Wales shows that this statement from Miss Wicks on the, 27, on the 23rd of July couldn't be further from the truth. According to Transport for New South Wales, there is no construction start end milestone dates anywhere. There is no confirmed total cost. There is no New South Wales contribution for the Woi Woi commuter car park. And that'll come to as news to people in Woi Woi who voted for Lucy Wicks in good faith, thinking she was actually going to do this job that she should have done a long time ago. It's eight years that she's been in, three terms of government, and this commitment stinks because it's another con job from Lucy Wicks on the Central Coast. Um, this is especially significant considering the, the analysis of the proposed car park uh, and the costings that were allocated would make it one of the most expensive car parks in the country for this pork and ride scheme that the government tried to roll out. The average cost per space 
uh, on the Central Coast would have been more than uh, $200,000. Just say that again. $200,000 per car park, 430 per cent above the national benchmark. That's how badly this government has stuffed it up. And I acknowledge also in the chamber with me is Senator Raftaconi, and I know that this rorting has gone on in an outrageous way in the great state of Victoria. And indeed, I believe the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, gifted himself four of these dodgy projects in his own electorate. Now, in regard to the Gosford car park, that $30 million election announcement that sounded so good and encouraged people to vote for Lucy Weeks, the Liberals are even further behind with that delivery of that commitment. The only document that was revealed in the FOI request was a letter from the local Gosford Council, sorry, the local Central Coast Council, saying they were unable to proceed with the project. All announcement, no delivery. That is the signature of this government. It sums up what we are seeing day after day right across this country. A lot of talk, a lot of numbers splashed around, and then an absolute failure to honour those commitments in any form of, with, a, with any integrity and a failure to deliver for the community the things that they were promised. The Commuter Car Park Fund is in fact an astonishing example of poor governance and cynical politics, even for this Morrison government that plays Australia like it's a game. This failed fund has built a mere three car parks in three years. It's cancelled twice as many as that due to their inability to get the projects off the ground, and there are another 47 unlikely to ever be built. Lucy Wicks failed Robertson when she did nothing for years, for the two terms that she had prior to the last election. She did no due diligence, no preparation, no work with the council, no work with the Commuters Association, no work with the state governments to make sure that these car parks, about which she made numerical commitments, were actually viable. The department advised against both the Gosford and the Woi Woi car parks, stating the department is not in a position to recommend allocating funding or provide detailed advice on the relative merits, scope or funding profiles given the limited time and information available. And that gives you an indication of how hastily and how rashly and how inappropriately Ms Wicks and this government and all the other Liberal Party members who lined up outside the Treasurer's uh, table at the office walked in with their hand out and said, oh, give me a few dollars to make an announcement. I don't care if I can't deliver it. Just get me elected. That was what was really going on. Lucy Wicks had been a member for six years at the time that this failure of planning and preparation was going on. If she was actually on the ball, if she was actually doing something for the people of the Central Coast, she would have had this sorted out months or years before. Now, the Australian National Audit Office was scathing about the car park reports. It found that the car parks were heavily centred in Liberal electorates, particularly in Victoria, uh, where the government was trying to save seats. Now, this is despite the department showing that most of the congested roads in Australia are found, sadly, as Sydney decided, no, in the great state of New South Wales, in the capital city of our great state in Sydney. And if you've sat on the freeways trying to get into and out of Sydney, you know exactly what I'm talking about. An urban congestion fund was shown by the department to be needed on congested roads in Sydney. And instead of doing that, the Prime Minister for Sydney abandoned us and started spreading the pork around all over the place, particularly in Victoria, where he thought he needed to spend a few extra dollars to help his chances of re-election. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace what's going on. In some cases, uh, it was only the local um, MP who provided a justification by the multi-million dollar project for a multi-million dollar project by putting out a press release. That was all there was. No due diligence behind it. And the Australian National Audit Office found that there was very little provided in the way of supporting evidence of the need for these car parks. I think um, Minister Frydenberg, the Treasurer of Australia, with all the resources of government, even promised a car park for a train station that was due to be closed. This could not be more farcical. Is there any wonder why the Liberals and the Nationals are actually terrified of a federal ICAC? Now, the kind of behaviour that I've been describing erodes public confidence in the rectitude and effectiveness of government. 
For Alan Tudges and Scott Morrison's claims that it was just business as usual, the Australian people know better. Our taxpayer dollars need to work hard to advantage us ethically right across this country. Our dollars should not be used as a slush fund for the Liberal Party to line up its next election bid. That's what went on with all this rorting that they made an art form of. Money should be going to where it's most needed, where the departments, the councils, the state governments and other ethical stakeholders are ready and able to go. This callous political arithmetic only benefits those in power, not those on the ground. And because Lucy Wicks didn't do her homework for three years, her botched and bungled commitment means that Central Coast residents are now further away than ever from the commuter car parks they desperately need. But that was all that was needed for Miss Wicks to make to get herself elected, an announcement with a degree of trust in the community that got her the extra few votes that she could count on and then just disappear for the next three years and wait for the next pork ride to come along from her government. While Coasties have to park further away, wake up earlier and earlier searching for a park. I urge the people of Robertson to consider this disgrace as they cast their vote in the next federal election. No commuter car parks, no Wi-Fi on trains, no action on chronic GP shortages, no performing arts centre. Lucy Wicks has failed the coast. She is not worth anyone's vote. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, in the last six weeks, four women have died on the streets of Perth. In 2020, 56 homeless people died in Perth. 44 people have died on the streets since August this year. One third of those people are First Nations. I note the families of the deceased are coming together now to ask for an inquiry. We echo the families' calls for a coronial inquest into these deaths. I am not going to sugarcoat this. There is a housing crisis in Western Australia. According to every indicator, the WA housing system is in an absolute crisis. And First Nations people are experiencing firsthand the deadly toll of homelessness. The by list, name list for Perth CBD and Fremantle and surrounding areas shows that 995 people are experiencing chronic homelessness. 17 per cent of them are First Nations people. Refuges are currently turning away women and children, and staff across the entire sector are in complete distress. Dr Betsy Buchanan is a strong advocate for Noongar people and has worked for years with First Nations families in Perth to help them to advocate for housing and generate political pressure for policy solutions to end homelessness. Dr Buchanan has described these deaths in Perth's own pandemic, claiming the lives of these at least one of our people every week this winter, and she recently said, and I'll quote her, we are completely overwhelmed with families calling every, all day from early in the morning. So many of these destitute families, uh, destitute families are calling for help burying their children which costs thousands of dollars that we just don't have. Others are demanding accommodation before they become the next death. Desperately ill people are discharged from ICUs and hospitals straight back onto the streets. They are angry and bitter because there are so many deaths. People are terrified that they will be next. Their loved ones keep dying, and this is a total crisis. How can we have an epidemic of deaths due to homelessness in a state with a $5 billion surplus? Housing in WA is systemically inadequate to the point that the management represents chaotic breakdown at its best. Chaotic management at the hands of the state. Last week when I visited Carnarvon, I saw firsthand. I went around and I photographed 40 boarded up homes. These houses were uninhibited and were now requiring full refurbishment. The population declined from the peak of 8,000 people in 2016 to 4,000. It's now increased slightly to 5,000 people in that town. 
But where's the government accountability? The selection process to match people with housing is not being tailored to the needs of individuals and families. Research has found that First Nations applicants in WA wait longer on the priority public housing wait list and are more likely to be evicted, especially under the state's punitive three strikes eviction policy. If there's a breakdown between family and the department, then it becomes a punitive response where people are evicted and families no longer have access to housing. And we all know that punitive approaches do not work. Successive governments have underinvested in social housing. Homelessness in some instances is an outcome of the chaotic breakdown of the social housing management. However, on the whole, there is a system of unmet, unaddressed prevention, and we need to come up with a better prevention model for the social issues and systemic racism, which is often present, past, collective and intergenerational trauma as one of the major and primary contributing factors. The social determinants of health are critical in addressing the housing and homelessness crisis. Education, income support, mental health all play a role in compounding the issues that First Nations people experience. There needs to be a comprehensive forensic audit strategic review of social housing policy, management and maintenance to match individual family and social needs, and not just in Western Australia but nationally. We also need to incorporate the design and implementation of place-based, culturally guided social and emotional healing and wellbeing activities for the individual to enhance self, family and community function and to enhance their general way of being. I have some serious concerns about the risk of overcrowding in our communities and the dangers that this poses, particularly in the outbreak of COVID. In Carnarvon, we are unable in Western Australia to actually quarantine when we have all of those houses boarded up in social housing. We have two places for ICU in the public hospital system. Where will these people go? if we have an outbreak of COVID in a town like Carnarvon of 5,000 people. The Greens have a strong plan to address housing and homelessness crisis across this country, and for decades the governments have rigged the private housing market with tax breaks that favour big developers and the rich property speculate, uh, speculators. Our current housing system is worsening inequality. We have a plan to build one million homes that will ensure there is a home for all. These homes will be sustainable, accessible and affordable. Our new innovative shared equity ownership scheme will make it easier for people to own their first homes where they want to live for 300,000. Thank you. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam. Acting Deputy President, I must say it's uh, always a privilege, Senator Cox, to, to follow you in this chamber, and uh, it's the uh, the second time I've done that this week, in your first week. But I think you made some uh, extremely important points there, and one is left to ponder why it is that Western Australia has a budget surplus of five billion dollars and its social housing provision is in such a ter terrible state as you outlined. Madam Acting Deputy President, I was privileged to attend two celebrations over the last few weeks, and when I gave my first speech in the Senate, I spoke about my passion for Australia's Pacific Step Up program. And as I've engaged more and more with the Pacific Island diasporas in, in our beautiful country, I'm becoming even more passionate about the Pacific Step Up program and its importance. So let me talk to you about the two celebrations I had the uh, honour of attending. The first was the Cook Island celebration of self-government, the Te Maeva Nui 2021 celebration, which was put on by the Cook Islands Council of Queensland, Inc. And the Cook Islands flag, that beautiful flag with the Union flag in the top left uh, corner and then the 15 stars representing the 15 islands of the Cook Islands was proudly on display. The Cook Islands diaspora turned out in force. Uh, 
the, all the food you'd expect was there, the arts and crafts, I did some early Christmas shopping, cultural performances. It was all there to behold, and it was just an outstanding event. I pay tribute to Mr Archie Atiao, who is president of the Cook Islands Council of Queensland, Inc. He, Archie actually gave a dance in the lead-up to his uh, welcoming speech, which signified his, uh, his enthusiasm for the celebration and how great it was for the community to come together. I also congratulate Councillor Mindy Russell uh, from Logan City Council, who was also in, in attendance. She gave a dance as well. She caught the enthusiasm. Um, and, and she's a great worker in the community in Logan City. That's Councillor Mindy Russell. Pay tribute to Councillor Russell. Um, I was the next speaker. I didn't dance physically. I was dancing on the inside. I was dancing, celebrating on the inside, but uh, I managed to uh, restrain myself and, uh, and didn't give any physical uh, send a wash. I didn't hear that through your mask, but I assume you're complimenting me for my restraint. Uh, so I, uh, I did manage to restrain myself, but it was a great celebration, and it also reflected, in my view, Madam Acting Deputy President, the great generosity of spirit, the great generosity of spirit of the Cook Islands people. And I saw that the previous week, when I attended Base HQ, uh, which has been set up by the Cook Islands Council of Queensland Inc. under the leadership of Archie Atiao. And every Wednesday they provide emergency food hampers to people in the community in need. And it doesn't matter if you're of Cook Island background or whatever background, they're there helping people in need, uh, reflecting the generosity of spirit of Cook Islanders everywhere. And I congratulate the volunteers who were there that day, Teela Kameni, Noraya and Terry Hage, Tai Karua, Justin to Tua, Dentius Roberts Tugaga, Papa Mata Maui Roa, and Anita Tugaga. Congratulations, one and all. You're outstanding community members, and it was an honour to be in your company. The week before, I attended another celebration, which was for the Fijian Independence Day celebrations. And again, another great community event, on this occasion celebrating Fiji's independence, which of course occurred on the 10th of October 1970. And, uh, members present in the chamber, senators present in the chamber will know that Australia has a very deep bond with Fiji, and this was exemplified in the Fiji Australia Vivali Partnership, which was entered into uh, during the term of the Scott Morrison government. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, there was a wonderful dinner on Friday night, and I was given great honour. Uh, great honour to participate in traditional Fijian welcome ceremonies, including uh, the drinking of kava, uh, which I must say I quite enjoy. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've actually quite enjoy a, a, a drink of kava, especially when it's in such wonderful company. And during the course of that night uh, and the next day of cultural and sports celebrations on the Saturday, a total of $5,000 was raised for a project undertaken by International Women's Association in Fiji to provide um, cloth nappies uh, to new mothers, cloth nappies and other uh, essentials to new mothers in Fiji. So a great example, a great example of our Pacific Island diasporas working together to raise funds to send back to their island homes. And I congratulate everyone involved in terms of that event. Uh, there were many elders of the community in attendance. In particular, I would like to pay tribute to the president of the Fiji Community Association of Queensland, Inc., Dr Villaseri Tukalo. And Dr Tukalo is a, an obstetrician. Uh, he provides outstanding medical services, especially in regional Queensland, and is a great leader of the Fijian diaspora. I also pay tribute to the Honorary Consul of Fiji in Brisbane, Mr Harry Raniga. And the Raniga family has made an outstanding contribution, an outstanding contribution both in Fiji and Australia through community work and business work. And um, Honorary Consul, you should be uh, really congratulated for your efforts and those of your family. It was an honour um, to, to hear the story of uh, uh, of your family and all that you contribute to the well-being of Fiji and Australia. Uh, my good friend, 
uh, Mr Ratu Elifereti Masanewa, Masanewa was uh, the sports and cultural convener. And, and Ratu, you did a magnificent job. You did a magnificent job pulling it all together. Um, you're a, a, a great Queenslander. Um, and, and your leadership in terms of helping pull it all together in terms of that sports and cultural day uh, was just outstanding. So it was, uh, Ratu, it was great to spend time in your company on Saturday. I also want to congratulate uh, Moses Raluni, uh, who was involved in organising the Rugby Sevens, Kelavai Tukolo, Donna Lobandan organised the Rugby Sevens, the dinner conveners. Kathy Harry Jager, Donalyn Singh, Susanna Bartlett, Donna Lobandan. Soccer organiser Raj Rao, Cultural Festival Pate Ganita, Natani Lesai. Children Activities Valami, Sarah Rakika. Uh, and to everyone else involved on putting on a, just a wonderful cultural and sports celebration. It was just outstanding. So if I can say to all of my Fijian friends, the Fijian diaspora, in conclusion, Nisam Bula Banaka. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President. Well, it's been said that the Morrison government has a women problem, but I think it's more accurate to say that the women of Australia have a Morrison government problem. As we near the end of 2021 and edge closer to the next election, the women of Australia are asking themselves this. What has the Morrison government done for us? What positive change have they made for the lives of Australian women? What have they done to improve the jobs of Australian women? What have they done to fight the insecurity that Australian women still face today? And the answer is not nearly enough. This government's track record when it comes to women is absolutely abysmal. Under this government, women have been neglected, they have been disrespected and they have been undervalued. Australian women have been neglected in the post-pandemic recovery and women's economic security is going backwards. Despite being the hardest hit by the COVID pandemic, there is no plan to support women's jobs or women's wages going forward. Women experienced higher levels of job loss and lost hours than men throughout the pandemic. Almost 30,000 more women than men have left the jobs market over the most recent periods of lockdowns, because women are more likely to be employed in insecure part-time work, because women are the majority of the industries that were hardest hit during COVID, industries like hospitality, tourism and the arts. And at the other end of the spectrum, in sectors like nursing, in early childhood education and in aged care, Essential women workers have been completely neglected by this government. These are the women who kept our essential services running day in, day out, despite facing personal risk themselves. Uh, and for these women, there was no relief on the home front. Added to the already high levels of unpaid work was the challenge of home schooling. Millions of women across the country shared in the daily struggle to balance everything working from home, increased housework, hours of homeschooling and the seemingly never-ending sourcing of snacks for bored and hungry children. It left the women of Australia exhausted and burnt out. And it has also left many women poorer because to cope with the extra workload, many Australian women reduced their hours or left the workforce altogether. And many of these women are not guaranteed to get these hours back as lockdowns ease. This reduction in income from lost jobs and reduced hours saw women forced to withdraw from their super accounts like never before to survive. Super accounts which were already on average half the size of men's. So the Morrison government has no idea what the women of Australia have contributed during this pandemic. The Prime Minister simply doesn't see it. And as a result, the Morrison government has no plan for women in the economic recovery going forward. So without a plan, women will see long fought for gains in equality go backwards. Insecure work will get worse. The retirement savings gap is set to get worse as well, and their earnings will go backwards. The women of Australia 
simply cannot afford a Morrison government. And Australian women are sick of being disrespected by this government, as was demonstrated by the 100,000 women who marched outside parliament demanding that the government listen. But what was the Prime Minister's response to this public display of anger and frustration? Well, he said that the protesters should be grateful because not far from here, he said, such marches even now are being met with bullets. The women of Australia, however, did not feel grateful. They felt angry. And they felt angry when it took this government 15 months to respond to the groundbreaking Respect at Work report. They felt angry when the government legislated only six of the 55 recommendations of that report. And they felt angry when the government voted against employers having to take active measures to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace, all actions which would have shown that this government had some basic respect, some basic respect for the women of Australia, actions which would have showed that they've listened, which would have shown that they were taking real action to ensure women are safe at work. But really, what can we expect? This is, after all, a government where former Prime Minister Tony Abbott not globally renowned for his respect for women, appointed himself the Minister for Women. This is a government led by a Prime Minister who defended the now fully disgraced Minister Christian Porter, a Prime Minister who was accused of victim-blaming by sexual assault survivor Brittany Higgins, a Prime Minister who has told us all that he can only relate to women as the father of daughters. The women of Australia deserve to be respected, not dismissed, by their Prime Minister and by their government. Women have long been undervalued for their essential work, and it's never been clearer under this government. At the same time as women have been disproportionately impacted by COVID, they were at the front lines delivering our essential services. And how has the Morrison government valued these essential workers? Let's look at the early childhood educators. Let's look at the aged care workers. This year, the government stood up and declared a pink budget, pointing to announcements in aged care and childcare. But how much of this is actually flowing to the pockets of the hundreds of thousands of women who work in these critical essential sectors? Nothing. Nothing. The government has refused to do anything meaningful to value the work of these professionals. They have refused to support the aged care work value case that's running in the Fair Work Commission, despite the Fair Work Commissioner asking them to. We know that the wages for aged care workers are just not enough to live on. We have heard time and time again from aged care workers, like Cathy, who came to the Senate Select Committee on Job Security and said the following. Who cares for the care worker? We're the working poor and have to retire below the poverty line. We look after your parents. Remember, we're the second last stop for your loved ones. So who cares for the care workers? Well, not Prime Minister Morrison, not the Morrison government. Certainly not the same Prime Minister who praised early educators as essential one day and then kicked them off JobKeeper the next, when early childhood educators were still seeing their hours cut, when they were still seeing their hours reduced because of enrolments being reduced, when early childhood educators were needed to ensure that other essential workers could go to work, all while working in an environment where it was impossible to socially distance at the height of the pandemic. The Morrison government has never valued the essential care sectors which are dominated by women. After all, this is a government whose own members reported, reportedly described early, le early learning as outsourced parenting. Uh, this is a government whose own members say that women should do this care work for love and not for a living wage. But these are two of the fastest growing sectors of the Australian economy, sectors which between them employ around 500,000 workers, sectors which are facing workforce shortages of tens of thousands of workers driven by low pay and lack of respect. I have heard from educators as recently as last week and aged care workers who are thinking of leaving the jobs that they love simply because they can't afford to stay in them. So what is this government prepared to do about that? 
and it seems after eight long years that the answer is absolutely nothing. This is a government which continually disrespects women and their invaluable contribution to our economy and our community. Australian women contribute so much to this country, but their own government continues to neglect them. Their own government continues to disrespect them. Their own government continues to undervalue them and the work that they do. This government will never stand up for women, ever. This government never has stood up for women, ever. The women of Australia have made their judgment and they have found this government wanting. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Over the next few weeks, health insurers around the country will be busy finalising their applications to hike up insurance premiums. Of course, it's exactly the same thing every year. Insurers ask for as much as they believe they can get away with. The Department of Health spends months knocking out the most uh, uh, egregious claims, and the minister dutifully announces consumers are going to cop it once again, but it all would have been much worse if not for his personal intervention. As usual, every Australian with private cover will spend March thinking about whether it's worth keeping before the hikes take effect in April. Well, the vast majority will keep some form of coverage just to avoid a massive tax hit, but they do so reluctantly every year. They sense something's fundamentally wrong with a system that forces them to buy a high cost, low value service just to avoid some tax. More and more Australians are voting with their feet and opting for the lowest cost, lowest value insurance products. And this is a clear sign they don't see much value in private coverage beyond tax relief. And we also see more Australians intentionally foregoing the tax benefits and opting out of private cover entirely. Many Australians, like myself, grapple with the question of whether it's worth having private coverage and whether it's worth having anything more than the most basic level of cover. But that's an impossible question to answer. One reason is because our future health is simply unknowable. None of us have any idea if we'll have an accident, if we'll get sick, or if we're destined to live a long and healthy life. Of course, we can look at the statistical data to get a sense of what tends to happen to people in our age group who share similar lifestyles to ourselves. But that only tells us about averages and tendencies. It says nothing about us specifically. Normally, this uncertainty is the very reason for having insurance, generally. We insurance, insure parcels against the risk of loss or theft. We insure our cars against the risk of accidents. We insure our homes against the risk of natural disasters. But what risks does private health insurance actually protect us against? It can't possibly be the risk of protecting yourself or your family from medical or financial catastrophe because that's not really what private health cover really provides. As soon as you go to sign up, you're confronted with a bewildering array of options, none of which simply cover everything. Even top level coverage has exclusions, waiting periods, caps, and other limitations. And should you ever experience a catastrophe, you will quickly learn that what you want or need and what your insurance covers are often very different things. We call it insurance because it's really an elaborate scheme to partly discount a range of services you'll probably never need. It's a business that depends on confusing consumers, on massive taxpayer subsidies, and promising more than will ever be delivered. If I sound cynical, that's because I am. I've spoken before about the horrible experiences of my late wife, Kristen, throughout her four-year cancer journey. What benefits do we get from having private health insurance? Very little. In theory, <clears throat> our coverage guaranteed a range of benefits that justify the huge amounts we, along with millions of Australians, pay our insurers. But the reality was always different and always disappointing. In theory, private cover gave us a choice of specialists. 
In reality, it wasn't our choice. It was often our GP's choice. There is no way for patients to know they are referring us to the top specialist in the country or just some mate they gulp with. There is no data, no transparency about the performance, quality or cost of different health professionals. No way for patients to know if they can trust the person who may hold our lives in their hands. In theory, private cover gave us financial security, the comfort of knowing that we would not have to worry about money while going through the worst ordeal of our lives. In reality, my wife's operations alone left me out of pocket well and truly way over $10,000 more than we got back. $10,000. In theory, private cover also means access to premium facilities and care, private rooms in what you would think to be top-class hospitals staffed by the best nurses and allied health professionals on the market. In reality, you'd be a lot better off in Adelaide's public hospitals than the many run-down private hospitals we actually have here, and the similar is the case in other states. And we'd also be more likely to get a comfortable private room in a public hospital nowadays. Australians have grown increasingly aware that the big promise of private health cover are untrustworthy. That's why we've seen the proliferation of extras in recent years. I suppose the insurers realise that they have to give something back so people feel they are getting something for their money. But even there, the insurers couldn't help themselves. Every time they expanded the list of benefits available to their customers, they tightened eligibility, capped the benefit amounts and hiked up premiums. And I wonder if there is a single private health insurance customer in the country who thinks that their benefits are worthwhile. Or a single one who doesn't feel a bit silly using their private cover to get a few dollars off the cost of a yoga mat. For years now, fewer Australians have been willing to pay for private health insurance. Fewer people who see any value in those excessive premiums and empty promises. And despite hiking premiums each year, health insurers are steadily becoming less profitable and less reputable, which is pretty remarkable. Given the product, the service they are supposedly offering is something that a lot of people want. But where I am standing, it's clear that private health insurance is becoming unsustainable. It's unsustainable financially and it's unsustainable politically. Sooner or later, politicians will realise there is growing support for stricter regulation of health insurance. Growing support for cutting taxpayer support. Growing support for blocking premium hikes. And growing support to expanding the ACCC's role so they are just not monitoring insurers, but actively enforcing competition in the sector or even designing standardised products which must be offered by every insurer. That's the industry's trajectory, the current trajectory. But it doesn't have to go that way. If the industry wants to change course and it wants to rebuild its customer base and rebuild its reputation, it can do this. It can make that choice. But it has to make change. It has to rebuild our trust. Cut out all the nonsense, the caps, the limits, the useless basics, everything that is meant to confuse or mislead customers. Cut it all out and focus instead on delivering what Australians want and expect from health insurance. And that is a quality product that they can rely on in times of crisis. Make it easy for people to compare your offering with a competition. Make sure they can see that you deliver true value for money. I spent many years building businesses, and that's what it's all about, building trust and delivering value. That's the outcome I want for the private health insurance industry, and that's the outcome Australians want. But if they stay on this path, if they choose not to lift their game, I will be a strong voice with many others for intervention and regulation. I will call for all their subsidies to be stripped away and channeled back into the public health system because the public health system generally 
is far more effective and doing a better job than often private health system. I will also push for their premium hikes to be blocked and for the ACCC to step in. So it is time private health really look at themselves and make appropriate changes for the benefit of us all. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On the front page of today's Career Mail is a very alarming story, a very alarming story that should concern every Queenslander, as it is a bloody attack on democracy and free speech in Queensland, an attack that affects all 577 local government councillors and mayors across Queensland. The article reports how the mayor of the Barcaldine Regional Council, Councillor Sean Dillon, is under investigation by the Orwellian Office of the Independent Assessor for comments he made in a council meeting back in February for questioning logistics of the vaccine rollout in rural communities. The council was discussing the Central West Hospitals and Health Service, a division of Queensland Health, and its plan to vaccinate entire rural towns through one of its visits. To paraphrase the conversation, Councillor Dillon rightly raised his concerns with Central West Hospitals and Health Services' ability to vaccinate a majority of locals in the limited time and raised particular concern for individuals who had mobility issues or those who were unable to attend the local hall. Councillor Dillon was concerned that the health service probably hadn't considered those particular residents. More so, he lacked confidence in their ability to advertise the visits and the logistical challenges to administer the jabs to the entire community. To quote from Councillor Dillon, to think they're going to do it in one pass is someone who's got no idea of regional Queensland, it's simply not going to work." End of quote. Now, the OIA, the, the Gestapo of local government in Queensland, is alleging that Councillor Dillon made comments that could be considered detrimental to public confidence in a health service provider and lead agency in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination program in the region. Councillor Dillon has been reasonably suspected of inappropriate conduct for making statements in a public forum that is not, that is not in the best interest of the community. The last time I checked, one of the primary roles of local government councillors is to raise concerns on behalf of their local community. Indeed, if councillors and mayors are not raising concerns on behalf of their local community, they are not doing their job. So I say well done. To Councillor Dillon, and I say well done to all councillors and all mayors across Queensland, regardless of your political colour, for continuing to stand up for your, for your local communities. The comments made were undoubtedly, undoubtedly, valid, or undoubtedly valid concerns of the local community, so Mayor Dillon is simply being investigated for doing his job. I spoke this morning to Councillor Dillon. He is expecting the sandal-wearing jobs worths in the OIA that they will sack him. I've also spoken to the LGAQ, who are prepared to go to the High Court over this bloody attack on freedom of speech. This investigation is a blatant attack by the Queensland Government on free speech. The OIA acts with minimal oversight or review and has used nothing for but whipping up frivolous complaints that take an inordinate amount of time to investigate and cost local councils and local ratepayers thousands of dollars to defend. So who is watching the watchdog? We've had the Triple C Logan case, and now we have the Office of Independent Assessor, or as the Curia Mail rather amusingly calls them, the Office of Idiot Actions. Now, as a senator, I speak to lots of councillors and mayors across Queensland, and here are some of the concerns from the councillors. Investigations take too long, many for two years, and the Office of Independent Assessment has no benchmark or timeliness for reporting. Not enough frivolous or vexatious complaints get knocked out at the assessment stage. Trivial matters like people being blocked on a council Facebook page for making derogatory comments end up going through the OIA and sent back to council to deal with. Both sides lawyer up and it costs councils thousands and thousands of dollars to deal with the complaint. Not to mention the time it takes away from council and councillors when they want to be dealing with the real issues in the community. Councillors who have had their cases dismissed still end up being publicly reported on a register. 
And despite this, this, this Gestapo organisation only starting back in December 2018, some matters go back almost a decade. Now, the state government will say they're independent, which is a cop-out. They were established by the state government by legislative amendments in the Local Government Act, with very little of any oversight. And they're nothing more than a self-serving money pit who go around the state whipping up complaints. They told one council that it wasn't a good thing that there were no complaints being made in that area because people obviously didn't know about the OIA and how to make a complaint. This mob need to be reined in. They need more oversight and far tighter legislation, or ideally, they actually should be abolished. Because councillors are now afraid to make decisions or talk about issues in their community, and that is what they are elected to do. Councils are the most local form of government. They are the ones closest to the community, and we need to be supporting councils, not making it tougher for people to stand up and be elected, elected representatives in their local area. Now, not only were Councillor Dillon's concerns valid, but this latest fiasco is yet another example just of Palaszczuk turning Queensland into a nanny state. And talking about Palaszczuk, Madam Acting Deputy President, a, a state Labor government who continue to fail regional Queensland, I want to talk about Paradise Dam. Every sitting fortnight I talk about Paradise Dam because State Labor are doing nothing about Paradise Dam. And unfortunately for the farmers affected with this, this effectively neutron bomb that has gone off in the Wide Bay Burnett with the, the destruction of Paradise Dam through the, lowering of its de uh, through the lowering of its wall, there is no good news. Because you know what? You know what's left for the, the farmers in the Wide Bay Burnett? You know what's left for them to do? Just pray for rain. That's what's left in Queensland. Pray for rain. Don't build dams under state labour. Just pray for rain. So well done to, to Tom Marlin from Marlin Law, who is leading the Paradise Dam class action. And I actually quote him about praying. He said, with such low water allocations and no certainty about the future of the dam, farmers are left with few options but to pray for rain to keep their crops alive. Well, shame, shame on state labour for, for doing that. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, everybody knows here that I, I am a big fan of the ABC, and I believe that as a friend of the ABC, and the best friend you can ever have is an honest friend, and I am very honest about the ABC. And I previously talked about uh, my reform program for the ABC, but clearly the ABC aren't listening. So I am calling upon the Minister for Communications to commission a commission of inquiry into whether there is a need for public broadcasting in Australia, with specific reference to the ABC, its operation and its charter. The ABC is like a, a lost teenager, aimlessly floating through time, trying to find itself unperturbed by authority, yet infatuated with its own self-importance. In the absence of any serious review over the previous decades, the ABC has evolved into a self-serving bureaucracy that is out of touch with many Australians, a self-serving bureaucracy that costs the Australian taxpayers $1.1 billion a year. After all, since the 1930s, when the ABC was first created, it's never been beyond reproach of government review before or reform, so why should it be now? So we, that's why we need an urgent commission of inquiry into public broadcasting and the ABC. In particular, we need to determine the ABC's applicability in the 21st century with reference to how large the national broadcaster should be and to what extent they should compete in the modern media market. The review must define what is and what is not acceptable by a public broadcaster which effectively upholds the Australian taxpayer as a beneficiary of the ABC. The review will also need to accommodate for the ABC Charter to be reformed to make it fit for purpose. In doing so, the review can serve as a mechanism to cut through the bureaucracy and minimise any waste of taxpayers' money. Refining the scope of the ABC's operations will promote strict purpose metrics that will demand compliance and mitigate any existing lack of priority for everyday Australians. Any aspect of the ABC's operation that falls outside these purpose metrics should be consolidated privatised or cease operating. Now, there's a lot of discussion in this building and in the other place about net zero emissions by, by 2050. And last night, I talked about why we should build the Tully Millstream hydroelectric scheme. But if you're really serious about net zero emissions by 2050, then we should have nuclear power in Australia. 
Back in 2019, the member for Hinkler and I wrote to the Prime Minister calling for an inquiry into nuclear energy in Australia. And now, as we are building a roadmap to net zero emissions by 2050, I'm calling upon the government to make sure that nuclear energy is part of that roadmap. We've got a third of the world's uranium. We are geologically stable. It is in our national interest to make sure that we have nuclear energy in this country to provide affordable, cheap and reliable power as part of our energy mix. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Sheldon. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about a virus that has destroyed the lives and livelihoods of decent, hard-working Australians. That virus is, of course, Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas and his executive leadership. Yesterday, Safe Work New South Wales filed criminal charges against Qantas over the sacking of Theo Samadinas. Let me tell you about Theo. Theo was an aircraft cleaner who had worked for Qantas. Theo was a trained, qualified and experienced health and safety representative for his team. Theo had worked in Qantas for almost seven years when COVID-19 began to spread around the world. In early 2020, before our borders closed to China, planes continued to arrive in Australia's airports from COVID-19 hotspots, including Wuhan. Theo and his team were responsible for cleaning those planes. I'll quote Theo directly on what happened next. At the start of the pandemic, we were directed to clean planes with just water, not sanitizer for the trays or anything. PPE was not mandated despite managers wearing hazmat suits. We were not even provided with masks or disinfectant. I made numerous approaches to management to ask for further PPE or for the risk assessment they had done. After everything was declined, I directed a group of workers to cease unsafe work, which is one of the health and safety representative's powers. At the same time, I and other workers received threats of disciplinary action. That day, I was stood down and was the last day at Qantas. This is truly a national scandal. Alan Joyce is forcing his own employees to clean planes arriving from Wuhan without PPP, without disinfectant, and with nothing more than spray bottles of water. The Qantas management was so concerned that they were wearing hazmat suits, but didn't provide any PPE to the exposed cleaning team. Theo stood up not just to protect himself, not just to protect his team, but protect every Australian who was unknowingly boarding a Qantas plane that had not been safely disinfected. And for his trouble, Alan Joyce stood him down immediately. Theo has never gone to back to work. A few months later, Theo was one of the 2,000 Qantas workers who woke up to learn their jobs had been outsourced. Their jobs had been outsourced in the middle of the pandemic. At the same time, the Qantas was receiving $2 billion in public money to keep the workforce intact. Alan Joyce outsourced those jobs to cut costs, to cut wages and to cut conditions for his employees. And some of these workers have been working for Qantas for many, many decades. And of course, the companies he outsourced those jobs to, many are notorious for their poor labour standards. One Swiss port was subject to an expose by the ABC which revealed their workers are living in makeshift camps in Sydney Airport between, between split shifts. That's how low their wages are, and that's their conditions. Swissport workers were sleeping on sheets on the concrete floor and on dirty mattresses beneath baggage carousels. Well, last week, Qantas appeared before the job security uh, inquiry. I asked whether Qantas even knows whether the outsourced workers they use are receiving a living wage. The response I received was telling. Qantas's chief counsel responded, what's a living wage? This illegal outsourcing is another scandal. 
It's a national scandal. The federal court agrees, which is why it is ruled that outsourcing decision was illegal. And it wasn't, you know, um, simply a, a right, as has been expressed by those opposite, and Senator Stoker in particular, when she was making criticism of these workers because they had failed to keep their jobs with Qantas. And he criticised, she criticised those workers because they had decent wages and conditions that had been negotiated, many of which without any action directly with the company. And yet that company had signed off willingly and then turned around and still double-crossed and done deals such as they did. And I can tell you this to Senator Stoker in, the, in the response to dishonesty. I'd suggest you go back through Hansard, because I certainly will, because I'll take it further. The federal court agrees, which is why it is real, the outsourcing decision was illegal, Senator Stoker. There aren't enough hours in the day to go through the long list of crimes that Alan Joyce has committed against his employees. I'm thinking now about Peter Seymour. Ask those opposite to consider this story. Peter had worked at Qantas for 31 years when he was diagnosed with stage 5 prostate cancer in the late 2019. Peter continued working as long as he could before, in early 2020, he was eventually forced onto sick leave. At this point, Peter was getting radiotherapy treatment almost every day. When the pandemic, pandemic, pandemic reached Australia, Alan Joyce booted Peter off sick leave he had accrued for over 31 years at Qantas. He was stood down, and when he tried to recover that sick leave, Qantas fought Peter in the federal court, a cancer victim. Peter said that he had been forced to borrow money from family members to pay for his medical bills. What Alan Joyce had done to Peter, Theo and those 2,000 workers who saw their jobs illegally outsourced is un-Australian. The ACCC should be investigating Qantas for false advertising over the use of the tagline, Spirit of Australia. Alan Joyce said he needed to sack those 2,000 work people to save Qantas. Well, I'll say we only need to sack one, and that is Alan Joyce. Instead, he continues to pocket millions of dollars year after year, regardless of the performance of the company. And of course, we've seen subsidies squeezed out, by, uh, squeezed out of taxpayers um, and its workforce as part of his strategy of bonuses. When in the Morrison government is going to utter a single word in defence like Peter about Peter and Theo? Well, I won't hold my breath. And what's quite clear and that is that the prosecution is the first of the kind anywhere in Australia under the uniform WHS laws. TWU New South Wales State Secretary Richard Olson said that the regulator's decision to prosecute Qantas was a landmark moment for health and safety across Australia. Safe work prosecutions of Qantas for these offences is the first of its kind and it's a massive step forward for work, health and safety in New South Wales and across the, uh, uh, across the nation, Mr Olson said. Qantas stood Theo down trying to protect himself and his colleagues, he said, from COVID. And now the company is, right, is fighting, rightly facing criminal charges for doing so. This is the same company that was found, as I said, for 2,000 workers that had been dismissed. We hope that the court throws the book at Qantas for their outrageous decision to stand down a worker who was simply trying to keep himself and his colleagues safe at work. While the number of charges laid is unknown, each offence attracts a maximum penalty of $594,000.21, meaning that Qantas could face fines running into the millions, not including any compensation potentially awarded to Mr Seremedinus. The case is listed for its first hearing in the New South Wales District Court on the 6th of December. In addition to safe work prosecution, Qantas is also facing an adverse action case in the federal court, bought by the TWU, relating to Theo's being stood down, as well as the separate ongoing federal court case about Qantas' illegal decision to outsource 2,000 workers. A Safe Work New South Wales spokesperson says the charge, charges relate to 
QGS standing down a worker who raised concerns about a potential exposure of, work of workers to COVID-19 while cleaning aircraft in early 2020. Of course, the TWU was put forward, and they believe that the prosecution is the kind of is the first kind of anywhere, as I said, in the country. And also went on to say the importance of making sure that this adverse action is properly dealt with in the courts. This company could turn a new leaf. It could actually do what its predecessors to Alan Joyce did, engage with their workforce, have a relationship with the workforce, a workforce that took stand downs on many occasions during crises without pay, but not at the point Order. of a gun. Senator Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, we're now into our 70,100 of the longest running soap opera in Australian politics, and that is the soap opera of the Liberal and National Party trying to work out where they stand on climate change and net zero emissions. As I've said on ABC Radio in Capricornia today, this soap opera has been running so long that it makes Days of Our Lives seem like a mini-series. This has been going on the entire life of this government. And the only people who are losing out as a result of this government's failure to deal with this issue are regional Australians who are seeing jobs that should be going into our regions disappear offshore to countries who are getting ahead of us. Let's be very clear. This pantomime that we are seeing in Canberra this week, where we have the Liberals fighting Liberals, Liberals fighting Nationals, Nationals fighting Liberals, Nationals fighting Nationals, it is a farce. We all know that the government is going to reach net zero emissions. I mean, Senator Abetz must be just shaking in his boots about the fact that he has built his political career on fighting against climate change action, and he knows that the government is going to sign up to it. He knows that this is a foregone conclusion, and he knows that those people from the National Party who are carrying on day in, day out are just playing up for the cameras. Uh, and yet again are going to prove that they are completely inadequate when it comes to the task of representing our regions. Let's be clear. The government's net zero emissions plan, which is coming any day now, is a fake plan from a fake prime minister supported by fake farmers and fake miners. This is a government full of fakes from top to bottom. I mean, Senator Canavan at least had the decency to call it out yesterday when he pointed out that this government's slogan, technology not tech taxes, is complete crap, complete rubbish, completely meaningless. He likened it to rainbows and puppies. So every minister that we see get up in question time today and rabbit on about technology not taxes, just substitute rainbows and puppies. That's what they're talking about and that's what they've been called out for by one of their own members. Now, the net zero is not the only example where we see the nationals letting down our regions. They've let down their regions, even on regional development grants, where it's just been revealed Order. that more than half of this government's Order. regional development grants have gone to the major cities. One of these regional development grants went to that famous regional football club called Collingwood. That's how regional this National Party government is when it comes to supporting the regions. They've let down the regions on casualisation. They've let down the regions on disaster management. They've let down the regions on GPs and aged care. And now they're doing it again by letting Order, jobs Senator disappear overseas. Walsh, your time has expired. At being 1.30 p.m., we will move to two-minute statements. And I call Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be able to read this speech that was written by an 11-year-old boy in my electorate named Sujan as part of our, the Raise Our Voice Youth Voice in Parliament Week. Thank you for taking time to write about such an important issue, Sujan, and I can't wait to see you in politics in years to come. Here is uh, Sujan's uh, letter or speech. Hi, I'm Sujan. I'm 11 and I'm from the Canberra electorate. Can you think back to when you were my age and what you wanted the world to look like in 20 years' time? You might have imagined flying cars or hoverboards or a world where everybody has access to healthy food and clean water. But would you have imagined the only living structure you can spot from outer space, our very own Great Barrier Reef, to be at risk of dying because of carbon in the atmosphere? 
The current generation of adults needs to fix the problem in today's world. So when people of my generation are adults, we don't have to spend our time fixing the problems that we have now. We will have to spend our time solving problems or inventing new ways to do things in the future which we haven't even begun to imagine yet. There are small things we can do, like not littering, turning off lights when you leave the room and not buying products containing palm oil. But there are bigger things that people and governments can do to reduce the destruction of nature, for example, encouraging everyone to use renewable energy sources and making sure forests and natural areas are better protected from logging and deforestation. In 20 years, I want to be able to see a world where no one is destroying forests, killing wildlife and releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. When you were young, did you hope the leaders would do a better job to help fulfil your hopes about the future? Now that you're the leaders, do you think you could help the children of our generation to fulfil ours? Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Abetz. 3,139 Australians lost their lives to suicide last year. That's about nine Australians every day. On top of that stark figure, a staggering 65,000 attempted suicide in 2020. One of the risk factors for suicide is relationship breakdown. Research confirms that separated people have a high risk of attempting suicide and developing suicidal thoughts. In short, relationship backgrounds have their consequences. They are breakdowns. They are real, they are deep, and they are potentially very destructive. That's the bad news. The good news is parents beyond breakup. Parents Beyond Breakup is a national suicide prevention charity focused on supporting separating parents experiencing trauma through family breakdown. This charity has effectively gone about its vital task for two decades. One wonders what the statistics would be without their highly effective work. Under the able leadership of Brendan Blomley and CEO Gillian Hunt, parents Beyond Breakup is making a real difference, keeping separating parents alive and in their children's lives by providing hope, support and a voice. Parents Beyond Breakup has an impressive delivery model based on lived experience. It only supports separated parents and grandparents in distress through relationship breakdown and child access issues. It ensures the safety of parents coming to groups, and in the last year it has supported 1,451 face-to-face -face engagements, 1,429 online engagements and 1,778 helpline calls. Parents Beyond Breakup does wonderful restorative work. It deserves our support. Thank you, Senator Abetz. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. This week is Youth Voice in Parliament Week, and it's been wonderful to hear my colleagues across the chamber read out so many heartfelt and articulate statements from young people setting out their vision for 2041. I'm delighted today to be able to share this speech from Gillian Jerry. Gillian is a 21-year-old student from Brisbane who's currently studying commerce and politics at the University of Canberra who hopes one day to be standing in this chamber herself, but only if the toxic culture changes. Gillian says, a lying cow, stop shagging men, a menopausal monster, deliberately barren. These remarks will be reprimandable in any ordinary workplace, so why on our parliamentary floor are they acceptable? Picture this, a young girl in a study of society class being told that as of 2015, Female representation in parliament was a mere 30 per cent, and that all the media could care about was the way each of these women looked. Too old, frumpy, ugly, a slut. She took this as her call to action. Campaign after campaign says the future is female, yet we sit here hoping that women's interest in politics will simply reignite after she's had children, once she's finished in the workforce or after her duties as a Step Stepford wife are complete. Meanwhile, all she reads are derogatory headlines. Currently, there are young women like myself willing and ready to take on the call to action, but our concern is the Australian commentary. A young man, he has ambition, but a young woman, what could she possibly know about the world? Now picture this, in 20 years, nothing has changed in our political sphere. That is a call to action. 
Thank you for letting me share your powerful words and your call to action, Gillian. I, along with my Greens colleagues, hear you and will keep working to make this place somewhere young women know is a place for them. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Pratt. Thank you. I'm proud to give this speech by Araya uh, Moodley as part of the Youth Voice in Parliament campaign. It is a sentiment that I very much uh, uh, agree with in the words uh, that she gives the chamber today. She says, my name is Aria Moodley. I'm 16 years old and the electorate of Curtin is my home, the land of the Wajak Noongar people. It is a place that I'm proud to call home. My vision for Australia is that in the next 20 years we will have our first female Prime Minister of colour. As a young woman, a person of colour and of migrant parents, I believe that diverse leadership is paramount. Diversity is a powerful tool for unity, a symbol that we have evolved and are ready to invite the most marginalised to the table and celebrate break their attributes. For this vision to be reality, we need action. We need to empower that young girl out there now through education so that in 20 years she will confidently stand on a national stage. We need to close the gap, ensuring that the government provides equitable resources so that no girl, no woman, no individual is disadvantaged by their geographical location or their ethnicity. We need, as a society, to change our perception of women in politics so that we foster an inclusive environment that lifts them rather than one that tears them down. It is through education, equity and positive role models that we will allow that young girl of colour in 20 years to represent the great country of Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Order. Se order. Senator Roberts. Thank you. How would Australia fare under a Greens government? In Greensland, water will be limited to 120 litres per day per person. After that, smart meters will shut the water off. With no water allowed for gardening, home gardens will die. Rural water restrictions will shut down family farms. Productive land will be used to farm carbon, breeding feral pests and noxious weeds, not food. The Greens policy of a smaller farming footprint will lead to big corporations centralizing near city production of food-like substances sold through corporate supermarkets. End-to-end -end corporate supply chains will exploit this monopoly to create deliberate shortages and raise prices. Green's policy of unlimited immigration will make these shortages of everything worse to enable more government control. Family homes will be turned into so-called environmentally friendly small homes, boxes, stacked in high-rise blocks in megacities with mass transit replacing the f freedom of private car ownership. Travel for recreation will be limited to inter-urban travel. The bush locked up and returned to Gaia. Electricity will be rationed. Smart meters will remotely switch off unauthorized activity. Real wages will fall as businesses increase prices to meet rising power bills, brownouts and green imposts. In Greensland, gender is not related to genitals and can change daily. Unless a child changes their gender from one to the other permanently using gender mutilation surgery. The inconsistency of that logic escapes the Greens. Sex education will start in kindergarten and drive the Greens' war on gender. The Greens are blindly fo advocating forced vaccinations that enrich foreign drug companies. My body, my choice is no longer a Greens value. Greensland is a world of total corporate control, without freedom, without joy, without opportunity. A dystopian nightmare for our families and our communities. Thank you, Senator Roberts. We have Senator Macdonald remotely. Crocodiles and guns. They might get big headlines, but they do nothing for North Queensland's regions crying out for facilities and services. And I rise to congratulate a Better Together community support in Atherton, in far North Queensland, on their successful application for Building Better Regions funding and to highlight just how important these grants are to our smaller towns. Building Together is a vital service in Atherton, providing domestic violence support, counselling and online psychology sessions, family mediation, youth programs, suicide prevention and drug and alcohol awareness, just to name some. CEO John Russell and board members such as former Regional Mayor Joe Paranella, 
David Duncan and Graham Wardle have been tireless in their desire to expand and improve via a new community centre, which the town sorely needs. I'm delighted to say that thanks to the Building Better Regions Grant Fund, a $2.2 million contribution will be made to a $4.4 million project to build a fit-for-purpose community centre in the Atherton Tablelands. Criticism has been made of these grants, describing them as purely political. Well, try telling that to the grateful recipients. I will never stop fighting for local councils, especially when their local member doesn't. These councils don't have the rate space to afford all the facilities that make their areas more livable for residents and attractive to tourists. They need representatives in Canberra to constantly push their case for town improvements so they can concentrate on budgeting for other core responsibilities. Effective representation isn't about self-promotion or blaming others for your failures. It's about delivering for people who need it most. This BBRF funding plus the billion set aside for regional roads, upgrades and town improvements is crucial for our regions and they deserve every cent. These regional councils are achieving extraordinary outcomes. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Griff from Motley. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. If there's one area that this government is absolutely world class, it is in creating solutions to problems that don't exist. Take the new charities regulation, ACNC 2021, measures number two. These apparently solve a problem of uncertainty when charities commit minor legal infractions. It's not something the public have raised. It's not even something the charities are worried about. It's not even something the regulator has called for. But this government has bravely soldiered on and created a solution for a non-problem. And not surprisingly, they've managed to botch it. The regulations mean charities will be deregistered if officers commit summary offences or if a charity's resources are used in offences. A fat charity can also be deregistered if the regulator thinks they may break the rules. So charities will have to steer clear of any work where there is even a risk of minor legal infractions. That means no involvement with protests, no involvement with civil disobedience, and no involvement with anyone released from prison. In solving a problem that doesn't exist, the government has created huge new problems. There is a real frustration with this. There are genuine problems with the charities and non-profit sectors there are dodgy non-profits out there, organisations set up purely to exploit the generosity of Australians, but that is where the government really should be focused. But instead, we get these other measures, which will harm legitimate charities and make it harder for them to do their good work. A disallowance motion has already been circulated, and I hope the Senate joins me in voting down these harmful and unnecessarily regulations. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Mariel Smith, remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today, I am so proud to be giving a speech written by Shania Gamble from Adelaide as part of Youth Voice in Parliament Week. Here's Shania's speech. As of 2021, the Australian population accounts for approximately 13 million females. Of this population, an average of 306,000 have given birth to a child this year. My name is Shania Gamble. I'm 20 years old and contribute to the population that support women in their birth as a student midwife. I've been inspired, amazed, appalled and disappointed at times, observing the care women receive. The health system needs help. Going backwards isn't an option and standing still is not enough. In 20 years, I envisage Australia to improve the care of the 13 million women in their pursuit to start a family. My passion for helping women in the most vulnerable time of their life may not be enough. However, improved resources for maternity care can. I raise my voice for the women who sit in waiting rooms for hours because there aren't enough staff to attend to them for the parents who want the same midwife throughout their pregnancy, but cannot because they didn't make the cut. The unborn babies who deserve the brightest future. 
women will continue to give birth for the rest of time. How long are we going to deprive them of the care that they deserve? Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Steeljohn, remotely. Senator Steeljohn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting President. A bit of lag on my end. Um, I uh, would like at this moment to contribute also to the uh, Raising Our Voice in uh, Parliament campaign that seeks to bring youth voices uh, that are so urgently needed into this place. I read now a speech on behalf of Winter. Uh, my name is Winter and I'm a 17-year-old uh, from Tangley, Western Australia. There are many aspects of the Australian experience that I wish to see evolve, but there is one that I am particularly hopeful to see change in the next 20 years. I've spent my high school years surrounded by some of the most wonderful people, many of whom happen to be queer, trans, non-binary, or otherwise gender diverse. And I have watched them, my friends, struggle to accept uh, to be accepted and to have their feelings and identities taken seriously. I'm hoping that society can normalise the non-conformity uh, to gender norms as well as increase the availability and normality of gender neutral bathrooms. Similarly, I hope that to see uh, increased funding for services uh, and that provide gender diverse youth uh, with guidance and acceptance so that they may live a life that feels authentic and fulfilling to them. Through facilitating societal evolution in this way, I hope to see that the youth of 20 years from now will not have to struggle, as my friends have, to find acceptance and understanding from Australia. Thank you, Winter. Thank you for your words and courage in putting them forward to Parliament today. Thank you, Senator Steeljohn. Senator Patrick. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Today, as part of uh, Youth Voice in Parliament Week, I deliver Shazi as Samadhi's speech. In 20 years' time, I hope that Australia continues to be a place of equality, where people treat each other with respect and kindness. I value the way people treat each other and the way the government treats people because it is so different to the way it was in my home country, Afghanistan. When I lived in Afghanistan, I could not study or go outside alone. Women do not have the same rights as men. Australia gives women and girls the opportunity to study and work. I'm excited for my future and what I can achieve in the next 20 years in Australia and hope to be a businesswoman one day. I hope that Australia continues to provide these opportunities to everyone. I hope that in 20 years every city in Australia has a high school that operates in the same way as Thebedon Senior College. Many young people arrive in Australia when they are past the age of being able to attend mainstream schools or experience barriers to education that mean they miss out and might want to study again when they're a bit older. Being able to attend a flexible but supportive school environment that treats them like adults but at the same time gives them uh, a supportive school experience is so beneficial. I would also change the legal age that people can buy cigarettes, vapes and alcohol. I believe 18 is too young and that increasing the age would help prevent young people from accessing harmful substances. Thank you, Shaziza. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. The safeguarding of our prosperity and peaceful way of life will only ever come from the strength of our enduring friendships with other like-minded nations. The recent announcement of the new regional security partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States is a testament to our ability to bring such nations together in defending our sovereign interests. But many questions still remain. Whilst I lament the typical bungling in the Coalition's handling of the future submarine program, I nonetheless also welcome the prospect 
of the acquisition of a nuclear-propelled submarine fleet for the Royal Australian Navy and the role that these vessels will play in the Asia-Pacific and Antarctic regions. The transition away from the diesel-electric to nuclear propulsion uh, for Australian submarines represents a significant challenge. However, having spent some time aboard HMAS Collins with uh, also Senator Hughes is also here in the chamber, I also know that our submariners will welcome the opportunity to meet this task. The development of advanced submarines also promises new opportunities for Australian industry. It is my hope that by demonstrating the capacity of industry to put this new technology to sea, we might also come to appreciate the opportunities it presents of outside of a defence context, as many have advocated, including the Australian Workers' Union. Because there is no denying that our prosperity in the future will depend on our ability to access cheap, abundant energy to power the Australian economy in a clean and emissions-free manner. And the peaceful atom, such as it has been termed, may very well have a role to play in achieving this. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Thorpe. <clears throat> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I also would like to contribute to the Youth Voice to Parliament, incredible young people. Uh, they are our future. And I have 12-year-old Layla Todd, uh, who wants to send this message to everybody. So I will be quoting uh, Layla uh, all the way and backing Layla all the way. I, I quote, I am Layla Todd and I am 12 years old. Imagine Australia in 20 years' time. There is a treaty agreed by both the Aboriginal elders and their communities and the government. Aboriginal people feel respected and connected to their culture and land. And non-Aboriginal people are learning from Aboriginal knowledge. The Aboriginal flag is owned by Aboriginal people and they are free to use it as they wish. Australia is close to recycling 100 per cent of its waste and using 100 per cent green energy. Whenever a new house is built, it is easier and cheaper to build with solar panels and other renewable energy sources. All money that was invested in coal mining is now put towards renewable ways to produce energy. Nothing is wasted and there is a sustainable cycle for the things we use. In school, students of all year levels are assessed not only on their test results but all their other skills too. They feel they can show who they are. There is more student choice and they are learning things that will help throughout life. Australians feel happy, healthy, safe and respected. This is my vision." End quote. I say to Layla, please come and join me in this place because you have more sense, vision and courage than half of the people in here. Thank you for sharing your vision. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this month is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I would like to pay tribute to the Hunter Breast Cancer Foundation, which is a Newcastle-based and founded not-for-profit organisation which provides support services for both men and women living with breast cancer in the Hunter region. The Hunter Breast Cancer Foundation is incredibly passionate about delivering the best level of support and services to those who are dealing with the effects of breast cancer. And during the pandemic, they've been busier than ever. Whilst many charities and support services went into hibernation over the pandemic, they have had one of the busiest years ever. They provide extensive practical support services for those who are dealing with the effects of breast cancer. And this includes patient transport, house cleaning, lawn mowing, but also wigs and headwear. They've seen a significant increase in both services and client numbers, an 80% increase in the number of people supported in just this year alone, over 135 people with over 600 services delivered this year. More than 20,000 Australians will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. 
That's around 55 every day. And sadly, more than 3,000 of those will lose their life to breast cancer this year. Organisations like the Hunter Breast Cancer Foundation are vital to supporting our communities, and I'd like to commend them for their ongoing support and dedication to the Hunter community, as well as encourage all men, but particularly women, to have those checkups early and regularly because early detection is the best cure. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Wong. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This month marks the 30th anniversary of the 1991 Paris Peace Agreements that brought peace to Cambodia after 25 years of catastrophic civil war, invasion and genocide. In 1975, as the war was ending in Vietnam, the Khmer Rouge took control in Cambodia, embarking upon a horrific campaign of executions, displacement and forced labour, in which nearly two million people were murdered or died of disease and starvation. The invasion of Vietnamese forces in 1979 drove Pol Pot's regime from power, but began a new decade of destructive civil war. With the country desperately divided internally and ASEAN, China, Russia and the United States all supporting different sides, the conflict proved utterly intractable until Australia's Foreign Minister Gareth Evans identified a new way forward in 1989 built around giving the United Nations an unprecedented role in governing the country during its transition. The detailed plan that Gareth and his department drafted and pursued with relentless diplomacy, working closely with Indonesia in particular, culminated in the Paris Peace Agreements signed by 19 countries on 23 October 1991. These agreements are among the greatest achievements of Australian foreign policy. But as Gareth Evans said at the time, peace and freedom are not prizes which, once gained, can never be lost. They must be won again each day. Their foundations must be sunk deep into the bedrock of political stability, economic prosperity and, above all, the observance of human rights. Indeed, we still hope that the achievement of peace can be matched, as has not been the case so far, with the achievements of democratic pluralism, inclusion and respect for, and for human rights for all Cambodians. Australia takes inspiration from the courage and resilience of the Cambodian people and will always be a strong supporter of their aspirations for not only a durable but a just peace. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Dean Smith. Namaste. I stand, I stand this afternoon to congratulate the Indian Society of Western Australia on the official opening of the first Indian Community Centre in Western Australia, and I'm delighted that $2.5 million was, being able, was able to be provided by the coalition government in support of this community centre. 50 years, for 50 years, the Indian community in Western Australia has been dreaming of having its own home. I'm delighted that the coalition government, supported by myself, supported by Ben Morton, the member for Tangley, has been able to bring this dream alive for such a wonderful diaspora in Western Australia. No matter where we live in Australia, all of us know the tremendous vitality that the Indian community brings, whether it be in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Brisbane, in Adelaide, in Hobart, and I know it all too well in Perth, Western Australia. And having established a new Indian centre in Willerton, which my Western Australian colleagues will know is south of the river, I'm delighted to be the first person to begin arguing for an Indian centre north of the river so the wonderful Indian diaspora can continue to celebrate its rich culture, providing language rooms and performing centres for all of its wonderful people. Again, I congratulate the Indian Society on the great work and leadership they have done in being able to bring this very, very worthy community project alive. It being Senator O'Neill, you have well, I just want to draw the no attention. time at all. <laughs> Sorry, Senator O'Neill. It, it is now after 2 p.m. and under the, uh, under the order of business. We must move to question time. I'm sure you'd agree, Senator Keneally. Um, Sen Senator Keneally, you have the call. All right. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator McKenzie. National Senator Matt Canavan has said if Mr Morrison adopts net zero emissions by 2050 without the approval of the Nationals, and I quote, it will be ugly. Does the Deputy Prime Minister agree with Mr Canavan? 
The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Keneally, for your question. I think it will be ugly. I think it will be ugly. I do agree. I agree with uh, Senator Canavan. Um, you'll have to check with Barnaby if he doesn't. But what we're doing as a political party is carefully considering uh, the proposal before us, and this proposal will set up um, a net zero position for our country over the next three decades. And it's only right and proper that the party that represents miners, the party that represents foresters and fishers, manufacturing workers, the party that represents farmers and those that live out in rural and regional Australia assesses the impact of this decision on our Order. communities, and not just between now and the next election, not just between now and our own political careers, but between now uh, and the three decades that this policy will be rolled out and will have uh, impact. And we're doing that in a calm, methodical way. We're doing it on behalf of the regions. It is actually the right and proper process uh, to, to go through. And our party room has primacy in this. It's not our leader having a top-down approach on what should and shouldn't happen to our communities or what should and shouldn't happen to our industries. It is each and every National Party MP and senator feeding into the leadership group uh, what uh, they think uh, will be the implications and what their views are, and we're taking those forward as a group. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Mr Joyce has declared that if Mr Morrison adopts net zero by 2050 without the Nationals' blessing, it could be, quote, a very hard time for the government and, quote, not what you want for harmonious government. What does the Deputy Prime Minister mean by that? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, um, I think, as I said yesterday, we have a very successful coalition government for 75 years, delivering outcomes for our nation and for the regions as a result of our shared values and commitment to deliver. Sometimes we disagree, very rarely, but we do disagree. Uh, and it is important that when we have periods of disagreement that it is a respectful conversation uh, and that is exactly how we are conducting uh, this negotiation and so well Order. and so I you know I think it would be best obviously for the coalition uh, that we come to an agreement but we've made very clear, uh, we're not agreeing to anything that isn't right for the regions. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr. President. Yesterday, Senator Canavan refused to guarantee there would be no resignations if Mr. Morrison adopted net zero emissions by 2050 without the approval of the nationals. How many nationals are at risk of resigning if the Morrison Joyce government adopts net zero by 2050? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, talking about resignations over climate change policy uh, the, and going to you know, what nationals may or may not do is uh, a, a hypothetical question. But I tell you who has actually resigned over climate change policy, and that is Joel Fitzgibbon. A great loss to the hunter, a great loss to those that care about mining jobs in this country, a great loss. For the, for the Labor Party. He should be a National Minister, Party uh, MP, Minister, but a great Minister, loss to the Labor Party. Minister, please resume your seat. You, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, point of order is direct relevance. The minister is straying into areas that have nothing to do with the question. It was specifically about the National Party and comments about National Party resignations made by a member of the National Party. Uh, Senator Keneally, the minister was addressing the issue of resignations over climate policy. I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I will have allowed you to draw the minister's attention back to the question, but 
Senator, uh, Minister, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. And talking about resignations of candidates and MPs, it was the uh, candidate for Fowler, I think, that actually pulled out of the pre-selection race. Minister. Senator Wong, do you have Thank a point you, of order? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, um, the point of order is direct relevance. Uh, the use of a verb doesn't mean that anything associated potentially with the verb is directly relevant. We accept. I think Senator, um, the former president, uh, talked about glancing references to the opposition. We understand that's part of the, the interplay of question time. But this is a minister who has asked about nationals resigning. That is the question. We'd ask it to be directly relevant. I'm, uh, I, no, no, no. Well, I, I'm happy to move leave for Senator no, Canavan to no, speak no, no. for two minutes. I'm happy no. to give him leave. Senator Wong. If, the, Senator if Wong. the government will give Senator him leave, Wong. we will give him have leave. Have you finished your point I of have. order? Is this on the point of order? Order, uh, Mr. President. The question was clearly about resignations, and uh, Senator Keneally has great experience here enforcing the resignation of a Labor Senator candidate uh, for the Senator lower house. Canavan. So this is directly relevant to the question's experience. I am, I am listening carefully, Senator Wong. I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. You have had the chance again to draw the minister's attention back to the question. I cannot direct the minister how to answer the question. She was dealing with matters raised within the question. I have a submission, Mr. President. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with respect, I'd ask you post-question time to take advice from the clerk and look at the hand side. We are not asking you to direct her how to answer the question. We are asking you to make a ruling to uphold the standing orders as to direct relevance. And I put it to you, and I'd ask you to get advice and consider the hand side, that a question which goes to the nationals resigning from cabinet over nationals resigning, which is what Senator Canavan put on the public record, appropriate question to the deputy prime minister's representative, cannot possibly be directly cannot possibly be answered in a directly relevant way by reference uh, to an entirely different matter. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr. President, uh, in considering the matters that, uh, that Senator Wong has raised, I would draw to your attention the fact that uh, Senator McKenzie uh, very clearly went specifically to matters of National Party ministers and their current representation in the current ministerial arrangements in the very first part of her response. It is having addressed directly the direct question asked entirely appropriate for a minister to be able to give context, including historical context, in relation uh, to, uh, Order, to uh, such Wong. answers that have been given. Uh, it is entirely appropriate for a minister uh, to be able to elaborate on a point that they're making. Um, and in elaborating, uh, that may mean that they are adding further context and information to what they have uh, provided in terms of a direct response to the question that was asked, Mr President. I, I, I have ruled on the point of order. I will come back to the chamber and I will uh, seek uh, further information on this particular issue and previous rulings that have been made. Uh, my ruling, however, stands. Minister Mackenzie, did you wish to continue? I was going to uh, put on the record, I think, Joel Fitzgibbon, a resigning member of the Labor Party. He resigned from the executive of the Labor Party, uh, the shadow executive, and uh, specifically on resigning around climate policy. He says the Labor Sen Party has not made one Senator contribution. McKenzie, resume your seat. Senator Van. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, with Australia reaching the national double dose milestone of 70 per cent, how is the Liberal and National Government's plan to secure our COVID recovery, supporting Australians to gain skills and helping keep Australia's pipeline of skilled workers flowing? Uh, I call the Minister. Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for the question and congratulations to Australians for reaching that 70 per cent milestone. Uh, again, it shows that we're all working together in terms of that pathway well and truly out of COVID-19. And Mr President, in terms of vocational education and training, it's something that employers are looking for in prospective employees. It ensures that they are work ready from day 
one. And the Morrison government, in terms of our investment, we are well and truly investing in a world-class vocational education and training system. Mr. President, our government, at the outset of COVID-19 and at the start of the pandemic, we invested approximately six billion dollars in skills funding at the commencement of COVID-19. This was the largest single investment to occur in vocational education and training ever in Australia. And Mr President, as a government, we recognise the benefits of vocational education and training, and that is why we are now investing an additional $6.4 billion over the 2021-2022 financial year. So what we now see from the Morrison government is an investment of over $12 billion in skills funding since the start of the pandemic. And what this has seen is whilst other countries have actually shed their apprentice workforces, what we have seen in Australia, and in particular because of the successful Boosting Apprenticeship Commencement Program that we put in place, new apprentices New apprentices in Australia increased 141.5 per cent year on year. That is because of the investments that the Morrison government, the coalition government, has put in place to ensure that we are helping those businesses who wanted to keep their apprentices keep them on, but also ensuring that those businesses who wanted to bring on apprentices had the right policies in place Minister, to do your that. Your time has expired. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how many Australians and Australian businesses have benefited from the government's investment in boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And this is a highly successful investment made by the coalition government in terms of bringing apprentices on into the workforce. This is a highly successful program, and what we've now seen is around 224,000 Australians take on an apprenticeship right across Australia. What we've also seen now is over 77,000 businesses they have successfully utilised this program, taking on another apprentice, or in the case of some businesses, they have been able to grow their business and take on multiple apprentices. What we do under the program is businesses who take on a new apprentice, they now get 50 per cent of that apprentice's wage, up to $7,000 per quarter, subsidised by the government for a period of 12 months. Months. So, for businesses out there, you have until the 31st of March 2022 to take advantage of this wage subsidy. Senator Van, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how will the extension of the government's successful boosting apprenticeship commencement wage subsidy help keep the skilled workers' pipeline flowing now and into the future? Minister. Mr. President, one of the goals of this particular policy is to now protect the pipeline of the apprentices today so that they become the skilled workforce that employers can have access to tomorrow. We have now expanded this successful program, the Boosting Apprenticeship Commencement Wage Subsidy, with an additional $716 million. Again, that is because we understand you put in place those policies that employers can lever off to grow their workforces. They can bring on apprentices, they can bring on trainees, they can offer Australians that opportunity to be trained to be work ready from day one. And we have seen with a number of businesses who have accessed the policies and the number number of Australians who have been given an opportunity across Australia that this is a highly successful program. And again, we put in place those policies that employers can lever off so that they can get that skilled pipeline of workers that they need. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rustin. The Cabinet Handbook, which makes it clear it applies to the whole ministry, not simply those ministers in the Cabinet, requires that, and I quote, members of the Cabinet must publicly support all government decisions made in the Cabinet, even if they do not agree with them. Does Minister Pitt accept this obligation to Cabinet solidarity? The Minister representing the Minister for Water, Senator Russell. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Well, obviously, um, as you would expect, all ministers in the Morrison-Joyce government 
accept their responsibilities under the ministerial code in relation to their obligations very, very seriously. Um, however, I mean, obviously, um, as, uh, as Minister Pitt has made uh, a number of comments in relation to, um, to issues that he feels very strongly about, and obviously he has the right to make those comments and those decisions. But, of course, as a government, we, uh, we remain absolutely committed um, to sticking together. And as Senator McKenzie, I think, has made, has made, uh, had made comment today um, on many, many occasions, Order. and yesterday and the day before, and uh, I think she's probably very relieved that the first, you know, she's only had one question today. I mean, I thought you might have uh, continued with your track record of this week of asking Senator McKenzie every question from uh, from that side of the chamber. But the one thing that this government does, uh, the National Party and the Liberal Party in coalition, is that we work together respectfully to make sure that we. Do Deal Order. with the issues that are important to Australians, important to all Order. Australians, Australians that live in the city yeah. and Australians that live in rural yeah. and regional areas, because it is incumbent on all governments to make sure that we canvass the concerns of every Australian when we make very important policy decisions. And yeah. Minister Pitt, just as I and many other ministers in this government, um, are expressing in this debate, respectfully amongst ourselves, Order. the views of the constituencies of which Order. we Senator represent. Reed. And I think you know we have seen through the responses that you have received from Senator McKenzie over uh, the recent days just how respectful that that conversation is. And I can assure you that we will continue to have a respectful conversation with the people of Australia Order on this very, on very left. important policy decision of Senator our climate Keneally. policy going forward, because it matters to Australians. It matters to them about what this is going to cost, and it matters how we plan Minister, to get there. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. Does Minister Pitt support the Prime Minister's position that the Australian government needs to adopt a net zero by 2050 commitment? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Mr. President. Um, the whole government supports a platform and a plan that allows the Australian uh, economy to be able to transition to a low emissions Order. future by Order. developing a plan. Oh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Gallagher, on a point. Direct uh, relevance. The question had no preamble. It was directly so, Minister, about the minister's. <laughs> Minister Pitt's support for the Prime Minister's position. It, wasn't, it was a very direct, purposely drafted directly to that type question. And, and I will continue. Uh, did you have a submission, Minister? Or? Uh, uh, Senator Gallagher, allow me to rule. Um, you raised a point of order. In my opinion, I was listening carefully to the Minister. She was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, right now, we are in the midst of a respectful conversation, not only between the two parties of the coalition government, but with the Australian public, about a plan to make sure that we move to a clean energy future. Now, we have not made any decisions in relation to the finality of that, and so to come in here and make a whole heap of assumptions about things, we will continue to work respectfully Order. amongst our coalition partners Order. to make sure that we deliver a future, an energy future, that does not provide cause households to pay higher Order. energy prices, doesn't cause businesses to have to pay higher costs, and doesn't put Australians out of work, particularly in our regions. Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. The answer was no. Senator Gallagher, you Thank second you. supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. One of Minister Pitt's own colleagues has reportedly said, and I quote, "He should go. He clearly doesn't agree, and it's not conducive to cabinet solidarity." Will Minister Pitt resign? Minister. Hmm. Uh, well, well, firstly, just to put, set the record um, correctly, um, Minister Pitt is not in Cabinet. Uh, Minister Pitt is in the outer ministry. However, as I have said and as Senator McKenzie said and as so many people on this side of the chamber have said, that we are having a respectful conversation about our plan to get to a clean energy future. We understand our obligations in relation to emissions reduction, but we understand their obligations to the Australian public our obligations to make sure that we don't tax them out of existence. We do not add a burden, a financial burden, 
to, to households' energy bills, that we don't add a burden to businesses that, that put them at a competitive disadvantage to the rest of the world, and that we make sure that we Order. actually protect Australian Order, jobs, Australian jobs in all sectors. We are absolutely committed to deliver what we said we're going to deliver, but we will do it by technology, and we are not going to tax the Australian population and economy out of existence. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Attorney General, Senator Cash. Today, the New South Wales ICAC has received explosive evidence from a frank and fearless public servant about the dodgy clay target grant for the Maguire International Shooting Centre of Excellence. It's reminiscent of sports rorts, pork and ride, and all the other times the Audit Office has repeatedly found that the government prioritised coalition and marginal seats in grant funding in the lead-up to the last election. Why is your government's model for a corruption body designed to not be able to look back at the misuse of public funds? Is it because half your cabinet have been implicated in integrity scandals? Uh, the Attorney General, Minister, uh, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and Senator Waters. Um, I will take it just as trite commentary. Uh, the end of your question. Um, the Morrison government, as you know, uh, we have Order. made it very clear uh, on our intent, Mr. President, to establish a Commonwealth Order. Integrity Commission. And in fact, Mr. President, uh, we have already put in place the required funding for when the Commonwealth Integrity Commission is passed. Order, Senator, uh, Senator Waters, you may be aware that we have actually committed $106.7 million of new money to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. This was in addition to the $40.7 million uh, in funding that we have provided for the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity, which will actually transfer to the Commission, which will take it to a total of $147.4 million. Uh, you'll also be aware uh, this is incredibly important legislation, uh, and we need to ensure that the model is the right model. And as such, we have conducted a nationwide consultation process uh, on exposure Order. draft legislation to establish the Commission, and in fact, 333 submissions were received, detailed submissions. 46 consultations, meetings and roundtables were occur uh, occurred during the consultation period. Oh, sorry, uh, Minister. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Just a point of order on relevance. My question went to whether the model would uh, be able to investigate all of the rorts. I know the answer is no, but the minister needs to address that question. The, the, uh, as you say, Senator Waters, your question addressed the model. Uh, the, the minister was being directly relevant as to the model. Attorney General. Uh, thank you. And as I said, we are consulting on the model. That was what the exposure draft legislation was all about. And the government is now considering the feedback on the model. Senator Waters, a supplementary yes, question. Yes, thank you, President. It's been more than a thousand days since this government said it would introduce an integrity commission, and yet two years ago, my bill for a strong, independent corruption watchdog passed this Senate. But you've refused to bring it on for debate in the House. The Centre for Public Integrity recently ranked that model as gold standard, and your government's model as the weakest in the nation. Why won't you bring on my bill for debate so the Australian people can have the robust, effective corruption watchdog it deserves? The Attorney General. Well, Senator Waters, you obviously did not listen to my previous answer. The government has its own model uh, that is, it is putting forward. We have sent out the exposure draft legislation. We have received extensive feedback on the exposure draft legislation, and we are now considering the feedback on the exposure draft legislation. And that extensive feedback through that consultation process, and I took you through the consultation process, it was an extensive consultation process, will now inform the further enfriment uh, of the draft legislation. Senator Waters, a second supplementary. Yes, thanks, President. Liberal backbenchers Ms Katie Allen, 
Mr Dave Sharma and Ms Celia Hammond have all called for a stronger model that includes a broad definition of corruption, public hearings and letting the Commission initiate its own investigations. Meanwhile, Mr Barnaby Joyce described a strong corruption watchdog as a Spanish inquisition that makes politi politicians terrified to do their job. Will you listen to those in your party calling for stronger measures, or are the Nationals in charge of integrity policy too? Attorney General. Well, again, this would appear to be your second supplementary, which mirrored your first supplementary, which actually mirrored your primary question. Again, we have undertaken an extensive consultation process. Mr. President, this is an important piece of legislation. Um, it is important that we get the details of the legislation right. That is why the government released the exposure draft of the legislation. That is why we are considering the 333 written submissions to take on board the feedback. And as I have already articulated, uh, the feedback that we have received will now inform the further refinement of this draft legislation. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberals and Nationals government childcare policies are supporting Australian families and businesses, and how will they help secure Australia's COVID recovery? The Minister for Women's Economic Security, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hughes for her question. We know how important childcare is for thousands of Australian families, and that's why the Morrison government has delivered a targeted, measured childcare package that is keeping out-of-pocket expenses low and allowing more parents to work should they choose. Average out-of-pocket costs are now just around $4 per hour, almost 18 per cent lower before our childcare package was introduced more than three years ago. The mechanism we introduced to restrain fee growth, the cap on hourly fees, is also working, with 86.2 per cent of services charging below that cap. But we know that these costs still add up when you have two, three or more children in care at the same time. So we're bringing forward an additional support for around 250,000 families with two or more children in care. These, fam these families will re receive Order. an additional 30 per cent subsidy, covering up to 95 per cent of their costs. So a family earning $110,000 a year with two kids in care four days a week will be better off by around $100 a week. Mr President, we said we'd introduce this earlier if we could, and now we are delivering. The work we've done to ensure that the IT framework is ready and in place and centres will be prepared is underway. Mr President, we're bringing these measures forward to March next year, saving the average family with two children in care around $700 per week this financial, $700 this financial year and $2,200 a year going forward. The Morrison government is committed to increasing economic opportunities for Australian women and families, and this additional childcare support will help remove disincentives for primary carers, particularly mothers, to participate in the workforce. This is especially important as our economy begins to open up, providing women with more choices and more chances to enter or re-enter the workforce. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister outline the economic impact of this measure? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks to these measures, the equivalent of around 40,000 parents, largely working mothers, will be able to work an additional day per week, boosting the economy by around $1.5 billion per year, right at a time next year when our economy in recovery will be in full swing. Mr. President, it's not just families with two children that will benefit from our reforms. We're also scrapping the $10,655 annual childcare subsidy cap effective from this year. And this will be applied retrospectively for the whole of the 2021-22 financial year, meaning anyone who reaches the cap before this date will have an additional out-of-pocket out costs for the 2021-22 financial year reimbursed. Mr. President, it's estimated that around 82,000 families in just Senator Hughes' home state of New South Wales will benefit from this measure. Bringing forward the subsidy means that, uh, and removing that cap will have an incredibly positive impact on families right across the nation. Senator Hughes, a second thank supplementary. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister please explain to the Senate who this child care support is targeted at? and how this differs from previous policy arrangements. Minister. 
Thank you very much, Senator, Senator Hughes. Mr. President, the Morrison government's child care support targets those who need it the most those on lower incomes and those with multiple children. In fact, around 60 per cent of all subsidies paid go to families on less than $150,000. More than 70 per cent of families pay less than $5 an hour, while almost a quarter pay less than $2 an hour. Mr. President, there are around 280,000 more children in childcare now than there were when we came to office with women's workforce participation reaching record highs of 61.9 per cent in March this year, and that remains near record highs. Let's compare this to Labor's reckless childcare scheme that would benefit millionaires the most. In fact, around $1.1 billion of Labor's policy per year would go to those earning over $250,000 a year, and a couple earning half a million dollars a year would get a $50,000 taxpayer subsidied payment. Outrageous largesse. Mm, Minister, the time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communication and Regional Education, Senator McKenzie. Does the Minister support net zero emissions by 2050? Uh, the Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator Wong, for your question. I've written uh, a couple of pieces which outline my views on this matter Well, uh, going back several months. Uh, I am not an MP that has come to this place ever denying the science of climate change, but nor am I an MP that has ever signed up to, to a member of parliament, a member of parliament uh, who's ever signed up to um, policies that will decimate jobs in rural and regional Australia. And over the time Order. I've been in this place, there has been a number of debates that, and a number of debates. Uh, in this place, and my political party has stood up uh, for rural and regional Australians and for jobs in our communities, uh, and we will continue to do that. I've made it very clear in my personal public commentary that I will not be signing up to any policy that is not right for rural and regional Australia, not just to get us through the next election, but to Order. get us through the next three decades. Senator Pratt. And it is very, um, it's very easy for those who don't live in the communities that we live in and represent the communities we represent to take, to take a, a different approach. Very, very similar to, you know, like you see Senator Canavan lives in a community that is based around coal mining. But when you look at Anthony Albanese's perspective on coal mining, lives nowhere near it. I don't think there is a place for new coal-fired power plants in Australia. Full Senator, stop. Minister, Full stop. Minister, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong, I would point out there is only six seconds left. I'm happy to take the point of order. That doesn't prevent a point know. of order. I know. I'm Mr. happy to President. take the point yeah, of no, order. Thank you. I was uh, just pointing uh, yes. out. Uh, direct relevance. Demonstrably not directly relevant. Uh, the minister was clearly being directly relevant in the first part of her question. I agree that towards the end she strayed from direct relevance. However, uh, the minister was being directly relevant through the, the answer to the question. And you certainly uh, you have six seconds, uh, Senator McKenzie. Do you wish to continue? All right, uh, Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does the minister support the Prime Minister's position that the Australian government needs to adopt a net zero by 2050 commitment? Minister. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wong, for your question. I support the Prime Minister pursuing a technology, not taxes, approach to lowering our emissions in this Order. country. Absolutely. We, this, as a species, the human species over eons Order. has progressed through the adoption of technologies. Now, the National Party in the Senate has been very, very clear. Uh, we moved amendments and tabled amendments when it came to clean energy Order. financing that backed the low uh, emissions technologies of carbon capture and storage. And I really wish 
we could get Larissa Waters and her team on to how we actually can protect jobs at the simultaneously lowering emissions, and that is through those types of technologies. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Direct relevance again. This minister is flagrantly ignoring the direction you've provided her in question no. time. She is well raising issues about the leader of the Greens in a question about whether she supports the Prime Minister's commitment on net zero cannot be directly relevant to the question she asked. She was asked. The, the, the minister She's was avoiding it. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. As has been made clear by previous uh, occupants of this chair, uh, glancing references to other parties and glancing references uh, to the policies of other parties is acceptable. Uh, it does need to be a glancing reference. At this stage, I do not believe it could be described as more than that. Um, Senator McKenzie did. Uh, Senator McKenzie was addressing the question. Uh, Senator McKenzie, you have nine seconds. Did you wish to continue? Um, so when we talk about the Prime Minister's plan and our government's plan to use technology, not taxes, to lower emissions in this country, get on board with some of your smart Senator unions McKenzie. who actually are backing Senator nuclear. McKenzie. I'm not sure what happened with the clocks there. It went to. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'm not sure what happened there, but the clock suddenly went to zero. So um, I will continue. A second supplementary. Thank you. Final second supplementary. If the minister isn't prepared to support the prime minister publicly and here in the parliament, is she prepared to resign from his cabinet? Minister. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. President. I don't know how you're going to rule on this one if I say that's a hypothetical question. And once again, Senator Wong is uh, scoping out using question time to cheaply score political points. What I would like to know from the Australian Labor Party is Order, whether Senator they Wong. actually support regional jobs, Senator whether they Gallagher. actually back Merrill and Order. Joel and actually On back the mining left. industry in this country. At least the forestry division Senator of the Wong. CFMMEU has the guts to stand up for workers. Why doesn't the mining division? Why isn't the construction division? If you actually cared about Minister, workers in this country, Minister, you would be standing up. Minister, Senator Wong. Thank you, I Mr. President. I was calling the minister to order. Thank you. I just note that over that period of time, some more time was wasted, again on some, on matters entirely irrelevant to a question that was clearly about her obligations as a cabinet minister. How can what the CFMEU Forestry Division does be relevant in any way to her this minister's obligations as a cabinet minister. Minister. Yes, I was an officer of that union. What's that got to do with anything? Sen Sen no, no, no. It's about this her is not as a, a cabinet time minister. For debate across the chamber. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Minister, you have 17 seconds left. Senator Wong has called your attention back to the question. I would, I, Senator Wong, please do not interrupt me when I'm making a ruling. Senator, Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong has brought your attention, attention back to the question. You have 16 seconds remaining. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm sorry that my comments uh, and me not accepting the premise of your question actually upset you so much, Senator Wong. I know it's been a while since no, you've been in no, cabinet. That's fine. Uh, but the hand Minister. <laughs> no. Sorry, Senator Wong. Go ahead. Mission. Is this a you point of the, order, Senator? A point of order on direct relevance. You gave the minister the courtesy, as the president should, uh, of reminding her that I had drawn her to the question. She has abused the graciousness of the chair and simply then gone proceeded on exactly the same tack. Um, no, uh, I, I disagree, Senator Wong. Um, the minister is entitled to reject the premise, premise of the question. Uh, Senator McKenzie, you have three seconds left. Do you, Senator McKenzie? I, more than any other, are very aware of Your cabinet time standards has and the minister. Senator McKenzie, Senator Scar, order. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. 
Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's partnership with Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour, in response to the current COVID-19 third wave? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I thank Senator Scar for his question and particularly for his interest in this very important area. The COVID-19 situation in Papua, Guinea, Papua New Guinea is very concerning as we're seeing a new surge in cases associated with the Delta strain and it is placing significant pressure on the health system. Uh, both the Prime Minister and I have spoken with our Papua New Guinea colleagues uh, to discuss the challenges that they're dealing with, including to assure them that Australia is standing, is standing by them at this very difficult time. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been partnering closely with the government of Papua New Guinea on their needs. That includes over two million pieces of PPE, testing equipment and supplies, oxygen concentrators and pressurised air masks, over 100,000 genomic tests with support from Melbourne's Doherty Institute to identify COVID-19 variants of concern, and support to enable increased provincial health service delivery through church health services. We have now deployed five Australian medical assistance or OSMAT teams to Papua New Guinea to provide critical care planning and clinical care. We're now providing further assistance as Papua New Guinea responds to this most recent concerning surge in cases. That includes partnering on the reopening of the Nightingale Centre to increase the capacity of Port Moresby General Hospital and support to important provincial health authorities to maintain their essential operations. We're supporting Papua New Guinea to vaccinate more frontline health workers and expanding commercial vaccination hubs, including in major urban centres like Leigh. The Australian Defence Force is providing logistics support and vaccination training to the Papua New Guinea Defence Force, and I acknowledge the exceptional working relationship between the PNGDF and the ADF. Australia will continue to meet Papua New Guinea's vaccine supply needs and support their vaccination rollout program in partnership with the Papua New Guinean government. Senator Scar, supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the fabulous work of the Australian Medical Assistance Team members in Papua New Guinea? Minister. I thank uh, Senator Scar for his uh, supplementary question. It is indeed exceptional work that those OSMAT teams are doing. A seven-person OSMAT-led team arrived in Port Moresby this last Saturday uh, on a flight that also delivered 40 of the oxygen concentrators that I referred to earlier. It's led by one of OSMAT's most experienced doctors, Dr Mark Little. The team includes a nurse practitioner, a public health specialist as well as logistics experts. Uh, I would acknowledge and thank Dr Little and the greater uh, multiple OSMAT teams who have deployed to Papua New Guinea and the Pacific uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. The team has strong experience partnering with Papua New Guinea's health officials. They will be in PNG for three weeks. They'll work closely with the Ministry of Health and the important National Control Centre. The team will identify further priorities for assistance, including cl additional clinical support to manage the surge and medical equipment that can be deployed within Papua New Guinea's health system. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Mr President, can the minister outline Australia's work with Papua New Guinea to support their vaccination program? Minister. I thank again Senator Scar for the question. Last night, Australia delivered a further 60,000 vaccine doses to Papua New Guinea. Uh, we're committed to working with them to meet the needs of the country. Uh, we're partnering with the government, with business and with NGOs to promote the importance of vaccinations, and we've launched a campaign with the Papua New Guinea Council of Churches to address hesitancy issues. Uh, the ADF is providing logistic support in the Torres Strait border region, where vaccination rates are now the highest uh, in Papua New Guinea. An Australian-funded clinic in Port Moresby uh, has itself administered over 13 per cent of the vaccinations administered nationally. We're supporting pop-up clinics at convenient locations like shopping centres. Australian experts are also working with PNG and the WHO on a plan to expand and accelerate the rollout, prioritising those provinces with the highest numbers of cases. Uh, Senator Faruqi has the call. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. The climate impacts of your coal, oil and gas-loving government are being felt first and foremost by nations who did nothing to create this crisis, including our Pacific neighbours, who are watching their children's future disappear underwater. 
Yet Australia has abjectly failed to deliver its share of climate finance as committed to in the Copenhagen Accord. A report by the Climate Action Network Australia released today has calculated Australia's fair share to be $3 billion over 2020-2025 and $12 billion annually by 2030. Now that we know that Mr. Morrison will show up at COP26, will he commit to increasing Australia's measly climate finance contribution to pay our fair share, or will Australia remain an international outlier on climate? The Minister for International Development, Senator Sazelja. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much, and I thank the Senator for the question. Um, the short answer to the question uh, is that Australia has uh, made a strong commitment to climate finance, including in the Pacific. Um, and that includes, uh, between 2020 and 2025, uh, $1.5 billion, with uh, at least $500 million of that going to uh, the Pacific. So that's to directly answer your question. There are a number of uh, other pejoratives uh, in your question, some of which I'll, I'll seek to address. But when it comes to the issue of uh, climate finance, uh, we will have more to say uh, going forward. But when it comes to doing our bit, uh, we absolutely reject the Greens' constant, incorrect, inadequate uh, assertions that we are somehow not doing our bit when it comes to climate change. Now, you know, we hear from the Greens constantly. Uh, they parrot it. They talk our, our country down, and they ignore the facts. They ignore the facts. Uh, and when I'm speaking with Pacific leaders, uh, we deal with the facts rather than the assertions that are made by the Greens. And those facts include that we have reduced our emissions by 20 per cent since 2005. And when we compare that to other uh, similar economies around the world, uh, we are doing far more than our bit. When you look at countries like Canada, uh, where we are well ahead, when you look at the OECD average of wealthy nations, we are well ahead. We have reduced our emissions but at a faster rate than places like US uh, and Japan and the OECD average. So the Greens might want to put forward uh, this assertion, which is completely not based in fact, which is in fact incorrect. You might want to talk our country down when it comes to these actions, but whether we're talking to our Pacific neighbours or whether we are going on to the world stage more broadly, we have a proud record. Uh, and we will do our bit and continue to do our bit and work with countries in the region and beyond uh, to deal with these challenging issues. Senator Faruqi, a supplementary question. Minister, Australia was instrumental in discussions at COP15 that led to the establishment of the Green Climate Fund. But since 2018, the Liberal National Government has contributed zero dollars to the Green Climate Fund. Why did the Australian Government abrogate its responsibility and stop contributing to the Green Climate Fund? And will you commit any money to this fund again? Minister. Uh, well, in terms, in terms of uh, specific issues around the Green Climate Fund, uh, they, will be, uh, they are decisions uh, that will be made, uh, not, by, not by me, uh, I will say, but, uh, but when it comes to the, the history and when it comes to contributing to climate finance, we have made uh, our intent clear. And we have done it uh, in all sorts of ways, as I outlined uh, in the answer to your first question. And going forward, uh, we have committed $1.5 billion uh, to climate finance around the world, uh, with at least $500 million of that to go to the Pacific. And as I said earlier, uh, we intend to make further announcements in that space. Uh, but I go to the point. Uh, Australia is doing its bit, will continue to do its bit. Uh, we do it in a way uh, that protects our economy. Uh, we do it in a way that works with our partners in the region. We take our responsibilities uh, to our Pacific family uh, very seriously. We're not going to be lectured to by the Greens on how we should do that, uh, but we have a proud record uh, despite your attempts to talk it down. Senator Faruqi, a second supplementary question. Minister, when the world was debating solutions to climate change, you were still fighting over whether it is real or not. Now we are in the critical decade and the world has moved on to establish meaningful 2030 targets, the Liberals and Nationals are having a brawl over 2050 targets. When will you stop being laggards, listen to science, and increase your miserable targets to the strong action our communities and our Pacific neighbours are demanding? Minister. Well, 
Thank you. I thank the senator for the question. We certainly won't be taking our lead from the Greens when it comes to our response on climate change or very few other issues, it must be said. Now, the Labor Party might take their lead from the Greens when it comes to responding to climate change. Uh, they may well, and we've seen that in the past. And the big danger for this country is if they were in government again, that they'd take their lead from you. And we got an insight into that from Senator Gallagher just this week uh, when she left open the possibility of bringing back a carbon tax if the Labor Party come back in. So we know that if, if there's a Labor Greens government in the future, the Greens will be pushing for a carbon tax. The shadow finance minister says all options are on the table, including the carbon tax. So we won't be following your advice when it comes to responding to climate change. We won't be following the Labor Party's advice. And, we, and, and the Australian people need to understand that if there was a change of government, it would be the Greens dictating to the Labor Party who say they are open to bringing a carbon Minister, tax back. Your time has expired. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. We are now 20 months into this pandemic, and the Delta strain is ripping through Papua New Guinea, a mere four kilometres away from Australia. Isn't Senator Fieravanti Wells right to say that this government, and I quote, has dropped the ball, has dropped the ball on providing urgent support to our most most important Pacific partners? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. I absolutely reject Senator Wong's question, and I absolutely reject the proposition uh, that is apparently put by Senator Fieravanti Wells, which I have not actually heard. As I said in response to the previous question from Senator Scar, who has a deep and abiding interest in these issues, we have been working very closely, in particular with uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, let me repeat, for the benefit of the Chamber, that. Working in partnership with another government involves recognising their sovereignty, their leadership and their uh, systems uh, to address some of the most significant challenges that they are dealing with in the context of a global pandemic. There is no doubt whatsoever that for Papua New Guinea, for Timor-Leste, for Fiji, for a number of countries that have dealt with significant surges of COVID-19 in the region that this has been a very difficult period, and each government has dealt with it in their own way. I acknowledge particularly the efforts that the government of Fiji has made to reach such high vaccination levels amongst uh, its population. I acknowledge the work that Papua New Guinea is doing and has been doing for a very long time in extremely difficult circumstances across perhaps the most complex geography you can possibly imagine to try to address uh, the challenges of COVID-19. Mentioned in my remarks the, uh, in, in response to the previous question, the Order. personal protective equipment and testing equipment and supplies we've de delivered, the oxygen concentrators, the pressurised air marks, the genomic masks, the genomic tests, our support with provincial health service delivery and the closeness with which we are working with the government of Papua New Guinea on addressing very difficult issues of vaccine hesitancy. I don't think we should underestimate those. That's why we're working with churches and non-government organisations, the government itself uh, in many of those Minister, places in Timor-Leste. I'm pleased to say— the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr President. Why has the Morrison-Joyce government failed to work with our partners in Papua New Guinea to ra rally a global multilateral response to support PNG's health system? Is it because it is led by what Senator Fieravanti Wells described as the prime marketing office instead of the prime minister's office? Minister. It's interesting to suggest, um, I would say to the chamber, that working with the WHO, with Gavi, with CEPI, with UNICEF, uh, with uh, humanitarian and development assistance deliverers, uh, like many of the agencies here in Australia that we support, working with uh, ISOS, with ASPEN, other organisations. Uh, particularly the regional director of WHO, uh, Regional Director Keshi, who is uh, one of uh, WHO's leading administrators. I do think that is an example of the work that we are doing with uh, those sorts of international groups uh, to which uh, Senator Wong uh, has referred. As I said, I'm not the beneficiary of the um, views put by Senator Fieravanti-Wells, but based on Senator Wong's assertions, I don't agree with them. 
Senator Wong, a second supplementary? Uh, they were views put in the parliament, Minister. You might want to acquaint yourself with them. And I again ask this, and I ask a supplementary question, which is this. Why has the government left the fate of one of our closest neighbours and most valuable partners in the hands of ministers that Senator Fieravanti Wells describes as a revolving door of L platers? Minister. Well, Senator Wong, I'm not um, not uh, not sure uh, that um, perhaps Senator Wong has the detail that would be helpful to her uh, in relation to the work that the government has Order. done with the government of Papua New Guinea, and I'm not sure it would come from the remarks of Senator Fierabadi Wells in this case. Given Order. what you have explained to me, given what you have explained to me, Senator, I think you're reflecting unfairly on Senator Fieravanti Wells, and I think that's most unfortunate, Senator Wong, that you would reflect unfairly on Senator Fieravanti Wells, because what is important here, Senator Wong, is the work that we are doing with the government of Papua Order. New Guinea, the government of Papua New Guinea, a Senator sovereign Pratt. nation with whom we are honoured to work and with whom we work very hard to address the sorts of challenges that other senators have raised sensibly and constructively in the chamber. Senator Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister advise the Senate about her recent visit to the Kimberley region of Western Australia and how NDIS services are being delivered in rural and regional Australia? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much. And firstly, I congr congratulate you, Mr President, on your appointment. And uh, thank you very much, Senator Smith, for the question. And thank you also for your passion and commitment for the people of the Kimberley. Um, since becoming Minister for the NDIS six months ago, I have been listening and consulting widely on all aspects of the scheme. Recently, I spent a week travelling across the Kimberley region to hear and see firsthand the impact of thin markets on how the NDIS is, supporting, is able to support people with disability in regional and remote communities. This included many meetings, such as the ones with staff and volunteers and organisers at the Yarrayungi Aboriginal Medical Service in Halls Creek the Women's Resource Centre in Fitzroy Crossing, the Lions Outback Vision Institute uh, in Broome, and also the East Kimberley All Ability Sport and Recreation Program in Kununurra. I thank them all for their hospitality, uh, their time and also their openness. This allowed me to hear and see firsthand how the NDIS is transforming lives. However, it also allowed me to see firsthand the challenges in providing care and support in remote and regional communities. The negative impact on thin markets is very clear. The workforce shortages further exacerbate service availability. Average plan budgets in the Kimberley are actually around $10,000 higher than the national average, while utilisation is 20 per cent lower at 51 per cent. And quite clearly, Mr. President, this needs to change nationally. I hope to bring forward legislation this year to start addressing these problems of thin markets by providing the NDIA with more flexible commissioning models. Mr. President, the level and the quality of support received by any Australian on the NDIS should never, ever be determined by where they live. But today, sadly, with thin markets, that is still the case. Senator Smith, a Thank supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Your visit to the Kimberley was indeed very, very well received and welcomed. Um, what are the challenges for the National Disability Insurance Scheme across regional and rural communities across our country? Minister. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Smith, for that question. The NDIS fourth quarter report shows plan utilisation in the Kimberley region is 20 per cent lower than the national average, which sadly is not uncommon in, re in remote communities in particular across Australia. And that is not just the case uh, for disability services but for the provision of all care and support services in remote communities. There are so many experiences from this trip that I will always remember. But sadly, one is where my heart literally broke meeting a quadriplegic participant in her 40s in a remote aged care facility. She knows exactly how she wants to live her life with her children. 
but sadly, living so remotely, the life she wants to live is not yet possible. She has nowhere else to live, to stay near community or get the support she needs she is so badly and that she is actually funded from her NDIS packages. The upcoming changes Minister, to legislation Minister, will help us all address this. The time this. for the answer has expired. Senator Smith, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. What are the next steps to address the issues that you observed during your visit to the Kimberley region? Minister. Uh, thank you again, Senator Smith. To tackle the endemic issue of thin markets, we have to enable providers to operate effectively nationwide, no matter where they are delivering services. To do this, we have to build local workforces across regional and remote Australia for all Order. types of care and support services. And this is a shared responsibility with the federal <coughs> government and the state government. I'm delighted to be working with Pat Turner and the, Nas the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation to develop a model to deliver in new and different ways a wide range of care and support services in remote communities, including for NDIS participants. Together, we are developing a regional community-based workforce model, informed by the needs of locals to provide long-term employment opportunities and better support for people living in remote communities and also remote towns. Minister, oh, oh, uh, Minister Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And that uh, ends question time for today. Um, I will just ask senators to give us a few moments while we move to taking note. Are there any motions, uh, Senator Keneally? Uh, yes, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why questions on notice numbers 236, 238, 240, 242 and 245, 255 excuse me, from the Finance and Public Administration Estimates hearings remain unanswered. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President, and, uh, and I thank Senator, uh, Senator Keneally for um, advice shortly prior to question time in relation to, uh, to these matters. Uh, Deputy President, as I informed the Senate earlier this week, there have been quite an unprecedented number of, uh, of questions uh, posed uh, through the life of this parliament, uh, both questions on notice provided uh, through the chamber as well as questions on notice uh, through estimates committees. In fact, if my recollection is correct, uh, those uh, coming through the chamber uh, running uh, close to being in excess uh, of uh, the total number handled in the two previous parliaments combined, uh, showing the many thousands of questions uh, that, uh, that have been presented. Uh, overwhelmingly, those questions uh, uh, are answered and, uh, and answered in as timely a manner uh, as possible. Uh, I'll look into uh, to the particulars in relation to the questions that, uh, that Senator Keneally uh, has highlighted. Um, and, uh, and no doubt efforts will be made to provide uh, responses to, uh, to those uh, in, uh, in as timely a way as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Keneally. Madam Deputy President, uh, understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Well, what will happen first in Australian politics? Will the Prime Minister hop into his com car and head down to the Governor General's to call an election? Or will he and his ministers finally answer the questions put to them here in the 46th Parliament? It's disturbing how easily those opposite ignore their duties as public servants in this place. Accountability, transparency, responsibility, all nouns without a home in the Morrison-Joyce vernacular. I don't hold a hose, mate, said the Prime Minister. Well, he doesn't hold any answers, apparently, either. He doesn't appear to do much of anything. We know that the Prime Minister failed on the two jobs he had this year, roll out the vaccine and set up fit-for-purpose quarantine. Now, today, I have picked five questions that have been ignored by this Morrison-Joyce government. Five questions. Here they are. Here they are, five questions. But they are over, there are hundreds, there are 500 questions, over 500 in fact, unanswered, dating back to March 2020. 
March 2020, pre-pandemic questions, no answers yet provided. Those unanswered questions from March 2020 were asked to the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr. Morrison. The Prime Minister won't an answer them, and if that's the example he's setting, then no wonder the Morrison and Joyce government acts the way that it does. A fish does rot from the head down, after all, and this rotten behaviour undermines the community's faith in our democratic institutions. There are some in our community who might think this is all business as usual. But there are an increasing number of Australians who are growing disillusioned with the way Mr. Morrison plays politics in this country. They see the bad behaviour of the Morrison-Joyce government go unpunished and think that it represents the parliament at large. My message to those people is this. This is not normal. This is not the status quo. This is how bad government operates. The Morris and Joyce government have plumbed to new depths in every aspect of accountability and transparency. Compare this government to its most recent predecessors. I personally never thought we would pine for the days of Prime Minister Turnbull, but a comparison between then and now just shows how quickly the standards have deteriorated under Mr. Morrison. Dr. Parkinson, the former secretary for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, put the real value in accountability and transparency. That standard was set from the very top, and it flowed down accordingly. There was an expectation that you would do your job as a minister. Now, they got it wrong under the Turnbull government, a lot, but at least on occasion people were disciplined. They were disciplined for misconduct. They were disciplined for their lack of accountability. Now, the current Prime Minister, Mr. Morrison, does not punish bad behaviour, he rewards it. Look no further than the current Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience. This is an unlimited debate, Madam Deputy President, but yet I still wouldn't have enough time to go through the intricacies of the sports rort scandal. The sports rort scandal saw Minister McKenzie forced to resign but not before she was quickly brought back by Mr. Morrison. And now she is deciding Australia's climate change policy. She is one of the gang of four that's going to decide how many millions or perhaps billions of dollars of pork are going to flow through to allow Mr. Morrison to secure a deal on climate change. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Certainly we saw today the minister openly threatening her cabinet colleagues. Quite an extraordinary performance in question time. But Minister McKenzie is one of the many scandal-prone ministers who've made startling comebacks under Mr. Morrison. Ministers Taylor, Joyce, Colbeck, Cash, Lay, Dutton, Fletcher, Robert, Tudge, Hunt, Rustin, Reynolds, Porter. If you want to work out what they did, go to our website, notonyourside.com.au. If you're a backbencher in the Morrison government, if you are stuck looking at the back of someone's head in question time, you have got to be asking yourself, what have I done right to be stuck up the back here? It's truly staggering what gets rewarded on Mr. Morrison's watch. Ministerial standards, dead under Mr. Morrison, and we will see that again, I predict, when after the cabinet adopts net zero by 2050, Minister McKenzie and Minister Pitt don't have to abide by the ministerial guidelines. Let's see if they get a free pass. Comparing the days of old with the current standard is truly an exercise in despair. A stark contrast between a bygone era when ministerial standards and government accountability existed and the utter mess that we are in today. This Prime Minister doesn't like answering questions because he knows the Australian people won't like the answers. This is a Prime Minister that governs by focus group. How do we know that? Because his own colleagues, one of his own colleagues, told the media that at the heart of the Morrison government sits a focus group. His own colleagues, Senator Faravanti Wells, call the Prime Minister's office the Prime Marketing Office. And so hundreds of unanswered questions on notice 
is a massive red flag to the Australian people. Let's be clear, if the answers were any good news for the government, they'd be shouting them from the rooftop. The Prime Minister can't build a chicken coop without a ribbon-coating ceremony and a social media post. And that is because he is all photo-op and no follow-up. Now, there's very little substance to what goes on in the Morrison government. There's no big grand plan. There's no ambition for the Australian people. The Morrison government, Mr Morrison and his ministers, they're not interested in Australians' jobs. They're only interested in their own jobs. Mr Morrison doesn't care about anything except his own political agenda. And he is certainly not on the side of the Australian people. If Mr Morrison was, he would be up front with the Australian people. He would answer the questions put to him in this parliament. He would hold ministers account for their actions and behaviours. He'd be proud of his work rather than hiding the answers in the shadows. The Australian people have a right to know in a democracy what decisions are being made in their name and how their taxpayer dollars are being spent. The problem for Mr Morrison is on the rare occasion that he and his ministers do answer questions, the Australian people don't seem to like their answers. And so they know that being truthful to the Australian people will jeopardise their own job security. And there's an election right around the corner. Do we seriously think these 500 questions that haven't been noticed are somehow 500 good news stories kicking around the ministerial wing? They're going to roll out in the advent of an election? Of course not. That's absurd. These are questions they don't want to answer before an election because they don't want the truth to come out. So the Australian people have a right to know how their government's being run. Scrutiny of the Morrison-Joyce government is essential. It's essential for our democracy. It's essential for restoring the public's faith in democratic institutions. Because on this government's watch, we have had sports rorts. We have had robo-debt. We have had the ruby princess. We've had safer seats rorts, the Leppington Triangle, car park rorts, jobs for mates, Paladin, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation grant, hello world, job keeper rorts, where they gave $13 billion of taxpayer money to companies that turned a profit during the pandemic and they're not lifting a finger to try to get any of that money back. Under robo-debt, the pursuit of the penniless in robo-debt, some of them to their deaths, but to their corporate mates, don't lift a finger. Don't even suggest they might want to pay the money back. $13 billion wasted. A trillion dollars of debt run up and so little to show for it. Of course, what did we see last week? The Building Better Regions rorts. What a joke. What a joke. The money overwhelmingly going, 90% I think it was, to government held on marginal seats. Of course, Let's not forget, as Senator Green points out, some of it went to areas that are, could only, in the wildest of expectations or imaginations, be considered regions. I think in New South Wales, my personal favourite being the regional funding that went to refurbish the North Sydney swimming pool. <laughs> right there, under the Harbour Bridge, next door to Luna Park, directly opposite the Opera House, a regional fund to build a swimming pool. I don't know, maybe they think people from the regions in New South Wales like to travel all the way into North Sydney to have a swim. Anyway, we know billions and billions and billions of dollars of roiding, scandal, waste, mismanagement under this government's watch. It seems every time before they, every time they appear before Senate estimates, what do we get? Another color-coded spreadsheet. What did we hear last week? And, and um, Webster, the member from Mali, in the other place, she just basically belled the cat. She inadvertently let it out of the bag. 
There was a green spreadsheet and a pink spreadsheet, but only government members got told about the green and the pink spreadsheets. If you wanted your, law, your project to, get, uh, to move from the pink to the green, you had to lobby really hard some government minister. Well, no wonder about 90% of the funding went to government or marginal seats because they were running a color-coded spreadsheet scheme. These, this is why the Morrison government ministers and the prime minister himself are not answering questions put to them through the finance committee. I can't imagine how bad this is all going to look when the ANAO in inevitably reports and all the dodgy pork barreling that's going to happen to get to a deal on net zero emissions by 2050. What was it? What one of the government members called it? A giant green rainbow that's going to spread across the regions with crocks of pork sprinkled about. And we've got a minister here in the chamber, the Minister for Finance, who won't even tell us how much money they're prepared to spend for this political fix, who won't even tell us if it's in the budget. That trillion dollars of debt, nothing to show for it, going up and up. Just a political outcome. But this is an inevitable outcome when you have a prime minister who views every act of governance as a, a marketing opportunity. There's nothing that can't be solved with a catchy slogan, no storm that can't be weathered. I mean, look what we saw in the chamber here today. The Morrison-Joyce government sought to politicize domestic violence victims. Here I strike a deal with the Minister Alex Hawke. After two years, two years I've been trying to get a meeting with the Minister for Immigration. Finally I get one. Finally we get a deal. We get an agreement. We're going to deliver this piece of legislation. We're going to fix some things for women and children who are, are suffering from domestic violence. We're going we're to deal with the problem of low-level offending. We're going to try to address the concerns raised by New Zealand. We strike a deal. We're going to come to a conclusion in two weeks' time. What happens? Mr. Morrison pulls the rug out underneath his own minister because what would he rather have? A political outcome, not a practical solution. And what a low act. Women and children who are victims of domestic violence? Is there anything this prime minister won't politicize? The Morrison-Joyce government does not, as the prime minister once said, burn for Australia. They simmer in self-interest. The Australian people are waking up to the Prime Minister's shtick, his ad man approach, his prime marketing office. And there's something to see here with these unanswered questions. There must be, because they wouldn't be so intent on hiding the answers if there wasn't. Being the Prime Minister of Australia actually requires leadership. It means making the tough decisions, being held to account. It means bringing people with you and holding them to a standard. So. The malaise that swept through the cabinet is a choice made by this prime minister because it's the easy way out. And it's the Australian people who are worse off. As a result, this prime minister won't hold himself or his ministers accountable. I hope the ministers and secretaries listening today do take notice and take time to prepare thoroughly for Senate estimates next week. We can expect questions to be answered when they're taken on notice. So we're hoping for a lot more cooperation in the room next week. Thank you, Senator Keneally. And I believe you wish to speak on the same matter, Senator Patrick. Yes, oh. I do. Yeah. So I rise to also take note of the minister's answer uh, to Senator Keneally. There's a great difficulty uh, taking place in the chamber in that uh, we are asking questions, as we do as part of our oversight role. It's an important role of the Senate to ask questions, to inform itself as to the conduct of government such that we can do our job properly, we can discharge our responsibilities properly in the oversight of government. Yes, questions are asked, and there's a time requirement placed in the standing orders or in the case of uh, estimates, uh, time requirements placed by the committees themselves for the return of those answers. And it is disrespectful for ministers not to supply those answers within the, the, uh, the recognised timeframes. It's disrespectful not just to the senators who ask those questions, but to the people who those senators represent. I ask many questions uh, on the basis of an email I receive in my uh, 
in my electoral office uh, from a constituent that just wants to know something. And so I'll happily put a question on notice if uh, a South Australian asks me a question and I don't know the answer. It's an important process. Now, of course, we could stop questions on notice if indeed the government found some other source of money to pay for the things that it, do, that it does. But, but you know what? It gets its money from taxpayers. It gets its money from the citizens of Australia, from the businesses of Australia. And until such time as you find some alternate source, uh, I'm sure senators will continue to ask questions. Now, um, Minister Birmingham uh, stated uh, in, uh, on Monday and again today that the, the number of questions that are being ans asked and answered in, in, this, uh, in this parliament uh, are significantly more than in the last two parliaments. In fact, I think he said that the uh, number of questions answered this parliament equals the same as the last two parliaments combined. Well, let me, let me just talk about that. There is a fundamental difference between a response to a question and an answer to a question. I can uh, give one example in relation to National Cabinet, uh, in which I, and sorry, no, it wasn't in relation to National Cabinet, it was in relation, in relation to the cost of some proceedings um, that f concluded over a year ago. And I've had to ask three times, three times for an answer. So maybe that explains the reason why there are more questions uh, uh, to this government, uh, because they simply don't answer the question, they respond to it. And that means I have to go back and now ask a second question. And sometimes I have to ask it again. So please, Minister, do not stand up in this chamber and suggest that, uh, that there's something untoward going on here uh, on this side in terms of how many questions we're answering, because on your side you're simply not answering the questions properly. You're responding, but you are not answering. And when you start lifting your game, maybe these problems will disappear for you. Uh, maybe, Minister, you can go back uh, to the party room, to the, to, the, uh, to the cabinet, and suggest to them that they take the obligation of properly answering questions uh, seriously. Now, I was at a, uh, I was at a Senate inquiry uh, last Friday in relation to submarines. And I asked uh, Admiral Mead, the head of the task force that informed the government before it made its uh, decision on the, or announcement on the 16th of September to go down a, a different pathway to what they were going before, I asked a simple question about how um, about the advice that had been given to government about Simple things like cost and schedule. One would think that if you're cancelling one program and moving to another program, that in actual fact you would only do so on the, uh, uh, if you had at least some fundamental advice as to the cost and as to the schedule. I would ask the question about advice that was given to government, and the answer I got was an answer to a different question. I had to ask it several times. Not only did I have to ask it several times, I then had to remind the Admiral that he wears a naval uniform and he serves the Australian public and not political masters. And the culture that we're seeing across uh, when, we, when we carry out estimates um, is getting worse. We're getting officials turn up refusing to answer questions, pretending they're answering when they're only responding. And we have to go uh, again and again and again to get the answer. I know that the, the Select Committee uh, on COVID has sought answers in relation to National Cabinet uh, information, and despite a ruling by Justice White that National Cabinet is not a, a committee of the Federal Cabinet, the, the committee is still not getting answers back. And that's disgraceful. That's a judicial officer that's made a ruling that's being ignored by the government. So, uh, you know, the Senate needs to, to sort of observe what's happening here. Answers coming back that are only re that aren't answers; they're responses. Going to going to estimates and not getting proper answers from uh, from officials. All of that is led from a culture at the top, which is about secrecy. 
We can see that in the uh, COAG um, uh, amendment legislation, where uh, the Prime Minister, having lost uh, the, uh, his, his battle in, or his, the battle between me and him in the, in the AAT, is now seeking to introduce a new secrecy law. Obsessed with secrecy. Just answer the questions. Just be open and honest. In actual fact, on, uh, I pressed the admiral. I pressed the admiral. I actually had to say to him, "You are running very close to being in contempt of the Senate." Before he finally answered, and the answer he gave me was quite reasonable. But why do we have this culture in there of let's not answer questions? We've got two matters before the Privileges Committee now. The first being. Uh, the government's refusal to provide documents to the Economics Committee relating to naval shipbuilding, to, relating to one of the biggest uh, government expenditures, expenditures ever. And the documents that were requested were not confidential, uh, they're not, not secret, they weren't top secret. They were simply documents provided uh, to the government in order to help make a decision about which ship. Builder was going to get the was going to get the job. Uh, these are documents that go to what these uh, shipbuilders promised Australian industry, and the government has uh, refused to pr provide uh, answers um, or, in fact, those documents to uh, the committee. That's gone off to privileges, and there is some progress being made uh, in relation to that. But how do we get to this point? How do we get to this point where even documents being given to a committee who are willing to accept them in camera, such that they are protected by criminal sanction in the event of a, 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 of a, of a leak. How do we get to this situation where the executive says, we're not going to provide those documents to the Senate? Then we have uh, a statutory official who receives a lawful order from the Senate. The Senate makes an order for production and, of course, it, the Senate's always very reasonable in the way it conducts its business, much like a court who might issue a subpoena, gives the, the uh, person subject to the order or subject to the subpoena the opportunity to step forward and say, I don't think I should respond to the subpoena for these reasons. I don't think I should respond to the order for production for these reasons. And then what uh, happens is, uh, in the case of an OPD, the Senate considers that, that, that response and makes its final decision. And that's exactly what happened in relation to the tax commissioner. Uh, the Senate made a decision that the balance of the public interest lied in disclosure. It disagreed with, the, with the, where the balance lied in terms, of, uh, in terms of public interest and made a lawful order. And anyone who thinks that uh, I'm making this stuff up, go and read the 1998 High Court case of Egan and Willis. And I know Senator Keneally knows that because it relates to um, uh, um, Mr Egan. Um, in, in, the, uh, in the New South Wales Parliament. The, uh, the High Court affirmed what was always known through section 49 of the Constitution that, this, this, uh, that powers of Parliament have the ability to acquire or require the production of documents from the execu executive in order for it to be able to discharge its functions. So we're now in a situation where we have a, um, uh, where we have a couple of matters on foot with the Privileges Committee. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is a Senate mojo moment. I look at how the US Senate conducts its inquiries, and I see uh, officials that turn up to, to the US Senate, they dare not answer a question. They dare not provide a document which the, the, the US Senate orders, because they know that the US Senate will act. And in some sense, there's a test uh, running in the background right now for the Australian Senate. We can push ourselves back into a position where we are treated with the absolute respect that the US Senate is treated in the US, or we can fail to deal with what I say as a question of fact um, is a contempt. The delay of, a, of the Naval Shipbuilding uh, um, Committee um, uh, proceedings for well over a year. That can't go unaddressed. And I hope, uh, I hope the Privileges Committee finds that to be a contempt and issues a fine and, you know, or, or applies a sanction. We have to change the culture. So uh, whilst I allege, uh, or no, no, just assert, 
that there is a culture of secrecy uh, in the Morrison government, driven from the very, very top. Driven from the very, very top. In some sense, the Senate, when it uh, seeks, seeks uh, uh, answers and doesn't get them, uh, basically lets the, the executive get away with it and becomes part of the problem. So I'm hopeful that we will see a change. Some Senate mojo. You know, I refer back to uh, uh, you know, uh, Facebook a couple of years ago with the, the, the UK House of Commons. They wanted access to documents from Mr Zuckerberg. Uh, he refused. Of course, he's outside jurisdiction. Someone turns up to the UK and uh, the House of Commons says, well, we've got someone who's got the documents. And they sent out the sergeant at arms. Met, met up with the gentleman, invited him to come back in a very uh, insistent way to the House of Commons and offered him two choices, hand over the documents or you can, you can sit in the jail for, uh, for, uh, for a while. And the UK House of Commons got those documents because it stood up, because it exercised its powers. You don't have to do it many, many times. It's a little bit, a little bit like uh, freedom of navigation exercises. Every once in a while you have to sail a ship through international waters despite a country saying that they think it's their waters in order to be able to assert a right, to, 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 to uh, remind people of, of, of the rights. And I hope the Senate stands up in these two instances with these two uh, um, privileges matters to send a very strong message to uh, the executive that they must respect uh, the, uh, our need to be well informed in what, what it is that we do, uh, our need to be able to get access to documents when we, when we, when we ask for them. Okay, so uh, what we're seeing today, the issue raised by Senator Keneally, uh, is in fact part of a much broader problem. And uh, I'd ask the minister to consider all of the things that I've said in, in relation to that today. Uh, understand the, the responsibilities of answering questions on time. It is really important and, again, it's disrespectful when you don't do that. Uh, I'll foreshadow to, uh, uh, to um, the minister that tomorrow I will also use the same standing orders in relation to the, I think it's four um, estimates questions that have been delayed or haven't been returned uh, that, that I have asked. So uh, consider that notice under the guidelines in respect of the standing order, and hopefully by tomorrow I will have all those answers. Otherwise, we'll be, we'll be back here having another conversation about the responsibilities of government and the need for them to be able to respond to, uh, to um, the Senate in a timely fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Were you seeking the call, Senator no, Gallagher? Okay. So the, uh, so the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Keneally be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, as to why 2020 2021 additional estimates questions on notice numbers 1356 501 and 519 to 531 inclusive placed on the notice through the Finance and Public Administration Committee in the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio remain unanswered. Minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Gallagher, for her question. Um, uh, Deputy President, uh, as, uh, as I indicated in response to Senator Keneally and have already indicated this week um, and on previous occasions, the government has been dealing with quite unprecedented numbers of questions posed through the parliament. Uh, and in doing so, the government's been providing quite unprecedented numbers of answers uh, to, uh, to questions posed through the parliament. We're not talking about hundreds of questions. We're not talking about thousands of questions. We're actually talking about tens of thousands of questions in the life of this parliament. Uh, and the government works uh, to try to provide answers uh, where we can uh, to those questions. I know there are um, some senators uh, who um, seek to be quite diligent and earnest in, uh, in the approach that they take most of the time. And, uh, I acknowledge in, uh, in Senator Patrick's remarks that he just made, he stuck broadly uh, to 
question before the chair around uh, around accountability, around uh, around government responsiveness, uh, and he addressed issues in terms of the you know, particular nature of particular answers that uh, that are given. And uh, and so, although I don't accept the premise of all statements that Senator Patrick made in that regard, I acknowledge he uh, he at least stuck to the broad thrust of the debate. Uh, I think if uh, if the chamber reflects upon uh, the remarks made uh, by Senator Keneally immediately preceding Senator Patrick, uh, you'd find that it was a much more politicised uh, contribution, a politicised contribution uh, reflecting the fact that, uh, that um, many times, um, particularly from uh, those opposite, uh, the questions asked are, uh, are more about uh, cheap point scoring, uh, they're more about trying to advance political agendas. Uh, they, um, more about where you can try to seize a, a cheap headline or the like. Now, it's the right of those senators to spend their time asking those questions. And again, of the many thousands of such questions that come about, uh, the government responds to them, even where there's a whole swathe of hypocrisy attached to them. I mean, Senator Keneally, uh, you know, in her uh, uh, remarks that jumped across many issues beyond uh, beyond the questions that she was asking about, spent some time talking about uh, grant programs and, uh, and recent comments in relation to grant programs. You know, I note that, uh, that one of those grant programs, subject of uh, such commentary by Senator Keneally and others, is the Community Developments Grants Program and the Stronger Communities Program. And I, uh, you know, I can't help but notice that, uh, that uh, so many members of the opposition quite happily take advantage of such programs, promote such programs, advocate for grants under such programs. Uh, but then, of course, if there's a cheap headline to be had, uh, well, they're lining up, they're forming the conga line to, uh, uh, to be able to try to go after the cheap headline um, in, uh, in the national political debate while trying to seek out the good headline in their local media or their social media. I mean, the Leader of the Opposition himself, the Leader of the Opposition himself, uh, with, uh, with a fabulous uh, social media post, grants for Grandler. Could your community organisation use a grant, he, uh, he says. And we've got not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but half a dozen different photos of Mr Albanese um, posing with, uh, with different grant recipients, just in, uh, just in the one post there, um, uh, happily. Happily showing, and of course, uh, you know, sort of much of that commentary from Senator Keneally, from others in this debate, has been about whether too many of these grants have been going uh, to apparently city electorates rather than regional electorates. Well, if I'm correct, I think oh, the electorate of Grangler is. Sorry, uh, uh, Senator Birmingham. I think Senator Patrick's on his feet. Senator Patrick. Just, just on a point of order, I note that the minister has wandered off the question that has been asked by uh, by. Um, uh, Senator, Senator Gallagher and uh, is actually referring to debate that took place in relation to a previous question. Um, this part of the uh, standing orders is taking note, so um, it's a wide-ranging debate. It's taking note of unanswered questions, and I don't, I don't have the the unanswered questions, so I'm uh, not really in a position. But it's no, he's not answering a question; he's responding. Senator Patrick. I was just moved by his statement that it's a good idea to stick to the topic of the question. <laughs> Thanks, Senator Patrick. I'm sure the minister was listening to your words. Minister, please continue. Uh, touché, Senator Patrick. Touché. Um, and uh, and uh, Deputy President, in, indeed, um, uh, I uh, I am uh, responding a little lengthier than I did to Senator Keneally's uh, question to me about unanswered questions um, because of the, uh, the way in which Senator Keneally sought to then uh, address and, uh, and elaborate more broadly in relation to, uh, to those matters. I don't wish to detain the time of the Senate uh, at length. I was uh, simply making the point around the highly politicised nature of some questions. In other cases, uh, in other cases uh, we have seen, uh, particularly this year, that, uh, that questions um, you know, often are in pursuit of sensitive matters, sometimes legally sensitive matters, uh, that, uh, that do pose extra challenges in relation uh, to responding or answering to them, and, uh, and that that requires either extra advice being taken by government in response, uh, extra care, or indeed sometimes uh, highlighting the fact that, uh, that such details are difficult uh, to provide without compromising or prejudice, prejudicing, uh, prejudicing um, legal proceedings. Uh, so, Deputy President, uh, look, I, uh, I again come back to the substantive point that I made, which is uh, that this government in this parliament uh, has responded 
uh, to more questions uh, than, uh, than uh, were posed in the previous parliament or were posed in the parliament before that. Uh, we have been uh, more responsive than, uh, than uh, any previous government has been asked to be. Uh, we continue to seek to be so. We, uh, we have been handling uh, literally tens of thousands, some close to 35,000 questions uh, posed through different uh, estimates or parliamentary chamber processes, I should say Senate chamber processes. That doesn't count House of Representatives questions. It doesn't count uh, Senate Select Committee or Senate Standing Committee or House of Rep Representatives Standing Committee or Joint Standing Committee or Joint Select Committee questions. They're all on top of the 35,000 uh, that, uh, that we have, uh, have um, sought to handle to date um, and, uh, and indeed will continue to do so and provide responses in as timely a manner as possible, but, uh, but it is uh, in the face of uh, uh, record. Uh, record levels of questioning um, and, uh, and, indeed, in some cases, uh, highly sensitive approaches to. Thank you, Minister. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Well, if you listen uh, to the Minister for Finance, um, I think essentially the argument about why the questions that I have asked for, which are I think 166 days overdue now is because um, the government's had a lot of questions asked of it, more, more questions than, that, than previous governments. Well, I would submit that some of the explanation for that is because we've never had a government that's been so intent on not answering questions. I mean, many of these questions that I've asked that have been on notice now for 166 days or 166 days late, could have been answered in the Estimates Committee. Uh, but they weren't, because this government's approach to transparency and accountability is to have public servants appear and on anything that is not in the government's interest to answer, they will take it on notice or, or find another way not to answer the question. And that is a problem with, with the openness of this government which has now got a consequential effect on the number of questions that are being taken on notice, which now the senator leaving the chamber is used as an excuse to say we're overworked. Well, it's only right that the Senate should get not only a reasonable explanation other than, sorry, we came to work and are really busy and we haven't got round to it, which was essentially Senator Birmingham's um, submission to the Senate to demand that this information be provided. You are the government. You are responsible and the guardians of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in public funds. You are making decisions on the nation's behalf. There are senators in this place elected to hold you to account. You answer those questions. You don't come in here and, and cry fake tears to say you're a bit busy and you haven't got round to it completely useless explanation. And the Prime Minister in Cabinet, who these questions are late from, is the worst offender in my experience. Led by the Prime Minister's right-hand man, the butler that runs when the bell gets, that gets rung by the Prime Minister to serve his every need, leads that department and that is the standard they set where they take things on notice and then have no intention of answering to the Senate. So force us to come in here and expose them and embarrass them, and I still don't think it will matter to Mr Gaitchens or his crew, because that is the leadership under this Prime Minister that has shown about accountability, honesty transparency, responsibilities to the parliament, accountability to the parliament, not just to executive government. And when it's led like that and PM and C behave this way, why should any other department be any better? You know? Because it's clear they get rewarded and we're heading into estimates next week. Let's see how many senior public servants paid hundreds of thousands of dollars turn up and don't have information available or aren't able to take that question right now, we will get back to you, knowing full well 
that they can take 100 days or, or longer because there is no consequence, because they're rewarded by the leadership for doing that. That's, that's, what will, that's my prediction of what will happen, and that's why we're here now, using up precious um, time in the Senate to make the point that this is unacceptable. That's why you just had that contribution from Senator Keneally and Senator Patrick, and I associate myself with the comments Senator Patrick made as well, because it's spot on. And I think what this government hopes is that this explanation, oh shucks, we, we got to work and we're a little bit busy, is enough to just keep it at bay until the election. I mean, you can see what's going on. But the longer and the bigger picture after eight years of this type of approach is that these institutions, these conventions, the, the, the parliamentary um, practice that has developed over time and enshrined these processes as part of our democracy are getting chipped away at. And it's important that we stand up for them and important that we call it out, even if Mr Gaitchens isn't going to answer my letter that I wrote to him asking him where these answers are, even if they come to estimates next week and refuse to answer. It is important that the Senate stand up, calls it out and tries to protect it. Because when you whittle away the public service, as has been done under this government, and you start whittling away the FOI Act, as has been attempted by this government and continues to attempt to do it, and when you disempower the Auditor-General, as this government has done in, in punishment and retaliation for the audit reports that it puts out on their rorting grant schemes, when you start wearing away the integrity processes of the parliament, there will be consequences on our democracy and on our access to information, and that is what we are standing up for. And that is what is happening here. It may not seem a lot that my questions 1356, 501 and 519 to 531 asked at March estimates 2021 you know, might not seem much. But the fact that this is a systemic approach to dealing with questions on notice is about whittling away those parliamentary practices, the scrutiny role of the Senate, because it suits this government. It's exactly what it's doing. They've done it to the Auditor General. They're doing it to the FOI Act. They're doing it to the way they, they deal with OPDs in this place. I mean, you know, it's all pretty obvious, and maybe on its own, on their, on their own, like people don't see that it's that big a deal. But put it all together, and there has been an eight-year-long assault on the scrutiny and accountability functions of the parliament. And that's why we are raising these points today. You know, so it's not about an overworked government. It's about a secret government. It's a government that will do anything it can to keep information away from the public eye, regardless of the fact that it's paid for with public dollars. And if it's not in their political interests, they will withhold access to that information. And that's why we are raising these points today. And the issues, I've, the issues, the the issues that are covered by my questions actually relate to a lot of questions around the matters surrounding Ms Brittany Higgins and the role of the Prime Minister's office. Um, there is a whole range of questions now that, it, that, that didn't suit the Prime Minister to ask at the time, and it doesn't suit him to answer now. But it's, you know, and the option available to the department is to provide an answer, including we are not in a position to provide this answer because, for example, there is a police investigation ongoing, something like that. They could do that, but they don't bother doing that either. It's just a blanket refusal uh, to, to um, respond to reasonable questions asked of officials. Now, it suits the government to have this approach. I have no doubt about it.
But we must stand up and we must ask for reasonable explanations and we must demand that officials attend estimates with the answers to these questions. 166 days overdue. And I would hope, when you guys are on the opposition benches, that you would seek to protect these conventions too, but that you wouldn't have to fight so hard because it would be working under a different arrangement with a government that actually understood and respected these practices. So I don't accept Senator Birmingham's explanation in any way that this is just because they've got a lot of questions. They've got a lot of questions because they don't answer the answers when they, the questions when they show up, when they're required to show up, and they don't provide information they should be, provide without having to take it on notice. For example, the Doherty modelling that we spoke of yesterday. Why hasn't that been released? Why do you have to put in an FOI request? and questions on no without notice and questions on notice about accessing that information. Well, there's a little saving for the, the uh, count of questions on notice for Senator Birmingham. You could cut them down right now if you actually started releasing the information that you should release in the public interest. And you should answer the questions that have been asked. And tr senators should be treated with res respect and senators should be able to fulfil their responsibilities for their roles in this parliament, including holding this government to account. That's what this is about. Anyway, to Mr Gaitchens, I hope I do get a response uh, from the letter that I wrote, and I am looking forward to receiving all of those answers to questions on notice that are now 166 days overdue before estimates uh, meets on Monday. Uh, there is no reasonable explanation that I will accept about why these questions have not been answered and why they should not be answered uh, in time by close of business tomorrow afternoon. Um, it, uh, other, you are just willfully obstructing the work of the Senate if, 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 you, if these are not answered. You've had plenty of a, um, notice. You were reminded of the obligations in a letter. You were reminded again today as per the guidance around this standing order, that we are interested in these, the answers to these questions, and I look forward to receiving them uh, by the end of this week. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Chisholm. Uh, I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Mackenzie and Senator Rushton to the questions asked by. Senators Keneally, Gallagher and Wong. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And what is clear from the answers to questions today from Senator McKenzie, and indeed throughout this week, is at the heart of this faux negotiation between the Nationals and the Liberals, the will they, won't they, at the heart of that is actually the very existence of the National Party. Because there's only two reasons the National Party actually exists these days. One is for pork barrelling and the other is for culture wars. And Senator Mackenzie has brazenly confirmed that today and this week with her answers in question time. They're stringing things along in an attempt to extort as much pork as they can out of the Liberal Party. They've even appointed a four-person committee to actually look at how much pork they can get and what they can actually do with it. That is actually what the National Party are up to this week. That is why they are stringing things along in this phone negotiation. And exhibit A in this is actually Senator Mackenzie herself, the person who lost her job over pork barrelling. Now brought back into the ministry, it's only the nationals that could actually be capable of doing something because they don't punish someone who's been engaged in pork barrelling. They actually reward them and get them back in cabinet and then actually put them at the heart of what they are up to this week. So it says all about the National Party that that is actually what they are trying to do this week. They're trying to extort as much as they can out of the libs and then actually go about pork barrelling in the lead up to an election. And the second reason why the Nationals exist these days is the culture wars. That's all they've got to offer the people of regional Australia. Not actually a vision for the future, not actually setting out something they want to achieve. All they want to do is engage in the culture war. 
Uh, they never attempt to have a positive vision for regional Australia. It's all about the scare campaign. And we can see elements about that. We can see the way that Senator Canavan's behaving. They want to ensure that they've still got that ability. And again, Senator McKenzie let the cat out of the bag. The only, she said this in answer to a question yesterday. The only reason they exist is to try and stop Labor from being in government. No actual positive vision, no actual reason for being in government. The only reason they exist is because they want to try and stop Labor from being in government. That is as sad as the National Party have become in this place. And the frustrating thing for this, and I spend a lot of time in regional Queensland. Uh, I've got a second office in Gladstone. I spend a lot of time in Gladstone, the seat of Flynn. I do a lot of travel through central Queensland. And that is what is so frustrating. That is why we are so frustrated by this motivation that we see from the National Party, is that there's so many opportunities that are out there in regional Queensland, be it jobs, be it the future. And there's businesses that are actually going about taking those opportunities, but through no help from the federal government. They're actually spending their own money because they see opportunity and they want to do the right thing by the planet in the long term. So they're actually investing their own money in these opportunities. I was in Emerald a couple of months ago with the shadow treasurer, uh, and we visited the bus company in Emerald that does a lot of charter work. They do significant amounts of work for the mining industry, uh, taking in workers, taking out workers so they can do it safely so the workers aren't driving tired after a shift. They are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars converting their bus fleet to hydrogen. No help from the government whatsoever. This is a bus company, a business group that want to do the right thing by the country. They see opportunity. They're prepared to spend their hard-earned money transitioning their fleet because it's the right thing to do in Emerald in the seat of Flynn. We saw what the state government did with Forest Future Industries just a couple of Sundays ago. A really exciting announcement in Gladstone about hydrogen. Uh, hundreds of jobs at stake there. I, I, was in a, I was in Gladstone a few days after that announcement. And I actually got the sense that the people of Gladstone saw this as a real initiative. They know this is going to deliver jobs. They know it's going to have a beneficial impact for their local community. This is what the future looks like. But again, without any help from the federal government, the state government have had to go it alone. And also, the week before that in Gladstone, we saw the joint announcement from Rio Tinto and also the state government about the future of their refineries in Gladstone as well, and looking at clean energy that is actually going to power those refineries into the future. And those refineries use about 20 per cent of Queensland's electricity. They're significant energy users, but it shows you again that they're looking at what the future looks like for them and understand the role that clean energy will play. So it is so frustration that while the nationals uh, have this faux war, regional Queensland and other parts of the country are getting on with the job of transitioning the country. If only we had a federal government that was actually prepared to work with them, how much more could we achieve? Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Hughes. Oh. Have a switcheroo. Well, someone, oh, look, someone needed to let me know. Sorry Senator about Davies. that, thank you. Madam Deputy President. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I thank the Labor Party for raising this very important issue. Because what I have just heard, what has just been highlighted to this chamber, is that our tactics are working. We are on a path to lowering emissions through technology, not taxes. Private enterprise is working with government to achieve a lower emissions future. It is exactly what this side of the chamber has been saying for the last couple of years. I mean, everyone wants to focus on the fact we haven't got a carbon tax. Therefore, without a carbon tax, we're not addressing net zero. We're not addressing carbon emissions without a carbon tax. Well, what a crock! What an absolute load of rubbish, which has just been proven by the senator's contribution across the chamber. Because, yes, through our roadmap to a lower emissions future, through our technology, not taxes, policies, private enterprise is getting on with the job, as are our government agencies. Australia has reduced its emissions by 20 per cent since 2005, the majority of which has, been, has occurred since we took government in 2013. That is only 1 per cent less 
than what has been achieved by the EU. But we've done it through technology, not taxes. We have done it by expanding consumer choice, not restricting it, by partnering with the private sector, not hitting them with a big stick, by consolidating our advantage, by seeing Australia adopt rooftop solar panels at a rate higher than anywhere else on the planet. That is, that is because we have not taxed people out of the market. We have not made it impossible. And what I hear from the ground, what I hear from the ground, is that even from people who absolutely believe in climate change, people who absolutely support moving towards a low emissions future, but what they are scared of is they're scared for their future. I've heard from farmers who acknowledge climate change, who live with climate change, who live through drought, they live through flood, they deal with the threat of bushfires year in, year out. But what they don't want to see is them locked off their farms for some arbitrary native vegetation target that does not achieve as good a carbon, emission, a carbon abatement as other alternatives. But that's what we saw the last time the Labor Party was in power. We saw farmers lose their right to farm. They ignored the potential for soil carbon capture and storage through cropping enterprises. They ignored the potential to reduce methane emissions from livestock by changing dietary uh, requirements. Since we've been in power, the CSIRO, working with James Cook University, have developed fantastic uh, seaweed-based feedstock for the livestock in industry that are achi achieving huge emissions reductions, phenomenal emissions reductions. And these people should be rewarded, not lambasted, because they haven't implemented a tax. I've heard from miners worried about the threat that we're just going to shut the industry overnight, which is also a crock. Croc. Out of all the countries that have signed up to net zero, some of the, there's 129 new coal-fired power stations currently under construction by countries that have signed up to net zero. And guess whose coal they want? They want ours, because our coal burns cleaner and more efficiently. So I'm not shutting the coal industry, and I won't support any moves that do. And I back the mining industry because that's where we get our lithium from, for the batteries that underpin our renewable energy. So thank you, Labor. Thank you for highlighting all the progress that we as a nation have made. And I wish that we would all get behind the achievements that both private enterprise and government agencies have made to get us to 20 per cent reductions, you, to get Time us on the pathway expired. to Paris. Senator Thank you, Deputy President. Um, this week's certainly uh, been an interesting one, to say the least. And um, you know, on one hand, we have uh, the coalition, in particular members of the National Party, say that they have a plan. They have a plan to reduce emissions, but on the other hand, uh, still want to um, support some of the biggest polluters in this country. Uh, indeed, as parliamentarians, it is a reasonable statement to make that we are by no means strangers to conflict, particularly in this place here in the Senate. But today in question time, it's been a prominent illustration of this, of where our passion, our disagreements with each other on what is best for our nation's future are on full display for all to see. However, it's quite uncommon though, and having been only here for two years, but my time previously in another capacity, it is very uncommon for us to publicly see such great levels of division between members of the government itself. The opposition and the government, sure, public division between ministers and backbenchers, between the Prime Minister and his own Deputy Prime Minister, not a common occurrence indeed. And yet this is what has been on show to the Australian public, right in the middle of a global pandemic right in the middle of when our economy is only just starting to recover. 
In fact, division between the two coalition parties is what has been on display for quite some time now. For those sitting on the other side of this chamber, we have been fortunate to have front row seats, so to speak, to the great climate stoush between the Liberals and the Nationals, to see firsthand and live in colour the continual frame of the already delicate coalition agreement. And what a debacle it has been. The quiet little meetings becoming public press conferences in the hallway. The private sledging spilling out onto our television screens. And one could be forgiven for thinking that this stoush was some kind of valiant defence by the junior coalition partner of a policy position that was at the heart of the concerns of their own constituency. Regrettably, it is not. What it is, in reality, is the resistance of a few against not just the tide of history, but by the wishes of their own supporters. Whilst those nationals opposite would wish to have you believe that they are standing up for the battling farmer in refusing to come out sorry, to come to the table on climate policy. In reality, this is not what is happening. This is not what is happening on the ground. What is happening here is the nationals are again proving themselves to be an island on this issue, cast adrift all on their own with barely a stakeholder to keep them company. Now take, for instance, the National Farmers Federation, who themselves have already committed to a net carbon zero by 2050. Take, for instance, the grain growers, who themselves have endorsed the National Farmers Federation's own plans and are committed to developing a grain-specific target for 2030. Not 2050, but 2030. Take, for instance, the red meat industry, which I love and support wholeheartedly. But they themselves have set a target of carbon neutrality by 2030. So exactly who is that the Nationals are purporting to stand up for? And at what exactly is the cost of their resistance? Well, I know that there are many farmers, many farmers that I have met, who are lamenting the fact that those opposite are failing to take the issue seriously, failing to accept the challenge and invest in their future prosperity. Farmers are disproportionately affected by climate change. They will gain directly from reducing emissions. They'll be better off through increases in productivity, whatever the global effort does to limit further warming. So where is the plan from the nationals? Australia's farmers want more climate action. They want to be part of the solution. It is no wonder why regional Australians are wary of the nationals refusing to provide our agricultural producers and the regions with the tools they need to prosper in the years to come is not a plan. It, they are failing Thank in their you, own Senator leadership. Ciccone, your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I am relieved to hear Senator Ciccone express his uh, support for the red meat industry, and I look forward to not only having a steak with him soon, but also perhaps enjoying some of that Grains Council barley used to produce some pretty cracking beers as well. But I do welcome the uh, end, hopefully, of the ALP targeting the cattle industry with their ridiculous notions around methane emissions from cows. Uh, the Morrison government absolutely understands that Australians are looking to reduce emissions into the future. They're looking for a future that is clean air and clean water and a great environment for their children, their children's children and even their children's children grandchildren. But we do, however, understand the pressures that everyday Australians and their families face. And we stand here looking to technology, not taxes, because the reason we want to look to technology is that we will never support the imposition of a carbon tax on family. We will not support the imposition of an ETS or whichever ac an ac acronym you guys want to, on the other side want to dress it up as. Heaven forbid the government benches are ever graced by those opposite again, because we know the first thing we will see is an effort to tax 
those everyday Australians. But what we do also understand on this side of the chamber is that net zero by 2050 does not mean zero emissions. Now, I know at the far end of this chamber they have a little bit of an inability to decipher that fact, but we know that families rely on energy to keep their homes and their businesses running and have certainty that when they need the power they can turn it on, but that this security is not achieved through taxing them and by pandering to some left-wing anti-coal and gas agenda. What's also important to note as Australians is that 40 per cent of our emissions are actually the result of our export products. They're actually the result of how this country engages with the world. And in fact, the only two countries that have similar economies to us in this matter are New Zealand and Canada. And when it comes to reducing emissions, we are streets ahead of both of those countries. And we have done this through adopting a suite of technology products and continuing to support the market and businesses to invest in this technology to drive emissions lower without imposing additional tax burdens on families, small businesses and everyday Australians. So hydrogen is one of the things that this government is incredibly enthusiastic about seeing the sector grow. We've only recently opened up a new round of grants for seven potential hydrogen hubs, one of them in the Hunter region, an area that I get to spend a great deal of time in. And I am absolutely thrilled to see that a bus company from the Central Coast Hunter region is already looking to move its fleet of buses to hydrogen. And we are going to see more and more hydrogen as part of the heavy vehicle energy and transport mix. I also had the privilege and the absolute pleasure to work with Energy Renaissance and turn the sod on the first ever lithium ion battery storage factory being developed in Australia. Now, for those that don't understand the importance of this, what this means is when we start to develop lithium ion battery storage, we're actually in a position to capture energy. So those one in four households that currently have solar panels, as Australia has led the way in solar panel uptake, by bringing into the mix, particularly at the household level, lithium-ion battery storage, you can then harness that energy. You can hold that energy that's created at two o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's at its highest and use it when you're watching Netflix at 9.30 that night. So by using storage facilities and that storage becoming cheaper and more portable, we'll see household emissions reduce. But we do understand that heavy industry, aluminium smelters, require affordable, reliable base low power. That's why those opposites saw the resignation of the absolutely fantastic member for Hunter, whom I am going to miss. Joel Fitzgibbon when he stood aside, because Joel knew the importance that coal was going to play in this energy mix for a substantial period of time to come. Coal's not going anywhere soon. I know it upsets these guys. No, they're very upset about it. Coal is going to be with us for a while. You know why we need it as well? Not only for our heavy industry. It's actually racist to want to take it away, because our coal helps developing nations move their countries forward. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, well, who is in charge of your climate plan uh, this week in Canberra? Who is in charge of the government's climate policy? Uh, at the start of this week, everyone thought that it was uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce, actually leading the government's plan uh, on net zero, uh, of course, to the complete horror uh, of most Australians. But now what we hear uh, from the government uh, is that Mr Morrison is back. He's back in charge. Uh, but the question is, is he really back in charge? Uh, he's cl clearly not so much back in charge that he feels confident that he can take his plan for net zero emissions to his joint party room for sign-off. Uh, and he is not back in charge quite enough to even dream of legislating net zero emissions because he cannot count on the members of his own government to vote for that plan. The Prime Minister he's not in charge enough to keep the Nationals in his coalition government remotely in line. 
He's not in charge enough to stop his own deputy prime minister from issuing threats, threats of a very hard time for the government ahead. He is not in charge enough to stop the nationals from issuing threats that things will get ugly, threats that were doubled down on by the leader of the nationals in the Senate today when Senator Mackenzie repeated these claims that things are going to get ugly in the government on climate change policy. The Prime Minister is not in charge enough to stop the threats to undermine harmonious government. He's not in charge enough to stop the threats to undermine cabinet solidarity coming from the members of his own team. He's not enough in charge to stop the threats of members of his own government to resign from that government. Uh, and the Prime Minister is not in charge enough of his resources minister, Mr Pitt, who still refuses to say that human-induced climate change is actually real and actually happening. Uh, and all of this today, all of this, this complete mess, Senator Rustin describes as a respectful discussion, a respectful discussion. I mean, you would hate to see what a backroom brawl looks like for this coalition government, if this is a respectful discussion. Perhaps the government should be more supportive of the Respectful Relationships program uh, in our schools, and perhaps some of the members of the government should go back to school and take a few units of that course if they want to learn how to have respectful discussions. But apparently this is how it's done in the Morrison government today. This is how they deal with the biggest challenges that we face in our time. At 10 minutes to midnight, literally days away from Glasgow, days away, days away from one of the biggest decisions that this country will ever make, the people of Australia don't even know who is in charge of our climate change plan, our climate action plan, just days away from COP26. The people of Australia don't know who is in charge of their jobs, of jobs for the future. And what the people of Australia do know is that their government is in complete meltdown at one of the most critical times in our country's history. They are in complete meltdown. They are a complete shambles, a complete stinking mess. They are a hot, steaming mess right now on one of the most important issues that our country faces. And all of that after eight years. Eight years for a stinking mess, 10 minutes to midnight. That is the best that this Morrison government has. That is what they have to offer on one of the biggest challenges that we all face. But as we all know and as Australians know, it's always too little, too late with Mr Morrison. Uh, and it is Australia's workers who are actually paying the price, because there is a global race on right now to seize the opportunity that climate action provides us. But we know how the Prime Minister feels about races. He doesn't like to get into them too quickly. And this is just another race that the Prime Minister is losing for our country with absolutely catastrophic consequences. This government is a complete stinking mess when it comes to action on climate, a complete steaming mess when it comes to the jobs of the future Senator that we Walsh, should be embracing. Your time has expired. Hold on a moment, Senator Faruqi. The question before the chair uh, is that the Senate take note of answers by Senator McKenzie and Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I rise to take note of the response of Minister Seselja to my questions on climate finance. The world is cooking and the Morrison government is sitting on its hands. No targets, no plan, no action. And while nature may not have intended to discriminate, geopolitical boundaries that divide the world into the global south and the global north make sure that patterns of systemic discrimination continue as the impacts of climate change, natural disasters, and pollution fall disproportionately on communities in low-income nations. The insatiable appetite of wealthy nations like Australia to dig up and burn coal, oil, and gas is sealing an unpalatable fate for billions of people around the world. We are witnesses to an intergenerational and global theft 
that will deprive future generations the opportunity to make a dignified life and where countries least responsible for the climate crisis are already living through the worst of it. Pacific Islanders are watching their homes and their homelands sink as their very existence is threatened by sea level rise, flooding and coastal erosion. Their children and their grandchildren will bear the brunt of Australia's inaction. They've urged the Morrison government to take urgent action on climate. They have pleaded with us. They have condemned us for our weak and unambitious targets. They are demanding we honour the Global Climate Accord. In 2009, during the Copenhagen Accord, wealthy nations committed to 100 billion US dollars in international climate finance funding each year by 2030. But they have fallen far short of this. They have failed the nations on which they have used, which they have used as a dumping ground for their greenhouse gas emissions. Australia, too, has failed to pay their fair share of climate finance and reparations commensurate with our historical and ongoing contribution to the climate crisis. The Liberal National Government has not made a single payment to the Green Climate Fund since 2018. Today, a group of NGOs have called on Australia to rise to the challenge and immediately double climate finance contributions to $3 billion over 2020-2025. That's the very least we can do. The Greens believe that we should add another $1.5 billion to this in direct reparations for the damage already done. The inequality between the global north and south is rooted in the exploitative, extractive and destructive legacy of colonialism and imperialism. This is an issue of global justice. It is about righting historic wrongs. These payments are not a favour bestowed, it is a debt owed. But the Morrison government is not at all interested in honouring the commitments to the Green Climate Fund or paying its fair share of climate finance. Australia is dead last on climate action out of 193 UN member countries. It is so embarrassing, sad and heartbreaking to see that we have become such laggards on climate action and protecting the environment. When the world was debating solutions to climate change, the Liberals were still fighting over whether it exists now we are in the critical decade and the world has moved on to talking about 2030 targets, but the Liberals and Nationals are fighting over 2050. Public poll after poll reveals how the vast majority of people living in Australia want real action on climate. Even that is not enough to wake the Liberals up from their climate stupor. But they are getting better at greenwashing like their partners, the News Corp media. They're both trying to rewrite history with their miserable commitments on the one hand while still pushing dirty coal, oil and gas on the other. Here's a news flash for you. No one has forgotten that News Corp and the Liberal Nationals blocked climate action for decades. It's time to stop digging up coal, gas and oil. It's time to stop handing millions of dollars of public money over to billionaires, hoping they will save us from the climate crisis. This is utter stupidity. It's time to aim high to legislate 75% emissions cut by 2030 and net zero by 2035. It's way beyond time to take responsibility for the role that we have played in creating the climate crisis. We must fulfill our obligations. We must pay our fair share. Let's go to Glasgow COP26 with our heads held high as leaders, not as outliers. It's time for climate justice. The question before the chair is that the Senate take note of uh, answers from Senator Cizelja, uh, Minister Sezelja to Senator Faruqi. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Firavanti Wells. Mr. President, on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I give notice of my intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 for seven sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Screening Information Regulations 2021. Thank you, Senator Firavanti Wells. Uh, is there anything else? Oh, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move a motion in relation to an OPD, an order for production of documents, and I expect that it will be delivered. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, I shall. Under oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I uh, seek leave to withdraw uh, 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 
General Business no Notice of Motion Number 1255 relating to consideration of an Australian Federal Integrity Commission bill. Uh, so could you give me that number again? You don't need leave, Senator Patrick. Okay, 1255. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Being no further calls, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. It is, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clark? A committee has lodged an extension notification as follows. The Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee in relation to the fisheries quota system inquiry from today to the 17th of March. I remind, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Pursuant to order agreed yesterday, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of a disallowance motion. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion Number 1, standing in the name of Senator Rice, relating to the disallowance of the Fuel Security, Fuel Security Services Payment Rule 2021. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion in the name of Senator Rice and uh, would like to um, ensure that we can have some uh, considerable debate on this. I understand it's limited to 30 minutes, but I'd like to get on with it. You, you Great. Have the call. Thank you, up. Mr. President. Well, this uh, disallowance motion is an important one because uh, we know that this government, despite uh, telling the Australian people, despite begging their national colleagues uh, that they want to uh, reduce uh, pollution to zero by 2050, right here, right now, today, are wanting to hand two billion dollars of taxpayers' money over to the fossil fuel companies. This is more money in the pocket of the fossil fuel industry. More subsidies, more taxpayers' money, more rorts for the fossil fuel industry, designed to prop them up. And let me tell you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that there is no way this government will ever be taken seriously when it comes to climate action and reducing pollution, while they continue to not just give a, a, a nod and a wink to the fossil fuel industry to keep expanding and growing, but to actually uh, pay for them to keep expanding and growing and propping them up. We know that this is another $2 billion for their mates in the fossil fuel industry. It's a total of almost $10 billion in subsidies in this uh, financial year alone, the 2021 uh, financial year. I mean, it is just extraordinary that this type of money is being handed out willy-nilly by this government. And yet we're, we are all meant to believe that somehow the Prime Minister has found his path to Damascus on climate change and everything's going to be OK. You can't be taken seriously on climate action and reducing pollution if, on one hand, you're saying you won't even legislate targets, and on the other hand, what you are legislating is tax windfalls and cash handouts for the fossil fuel industry to keep polluting day after day after day. What else have we got from this government in terms of subsidies to the fossil fuel industry beyond this $2 billion? Well, there's uh, the uh, $226 million in subsidies for the Beetaloo Basin. There's uh, the expansion and the approval of more coal mines. Only in the last month we have seen four new coal mines approved by M Mr Morrison's own environment minister. Four. And we know there are 72 new coal mines on the books, ready to go, ready to be approved. Tick, tick, tick by this government and another 44 gas projects. You could not imagine the hypocrisy that smacks us in the face from this government every day when they talk about wanting to take climate action and yet at the same time continuing to give a green light to the polluting industries to keep going harder, faster and more and more. We know from the International Energy Agency that not one new fossil fuel project can be approved or allowed to open if we want to get to net zero. That's not the Greens saying that. That's not the Australian people saying that. That's the International Energy Agency saying that. And yet here we have, time after time after time, on one hand the Prime Minister says he understands that climate change is here and, on the other hand, not only approving these developments but now handing out cash, Australian taxpayer money, to, uh, to, to prop them up and to 
allow the industry to keep expanding. Now, this uh, particular uh, slush fund uh, for the fossil fuel industry, $2 billion of Australians' money being spent to continue to pollute uh, through uh, what they've called the, uh, the fuel security service payment. I mean, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Taxpayer money continuing to allow more and more pollution in this country. We're being told by the minister in charge that this is needed, that this is needed to provide fuel security in this country. Well, you know what this government should have done? This government should have indeed invested in a strategy to make sure we had proper transport security in this country by investing in a plan to deliver electric vehicles on our roads and to ensure that they invest in public transport. How about some emission standards in this country for vehicles? That is the type of plan and action that would deliver security to Australians and to our climate. The, full, the fuel security framework could have been used as an opportunity to address both emissions from the transport sector, which, by the way, we know is one of the fastest growing sectors in terms of emissions in this country—17.6 per cent, and it's growing faster and faster at the exact time that we're meant to be reducing the pollution that is choking our planet. So we could have been dealing with a, uh, an, uh, we could have had an opportunity to invest in uh, reducing pollution in the transport sector, but instead uh, we've got this on our books. We could have had an opportunity to reduce pollution and to invest in the security of our uh, of, of our fuel future in this country, and instead we've got a propping up taxpayer funds to an industry that is already struggling. Even if you don't accept that we need to reduce pollution, this scheme, this fuel security service payment, doesn't actually do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't reduce dependency on fuel. In fact, what it does is it keeps refineries open past their expiry, propping them up and making them more and more unsustainable. No accompanying plans to support a tr transition away from dirty fuel to cleaner types of emissions and, uh, and, and energy to actually power our transport networks across the country, actually increasing and deepening the insecurity uh, here in Australia. You know, $2 billion would have been better spent investing in an electric vehicle strategy for this country. The transport sector, as I said, is, the high, is one of the fastest growing when it comes to uh, emissions in this country. It's already uh, up to 17.6 percent of the total pollution, and it's growing faster every day. We need a national electric vehicle strategy. It was promised by the government, but we still haven't seen anything delivered. It could have included financial incentives to encourage consumer uptake, like they have in other parts of the world, charging infrastructure to ensure that there is security and there is insurance and confidence of the consumer market when it comes to electric vehicles. And of course, it would be very helpful in this country if we had fuel emission standards like every other comparable country in the world. Regulatory changes and a plan that would drive our nation to be a nation where we invest in electric vehicles and low emission standards. Of course, Australia is lagging just like we are in so many other parts in relation to climate action. Uh, we're lagging behind the rest of the world. We're lagging behind when it comes to the transition away from fossil fuels to renewable fuel options, and this is just another blatant example. Electric vehicles in other countries where they have actually invested, put in place plans, ensured that there are emission, vehicle emission standards, where there is a vision from their governments to drive down pollution and to ensure that consumers have a choice that is cleaner, that is greener and that is safer, not just for our streets but actually for our planet. In those countries, we've seen the uptake of EV and electric vehicle sales skyrocket. Norway, it's up to 74.8 per cent. The UK, up 10.7 per cent. The global average of 4.2 per cent. 
and Australia lags behind at well below 1 per cent at 0.78. And the facts speak for themselves. Australia again lagging behind. And overall, who loses out? Our climate, our environment and the consumer. If we were to invest properly in this nation in the infrastructure and the policies and the regulatory framework, we could be driving down pollution and we could be make, putting faster, cheaper and more sustainable vehicles on our roads. You know, when you think about the amount of money that the Australian household could save if they were able to purchase and invest in an affordable electric vehicle, we're talking that saving up to $5,000 per household per year. That's a massive windfall for any Australian household. I mean, just compare the fuel costs. 12 cents a litre for petrol versus 15 cents per kilometre. And that's the type of comparison that we're talking about. More than half of the cost of running an electric vehicle versus that which is spewing out pollution and based its power generation on these dirty fossil fuels. But we'd need a plan and a vision from this, from this government. We'd need a government that cared deeply about the state of our climate and the state of our environment. And all we get at the moment is weasel words and greenwashing. We've got a fake fight going on on this side of the, of the chamber between the Liberal Party and the National Party over something that actually means zilch when you compare it to what the rest of the world is confronting and debating in two weeks' time when the Prime Minister goes to Glasgow. He wants to make this whole debate about net zero by 2050 when that is well past its use-by date. We are already in the grips of the final decade where we have to cut pollution, where we have to make the changes necessary. And that is why comparable countries and world leaders are meeting in two weeks' time to debate and discuss how collectively their countries and the world will be cutting pollution by 2030. Because if we don't start doing it in that time frame, we risk mass extinction of animals, of species, and the terrible, intense events that are going to see bushfires and massive storms rip through our cities, our towns and our regions. If we don't make the changes we need in the next decade, we will miss the boat when it comes to reducing pollution and stopping runaway climate change. The science is very clear, the facts are very clear, and rather than doing what this government proposes today, which is handing $2 billion, $2 billion to the fossil fuel industry, to the big petrol companies, the government should be investing that $2 billion into the type of transport and the type of vehicles that are cleaner and greener and smarter for Australian consumers, households and the types of vehicles we want to see on our roads. So I urge the Senate to support this disallowance because this is just dumb policy by a thick government and by a sneaky prime minister. Say one thing over here, look like you've even learnt how to say the word climate change, while on the other hand continue to dip into taxpayers' money to pay your mates in the fossil fuel industry. It is a tricky prime minister who on one hand says he cares about the environment, on the other hand tells the big polluters to go rip on the taxpayers' dollar. Uh, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor strongly supports the transition to low emissions vehicles. We've announced our own electric car discount, which will cut more than $200 million in inefficient taxes from battery, electric and fuel cell cars. 
but the reality is that most of Australia's fleet and many other sectors, such as agriculture and aviation, remain reliant on fuel. The payment that the Greens Party is seeking to disallow is designed to ensure the operation of Australia's two remaining refineries until at least 2027. The government introduced the payment too late after half of Australia's refineries had announced their closures. Nonetheless, it is a welcome measure to improve our fuel security, and Labor supported the legislation under which this rule has been made. Unlike the Greens Party, Labor understands the importance of fuel security for Australia and will therefore not support this motion. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Patrick. Yeah, just very briefly, I won't be supporting this motion either. Whilst I do agree with many of the good ideas that the Greens are putting forward and the need for us to move to, uh, to, to electric vehicles as quickly as possible, we do have a fuel security issue in Australia. Uh, we only have something like uh, 25 to 30 days of, of fuel. Uh, this does something to remedy uh, that and, and make sure that we do have some onshore uh, processing. Uh, it, I recall a couple of years ago an exercise pitch black in the Northern Territory uh, where basically the Air Force ran out of fuel. We can't have that sort of situation, and it's for that reason, uh, recognising uh, that we, we need to move to a low carbon uh, society uh, and uh, move away from fossil fuels, uh, we've got to do so in a responsible manner. Thank you, Senator Patrick. If there are no further contributions, the question is that the disallowance motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. The question is that the disallowance motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question before the chair is that the disallowance motion be agreed to. That the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. There have been seven ayes, 27 noes. The question is resolved in the negative. We will now proceed to the discovery of formal business. I will give senators a moment to resume their chairs. Are there any formal motions? Can I start with you, Senator, on behalf of Senator Pratt? Thank you. I ask that this is the, the Senate notice of motion number three be taken as a formal motion. There being no objections, taken as formal. I move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I, oh, sorry, Senator Rust. Um, Minister. Sorry, can I just um, seek clarification? You have just moved notice, uh, business of the Senate notice for motion number three. Correct. Okay, I seek leave to make a short statement. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Rustin, go ahead. Thank you. Um, ASIC is undertaking an ongoing investigation into the conduct of a number of entities and offices within the Stirling Group of Companies. Matters relating to Stirling Income Trust have been the subject to litigation and the government does not wish to prejudice any possible future proceedings. On 19 November 2020, the Federal Court in Western Australia found Theatre Asset Management, the responsible entity for Stirling Income Trust, and its managing director, Mr Robert Murray, contravened the Corporations Act on multiple occasions. The court ordered Theta to pay a penalty of $2 million and ordered Mr Murray to pay a penalty of $100,000. The government notes the impact of the failure on investors' residential tendencies are matters most appropriately considered at a state level, given these matters come under state laws. Thank you, Senator Rust. And any further contributions? Then I will put the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. We'll now go to uh, business of the Senate motion number four, Senator Carr. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I wish to inform the Senate that Senator Hanson will co-sponsor business of the Senate notice of motion number four, proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Reference Committee, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Carr. I move the motion standing in my name and the name of Senator Hanson. Question. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Okay. We now move to um, uh, government business uh, motion number one. Senator Rustin. I ask that government business notice of motion number one be taken as formal. There being no objection, 
It is taken as formal. Senator Ruston. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to update references to prescribed forms in the statute law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Uh, I move the motion. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Uh, I, I put the question uh, that the bill may proceed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to update references to prescribed forms in the statute law of the Commonwealth and for related purposes. Minister. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and I move this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 22nd of November 2021. We will now move to uh, Senator Patrick, 1248. Senator Patrick, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. President. And acknowledging the presence of the, of the member for Indi, uh, Dr. Helen Haynes, uh, in the chamber, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1248 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Patrick. I move that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to establish the Australian Federal Integrity Commission and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Thank you. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed without formalities and now be read for a first time. The question is that the bill uh, now be read for a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to establish the Australian Federal Integrity Commission and for related purposes. Senator Patrick. Um, I move that this bill now be read a second time, and I seek leave to table the explanatory memorandum uh, uh, relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. Table the explanatory memorandum, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in the Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Okay. Senator Griff, are you? Is, is ah, Senator McKimmy on behalf of Senator Griff? Uh, yes, uh, I am indeed, President. Thank you. On behalf of Senator Griff, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1250, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. There being no objection, it is taken as formal. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced a bill for an act to amend the law relating to unsolicited communications and for related purposes. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. Clark. Uh, just put the question. Oh, sorry, I put the question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to unsolicited communications and for related purposes. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek to leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek to leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. We will now move on to uh, one, uh, 1253, uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 1253, proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Uh, the question is this motion be taken as formal. Uh, there being no objection. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that the following bill be introduced: a bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I present the bill and move that the bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. Uh, that, I put that question. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 and for related purposes. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move that the bill now be read a second time and I seek leave 
to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, now we'll go to 1254. Senator Urquhart, are you doing that one? Thank you. Uh, before asking that this motion be taken as formal, I inform the Chamber that Senator McCarthy will be co-sponsoring the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 1254 be taken as a formal motion. Uh, there being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Question. Oh, uh, Minister. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, one minute, please, Minister. Thank you. The cashless debit card is a program for working age payment recipients to help stabilise their lives and get them on a pathway to work and provide opportunity for individuals, their families and communities. Those on the other side should be ashamed of the way they are obsessed with playing politics with this issue. They supported the cashless debit card being introduced in 2015 and through its expansion up until 2019 election when they decided to put politics above people. And now they are running a shameful scare campaign aimed at age pensioners. It is disgusting. The government has never and will never have a plan to force age pensioners onto the cashless debit card. First Labor wanted a retirees tax, and now they're lying to retirees. What's next? Unlike those opposite, we have always been transparent with the Australian people. With our plans for the cashless debit card, we will not oppose this OPD. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Now we'll move to 1251. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, um, on behalf of Senator Canavan and myself, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 1251 be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Go ahead. Australia has a long standing principle of cabinet confidentiality. This is essential Sorry. to the effective operation of Australia's executive government. Cabinet confidentiality is a foundation principle of the Westminster system dating back to the 1600s. The disclosure of cabinet documents as required by this motion would fundamentally undermine this foundation principle. Cabinet documents will continue to be released in the agreed upon manner prescribed under the Archives Act 1983. Question is this motion be agreed to? Those that opinion Oh, sorry, Senator Waters. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted for one minute? One minute. Thank you. Uh, even a broken clock is right twice a day. So Senator Canavan is correct this time that cab cabinet modelling on uh, 2050 net zero is rubbish, and it should be released for public examination and scrutiny. There is simply no path to net zero under which gas will increase. The modelling will show that the cabinet, uh, what the cabinet wants it to show in order to solve their political problem, that they can convince their MPs that there's some magical fairyland ahead where demand for Australia's fossil fuels will be greater than it is today. But in fact, the International Energy Agency just last week surveyed those countries that have lifted their 2030 targets, customers of our coal and gas exports, and their analysis was that if they meet those commitments, Global use of fossil fuels will peak by 2025 and fall thereafter. Uh, they can also expect the clean energy market under net zero to be worth $1.2 trillion a year, uh, greater than today's oil market. So let's not waste any more time and get on with creating the hundreds of thousands Senator of clean energy jobs. Waters, your time has expired. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Finally, one, two, five, two, in the name of Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President, and congratulations. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number one, two, five, two, be taken as a formal motion. There being no objection, this motion is taken as formal. Senator I'm, Rice. I move the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Senators, just for your information, this will um, be the last division of formal business. We will then go uh, to the first speech.
that is the end of Cornwall. Stop the bells. Question is a motion number 1252 from Senator Rice be agreed to. The, uh, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator McGrath, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 23. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, we will now, we will now move to a first speech. I will, however, give all senators a minute to resume their spots or depart the chamber. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Grogan to make her first speech and ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Grogan. Thank you, Mr President. As I rise to make my first speech, I'd first like to acknowledge that the lands we gather on today are those of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to pay my respects to the Ghana elders, past, present and emerging, on whose land that I live. I pay my respects to the elders of all the lands surrounding the Ghana land. Nadjeri, Paramank, Nurunjeri, Narunga and Nukunu. All these nations that surround the Ghana nation and the 40-plus nations that comprise South Australia. I understand that your lands were never ceded and it is always and always will be Aboriginal land. I also understand the dire consequences of colonialisation and dispossession and what it has done to First Nations people, and I am committed to working to right these wrongs. And this starts with a commitment to genuine and meaningful voice, treaty and truth. I come to this place under sad circumstances with the passing of Senator Alex Gallagher, and I offer my condolences to Alex's family and I pay my respects to the hard work and dedication that he did to this place. I'm honoured to be here today as a representative of the people of South Australia. It is a vibrant, progressive and inclusive part of this country, and I'm proud that I've been calling this South Australia home for 20 years. I was born to a large Irish Catholic family in southwest London. I grew up on a housing estate at the world's end, and I spent my summers in Ireland with my extended family. My father, Larry Grogan, was a shop steward with the Transport and General Workers' Union, and he was the one that introduced me to the labour movement and the class struggle. He taught me the potency and power of working people acting collectively to improve their circumstances and that of their workmates and their communities. My mother, Kathleen Grogan, taught me the value and importance of community. She spent her life looking after other people she instilled in me a deep belief that I could do anything and has always, always stood beside me, regardless of the scrapes I've got myself into. Mum, without you I wouldn't be here. You are my strongest supporter and you give me strength. Given my parents' influence, it's probably not surprising uh, that I spent my working life focusing on social and economic justice fighting to improve the rights of low-paid and vulnerable workers, fighting for better primary care, early intervention in health, a fairer education for all of our kids, and an increase to social services and opportunities for those who don't have them. But it was my earliest experiences in Australia that ignited a passion to fight for change. In 1990, I came to this country. I bought a 1967 Holden station wagon, and I drove around Australia. My love for Australia's spectacular and diverse environment was born. I picked mangoes in the Northern Territory. I worked as a labourer in the vast cane lands of North Queensland. And I ironed shirts in Brisbane and poured beers in bars all over the country. I fell in love with Australia and its vast cultural diversity, and I was lucky enough to be able to emigrate here. Four years later, as an Australian citizen, I was employed, I was independent, I was in a relationship that I thought was good, I had a safe place to live, 
I was pregnant and I was really excited for the future. But in the space of a few short weeks, all that changed. My unborn baby was very sick. My partner couldn't handle the thought of a sick baby, so he left. I was a contract worker, and because of my baby's sickness, I could no longer work. I ended up sleeping on the floor of a friend's place. I was 14,000 miles away from my family, and I was scared. I needed help. I was lucky I had very good friends who, along with Medicare and our social welfare system, were there for me and my son in those really difficult times. My son Brendan is 26 now. He's healthy, funny, compassionate and a great joy in my life. But that experience of feeling powerless and feeling scared and being judged for being poor, being treated differently because I was a single parent and being at the mercy of the health system made me absolutely determined to make things better for other people. I've seen firsthand the challenges and inequities that people face. Indeed, I've lived them. Without the stalwart policies of previous Labor governments, I don't know what would have happened to us. So the path I chose from there was research, was policy, was advocacy, was fighting for those who are marginalised in our community and who are without a voice. I've worked in many of the key areas of Labor's roadmap for the future, in environment, in climate, in mental health, education and social services. Working these areas, I've seen the challenges, but I've also seen the opportunities and I've seen the solutions, and I want to be part of the team that is fighting to bring those to fruition. I've been fortunate. I've had an interesting and varied career, but I've also worked very hard. I spent time as the head of the South Australian Council of Social Service, championing social justice issues. I've sat on the board of ACOS. I worked in the university sector, developing pathways for people from disadvantaged backgrounds to both access and succeed in higher education. I worked for the Central Land Council in Alice Springs, fighting for the rights of First Nations people. I spent time as the head of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists to tackle climate change and protect the River Murray. I've also worked within the ALP. First, as Chief of Staff to the then Federal Minister, Mark Butler, working on aged care, mental health, climate and energy policy. And then for the former South Australian Premier, Jay Wetherill, where I was responsible for social services, environment and the River Murray. I'd like to thank Mark and Jay for their support, wisdom, friendship and for believing in me. My last job before entering the Senate was as a senior official with the United Workers' Union representing some of the most vulnerable and low-paid workers in our community. I will continue to be a proud member of the Australian trade union and labour movements and will continue to fight for workers' pay and conditions during my time here. I remain a proud member of the United Workers' Union and offer my thanks to Gary Bullock and the politics team at UWU for being such staunch advocates for their members. And also to the Australian Services Union, a big shout out to Abby Spencer and the South Australian team. My experiences, my family, my work history have all led me to this place. They have given me a deep passion to want to fight for vulnerable people and vulnerable workers. I want to be in the room where the decisions are made, where policy is developed and where change can truly happen to make our country more equitable. I am here to represent the people I have spent my career working with and for. Those people want decent, well-paid, secure jobs so they can have a stable roof over their head. They want decent, secure jobs for their kids so they can have hope for the future. They want hospital bed when they need it and a COVID jab so that they can help get our economy back on track. And more than anything, Australians want a reliable system that gives people a hand up when they most need it, when health issues strike or when they lose their job. We're not seeing that leadership in Australia. In fact, we seem to be going backwards. Social services are being cut, people on welfare are being victimised, and those lucky enough to find a job, despite the struggles they face, their work is precarious and it is low paid. The policies that have been implemented in recent times have made it even harder for people doing it tough, harder to access services and more and more hoops to jump through. Like many parts of the country, in South Australia, there is just not enough employment or training opportunities, and an alarming number of those jobs are casual and insecure. 
The number of people in full-time work in South Australia fell by 2,300 in September, earning us the nation's highest unemployment rate at 5.1 per cent for the sixth time this year. Meanwhile, South Australia's youth unemployment rate rose from 9.2 to 11 per cent, and the underemployment rate increased to 8.4. Despite inequities in the labour market, where you can work 50 hours a week and still struggle to put a roof over your head and a meal on the table, the government of the day continues to attack workers' pay and conditions. COVID-19 has highlighted how fragile and precarious our industrial relations system is, the binary approach to the haves and the have-nots, the fact that the success of a business is reliant on the strength of its workers. Whether you're a cleaner, a childcare worker, an accountant or a farmhand, your role is essential in the success of the organisation that you work for, and you should be respected and valued for that role. I do believe in the role of business to help build our economic future, but it must be built on a fair relationship with workers. COVID-19 has also highlighted how fragile and precarious our health system can be without proper funding and resourcing, including our mental health services. I will fight for more services to deal with the increasing mental health impacts of COVID-19. Young people in particular are finding it too difficult to access appropriate mental health services. We owe it to them to have help available when they need it most. And I applaud Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews for his recent introduction of mental health specialists in Victorian schools. I want to be part of an Albanese Labor government that is committed to creating decent, well-paid, secure jobs one that values universal access to health care and an equitable education system. A government that understands the importance of everyone having a roof over their head so they can envisage a fair future for themselves and their family. I want to be part of a generation of Australian politicians that works to rebuild faith in our democratic systems. A generation that uses their precious time here to extend the imagination in order to resolve complex societal and environmental problems that we face. I intend on being a staunch advocate for the River Murray and the communities that rely on it for sustenance, and a thorn in the side of those vested interests who, take, who continue to take more than their fair share. Our state's social, cultural and economic life is closely entwined with the river, and therefore its health and our long-term survival. Before I finish, I'd just like to thank a few of the many people who have supported and inspired me. Everyone in the SA Labor Party, most particularly Mark Butler, Jay Weatherall, Penny Wong, Kyan Ma and Susan Close. The great people in the environment movement and the climate change movement, particularly the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists, who are truly dedicated to a sustainable future. Felicity Wade and Lyndon Schneiders for always inspiring me, uncomfortable as it may be at times. The COS movement and all the people who have supported me in the community sector, most particularly in Yates, and my deep thanks to the beautiful people I call family, my amazing mum, my sister Liz and all my family overseas, my son Brendan and the other beautiful children so dear to my heart, Aaron, Ruby, Tom, Adele, Patty, James and Pippa, my fierce goddaughters Maddie and Jess and also to Samantha, Christy, Brody, Ben, Bethany, Alicia and Lou. And within that family, a particular shout out to the two women who've stood beside me for decades, who've shared the tears, the laughter, kicked my butt when I needed it, who, but who've never, ever, ever let me give up, Leslie Parker and Caroline Gaston. I'm here because of all of you. Mr President, these speeches are a time to place on record who you are, so the people of Australia know more about those who are representing them. I am a feminist, I am a unionist, I am a community activist, I am an environmentalist, I am an immigrant, I am a South Australian. I believe in truth, treaty and voice for First Nations people and I believe in the value of each and every South Australian. I will fight for the rights and the opportunities of our community and I will fight for a Labor government led by Anthony Albanese to realise a fair and equitable future. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah.
we moved. I'll just allow senators to resume their seats and let them know that we are moving now to the, uh, the urgency debate, but uh, can I just extend my congratulations to you, Senator Grogan. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 19 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question, question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter was received from Senator Hanson Young. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The fact that the government is failing to do its fair share of limiting global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial temperatures by continuing to approve new coal mines and gas fields and refusing to adopt strong 2030 emissions targets of 75 per cent below the 2005 levels. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to contribute to this debate today. And it is an important debate because in less than two weeks' time, the Prime Minister of this country is going to be travelling to Glasgow to meet with world leaders in relation to the biggest threat that humanity has seen, and that, of course, is climate change and the climate crisis, a crisis that has been brought about by the enormous amounts of pollution that is pumped into our atmosphere because of the burning of fossil fuels. And, of course, one of the key elements that world leaders like the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Scott Morrison, is being asked to uh, contribute to this most important global meeting is a commitment to cut pollution and to stop expanding the, the projects that make climate change worse. The International Energy Agency has said in no uncertain terms that there can be no more new oil, gas or coal projects opened or created, built, if we are to achieve 
zero pollution and, and a target for net zero pollution in order to keep temperatures at below 1.5 degrees, which is what we, need, we know we need if we are to stop the most dangerous elements of climate change. Only a couple of months ago, last time this Senate was meeting here in this place, we were discussing and debating the recent report by the, the world's leading climate scientists. And they said we have less than a decade, less than a decade to take the urgent action needed, less than a decade to cut pollution, to keep temperature rise below that important element of 1.5 degrees, if we are to have a fighting chance of stopping runaway climate change. And we can already see the effects of our climate changing right around us. Only two summers ago, we saw those devastating bushfires rip through bushland and regional and rural Australia. We saw billions of hectares of Australia's forests and wilderness areas go up in smoke. We saw three billion species in this country perish because of those bushfires. We saw dozens of towns and cities in this country choked with smoke. COVID-19 has brought about an enormous amount of concern and fear right around the world. And governments have been called to take urgent action to stop the spread of this most devastating disease. And governments largely have responded, of all political persuasions, at all levels. Governments and political leaders have listened to the science, listened to the experts and taken the swift action needed to stop the spread and the escalation of this disease. Wouldn't it be wonderful, Mr President, if we saw the same type of response from our political leaders that we've seen in, in relation to COVID-19 for action to save the climate and our planet? Listening to the science, taking the swift action that's needed, showing leadership and investing in the transition to an economy and a society that is clean, that is greener and that is safer. And if we thought that the crippling effect of COVID-19 is a disease that has ripped throughout not just our communities in Australia but around the world was bad. You wait till you see the diseases that rip through our communities when climate change really hits. The experts tell us that's what's coming, unless we take the action needed in the next decade to cut pollution. That's why we need to be taking, as a country, to Thank the you. world's Thank most you. important Senator summit. Young, your time has expired. I call, I call Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yet again, we have the Greens wanting us to strive for uh, some ideal at the expense of jobs, at the expense of industries, <clears throat> and at the expense of our communities. And make no mistake, this is what we look forward to potentially under a, an Albanese Greens coalition government. 75 per cent emissions reductions by 2030. Now, this is the target that the Greens are saying, that Senator Gallagher over there refused to say that Labor would have a target for 2030 or announce their target yet, but the Greens are doing it for you, Senator Gallagher—75 per cent below 2005 levels by 2030. But what the Greens like to keep ignoring 
is what we have already achieved to date. And I've spoken about it already today in this chamber, and I will continue to speak about it time and time again because I am sick to death of people ignoring what Australians have already done. I am sick to death of people from this nation saying Australia are laggards and Australia are denialists when so many of Australians are not. It is not the National Party and it is not Australians and it is certainly not regional Australians because of the 20 per cent emissions reductions that we have already achieved to date from 2005 levels, 71 per cent has come from a reduction in agricultural uh, land use changes and a reduction in agricultural emissions. Our agricultural industries have done the heavy lifting, and yet we have people over there on the crossbenches trying to tell us that we should stop eating meat because cows fart. Well, excuse me. Uh, we should stop planting crops like rice because it uses too much water. We should make sure our farmers can't clear their land, but it's OK to clear 125 square kilometres in the centre of Australia to plant solar farms. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. I want to focus today on agriculture Order. and forestry, because forestry is part of the solution that keeps getting ignored by those on the crossbench. Forestry that keeps getting closed by those opposite and their state counterparts. Forestry is the best carbon sequestration you can have. The trees grow, they absorb carbon. Then you turn those trees into furniture, like what we're surrounded by here today. This room is sequestering tons of carbon forever. Forever. But those on the cross benches would rather us lock up land and just walk away. Well, I can tell you, while that absorbs carbon in some stages, it plateaus at a certain point in time and it is not sequestered for good. It actually starts to become carbon positive. So we need to focus on what is actually going to achieve real outcomes. And what is achieving real outcomes is what our agricultural industry is doing, the work they have done to date with the CSIRO, the work our meat industry has done with the CSIRO and James Cook University developing uh, new feed regimes for livestock leading to world-leading outcomes. Net greenhouse gas emissions from the red meat sector in Australia are less than half what they were in 2005. The red meat sector has cut their emissions by 50 per cent already. It is by far the greatest reduction by any single sector of Australia's economy. And I, I congratulate them, and I congratulate the CSIRO for its world-leading work in this area. And through that, and through our government's commitments, we are providing over a million dollars to an agricultural science company called Seaforest. This grant will allow them to upscale their production of seaweed additive for livestock feed, so the livestock sector can continue to cut emissions. The work the CSIRO has, is doing with the agricultural sector on soil carbon sequestration through cropping regimes is world leading. Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about these groundbreaking innovations that support existing industries, create new jobs, new research uh, that we can sell to the world? But no, they'd rather focus on the negatives. They'd rather focus on the fact that we still have coal mines, and so we should, because our coal is the highest uh, energy, lowest emitting coal in the world. And I would rather see one of the 
129 new coal-fired power stations currently being constructed around the world in net zero countries. I would rather see them burn our higher, higher energy, lower emissions coal than dirty brown coal from another nation that emits more. I would rather see Australia use our gas, our natural resources, to produce blue hydrogen than burn uh, dirtier products with higher emissions to do the same. We've got Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson going around saying, aren't they good? They're, they're flying off into space in, yes, hydrogen-powered rockets. Congratulations. The only pollution from those rockets is oxygen and water. Very clean. Read the fine print. That hydrogen that they are using to produce enough hydrogen to power those rockets, they need to burn fossil fuel because the industry isn't yet ready and can't yet produce enough green hydrogen for those rockets. <clears throat> but we're all putting Bezos on a pedestal because he's you know, exploring the new frontier. Well, I actually agree with Prince William on this. We need to focus on this planet before we start ruining other planets. I have grave concerns about the thought of mining the moon. I don't want to mine the moon. But I have no problems in this country when we know we need more lithium to produce the batteries that will underpin our renewable energy. And I'm very proud that Australia is one of the largest lithium producers in the world. I'm very proud of our mineral sands resources sector that is producing the silicon the silica and the other uh, core ingredients so that we can actually have renewable power and electric vehicles. So mining will be and always will be part of the solution, and that includes our coal mining. Agriculture is part of our solution. Agriculture which has already done the heavy lifting in Australia. The worst thing we can do to our agricultural sector is a repeat of what we signed up for for Kyoto. The worst thing we can do is tell our farmers, no, -uh -uh, you can't clear that paddock that has opportunity for soil carbon sequestration and food production. Because let's not forget, Oxfam released a report in August raising red flags because to plant enough trees to reach net zero, if you're just relying on planting trees, you will stop feeding the world. There could, we are at risk of a food shortage. So we need to work out how our agriculture can play and be part of the solution so we can continue to feed the world. And I'm not just talking about meat. Vegans need plants. It takes a lot of water to grow a soy crop. It takes a lot of soil carbon for that soil, soil, uh, soy crop, but then it can be put back into the soil. We need to be working with our industries, embracing the innovations they have, the new technologies, and embracing the opportunities that a low emissions future presents. I'm not against a low emissions future. What I am against is signing a blank cheque that allows people to trounce over our industries, our people, our communities, and that says we'll sign up to a net zero at any cost. I don't believe in any cost. I believe in opportunity. I believe in technology, not taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Senator Lyons, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, you'd think from listening to Senator Davey that the, uh, that the government, the Morrison government, had some radical plan for um, our future and climate change, but we all know it will be a plan to do very little. So I'm not quite sure what all of that um, carry-on was about. And I do want to talk about some of the points um, uh, the senator made before I get to this, the motion itself. Um, eight years in office. 21 energy policies, and yet all we've heard from the Morrison government this week is that a part of the Morrison government, the National Party, need more time. Well, Australia hasn't got more time, and we are sending the Prime Minister of this country 
to Glasgow in a few short weeks, and what's he got? Nothing at this point. Now he keeps saying apparently he's going to make a decision with or without the Nationals, if you read between the lines, because apparently the Cabinet will make that decision. But some of the Nationals are in the Cabinet, so what are they going to do? Resign their commissions? Because quite frankly, if they're not prepared to sign up to Cabinet solidarity, that is what they should do, because they're not entitled to stay there. Um, one of the comments the senator just made is we need to work out, out how agriculture contributes. Well, guess what? A lot of farmers are already contributing. So how out of touch are you? How out of touch you are? I invite you to speak to the Ag Zero group in Western Australia, a group of producers, farmers and primary producers, who are leading the way. Not hobby farmers, farmers with broad acre, who are leading the way. And yes, they're planting trees. Some of them are. And they want to see the Morrison government sign up to a net zero target because they want the research and development money. They want to have to stop doing it themselves, stop spending their own monies. They want to have that research and development. That's what they want to contribute to. And when you talk to them, they've got no idea where the nationals are. In fact, Simon Woolwork, who owns a farm with his partner Cindy in Corrigan, a farm I visited last year, almost 4,000 hectares, believes that you're out of step. That's what he said on the ABC yesterday, that you're out of step. And I noticed today when Senator Mackenzie tried to represent this National Party as um, all-encompassing that farmers are about fifth or sixth on the list that Senator Mackenzie claimed to represent. And you don't represent all of regional Australia, because last time I looked, you don't have a national federal uh, senator or MP in Western Australia, and you haven't had for quite some time. And in fact, the leader of the state nationals in WA, Mia Davies, is quite uh, alarmed that Mr Joyce is the leader again, and she's been very public about her comments. In fact, in 2018, she was one of the first to say Mr Joyce should resign. And when Mr Joyce toppled Mr McCormack recently, she was the first to come out and say he's got a lot of bridges to build. And she's still standing by the comments that she made in 2018. Now, the other thing you won't notice, because you're so obsessed with yourselves, and actually what Ms Davies said was um, that Mr Joyce was a destabilising influence. That's what she said at the time. She <clears throat> must have had a crystal ball. Because what are we seeing right now? We are seeing that destabilisation absolutely on display. Ms Davies also went on to say that the nationals were focused on themselves, their own internal matters. Well, that's all we've seen this week, uh, all of the nationals breaking out, uh, trying to hold not only the Morrison government to ransom but Australia to ransom. But I do want to talk about this motion from the Greens because it demonstrates once again that they're not serious about being part of an Australian climate change solution. Instead, they're playing their immature game of making themselves the story for the moment of social media glory. In a week when the Morrison government is in disarray over climate change, seriously, is this motion the best they can do? It doesn't even name the government, and it certainly doesn't name their recalcitrant rump, that handful of members from the National Party who claim to represent regional, regional and rural Australians, yet, as I said before, don't have one single national representative in the vast state of WA. Um, so let's have a look at what is really going on here. We know that Mr Morrison is being held captive by the Nationals, holding Australia back and not allowing Australians to focus on the things that are really of interest to them. But let's look at the Greens' record when it comes to backing in good climate change policy. Who could forget the dirty deal the Greens did with the Liberal opposition when together they voted down Laban's carbon pollution reduction scheme? Without this scheme, 
the Greens have added about 218 million additional tonnes of carbon. And yes, you'll hear them carping because they don't like to be confronted with the truth. But that is the truth. That's what killing off Labor's CPRS scheme has done. Thanks to the Greens, even though they'll carp and carry on and interject and try and put another spin on it, it's their actions, not ours, that have added millions of additional tonnes of carbon pollution. Let's not forget also that two Liberals were prepared to cross the floor, so disgusted uh, with the Greens and their dirty deal with the Liberals, um, to support Labor. That's how bad that deal was. Now they're in here trying to present themselves as honest brokers. I'd say they're green with envy, not green environmentalists. Now we've got a PM in Mr Morrison who has zero credentials on any commitment to mitigating against climate change. Instead, we've got a PM who wants to cling to power at all costs. Who could forget it was this Prime Minister who brought a lump of coal into the parliament, proudly de declaring, don't be afraid, don't be scared, it won't hurt you. A PM who won't support renewables, as he's on the record claiming the wind that wind and solar are unreliable. Remember when he said the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. Then there was his scare campaign against electric vehicles, ably assisted by Senator Cash. The claim was that they'd lose, that we'd all lose our weekends. Well, Mr Morrison and Senator Cash, I've recently purchased an electric vehicle. I'd say um, and the reason I did that is, guess what? There's not one electric vehicle on the government's lease vehicles for senators and MPs. Not one. So I went out and got my own. It's not one of the expensive ones. It's an MG at about 44000 still unaffordable to most Australians because the Morrison government don't put one ounce of subsidy behind that car. But for, the, but for the record, my weekend just got a whole lot better with that car. Um, my M MG right now is at home, and if my partner's been using it and it needs charging, well, on most days it will be taking advantage of the solar panels on my roof, and I'm a lot better off already. And as I said at the start of my contribution, WA farmers are pushing back at Mr Morrison's government's failure to take emissions seriously. They really are. And if you haven't introduced yourselves to Ag Zero 2030, then uh, make sure you see the sorts of work that they're doing. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is the WA Labor government. And again, you won't hear the Greens going on about the sorts of uh, energy policies it's pursuing. And I'm also proud to say, despite many years of the Liberals trying to sell off and privatise WA Power. It's probably the key thing that uh, got McGowan across the line the first time we won the state election, because Colin Barnett and the Liberals were hell-bent on selling Western Power, and Labor was hell-bent on making sure it wasn't sold. Well, they're investing in solar panels. We had Onslow off the grid recently because of the use of solar panels, storage, and uh, good systems controls. We're doing microgrids, not just in the rural areas, but in metro areas as well. But as I say, you won't hear the Greens uh, congratulating WA Labor and other governments on that because it's all about their moment in the sun with this motion, which is completely over the top and designed to absolutely get them a little moment on social media. Another party focused on their internals and not what is really happening. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Senator Roberts, you have the call. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note this government's turn to the dark side. Pushing a zero carbon dioxide economy is gaining steam. The dark side means sitting in the dark because unreliable technology like wind and solar will cause us all to be sitting in the dark, as is proven repeatedly overseas. These green boondoggles exist only to farm taxpayers' money, not energy. It's the ultimate irony that when the Greens talk about a farm, they don't mean one that grows food and fibre. Their wind farms and solar farms are made from communist China's industrial processes creating steel, fibreglass and concrete, the very things you can't make 
with green power. The green vision for Australia has no integrity because their claim so-called science has no integrity. It does not exist. Today is day 772 since I first challenged former Green Senator Leader Di Natale and current Leader Waters to provide the empirical scientific evidence justifying cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. Nature's pure, clean, trace gas essential for all life on our beautiful planet. And I challenge them to debate me on the science and on the corruption of science. She's run from my challenge, running for 11 years since I first challenged her as joint panellists together at a Brisbane Climate Forum. The Liberal Party should know that there's no compromising with the Greens who responded to the Prime Minister's gutless, unfounded major shift in the way any extortionist does. The Greens up the ante. Rewarded, the Greens now call for 2035 carbon dioxide output to be 75 per cent below 2005. Today, the media is reporting that a deal has been done between the Nationals and Prime Minister Morrison so he can jet to Glasgow with net zero and get his pat on the head from the elites, his globalist masters. Mark my words, net zero will become nat zero. Even Minister Hunt won't be able to claim the resulting death of the National Party as a COVID death. It's very assuredly suicide. As a result of the government's capitulation to green lunacy, many things will now happen. One, prime agricultural land will be put over to farming carbon rather than food, increasing feral animals and noxious weeds on productive land abandoned. The Howard Anderson Liberal National Government's theft of property rights to implement the UN's Kyoto Protocol will now be buried so it cannot be restored and hundreds of billions of dollars compensation buried. Farmers will experience more green tape and more blue UN tape, stealing more of their rights to use the land they bought and own. Family farms will disappear, a process well underway already. Number four, no new baseload power plants will be constructed. Mining industries will shut down and regional cities will be gutted. Already the cost of renewables to Australian taxpayers is $19 billion a year, and for each household, $1,300 billion $1, a year. Each, this burden will more than double to implement this agenda. It will savage the poor as a capricious, regressive tax. Every job created in the green economy costs three in the productive economy. Jobs lost to communist China. I expect we'll hear more about the so-called clean smelting using hydrogen, an exhibit in the sideshow alley of green dishonesty. It will never be feasible without taxpayer subsidies or extreme inflation in the cost of building materials housing. Adding the reduction in government revenue from a devastated regional economy and new energy subsidies and new subsidies for industries producing green boondoggles, the net zero policy's mountain of taxpayer debt will be visible from space. Net zero will require as much taxpayer money as we're now spending on health or education. What will that do to the health and education budget? Or is the Prime Minister planning to borrow tax and spend in the worst <coughs> traditions of the Labor Party? Unreliable, expensive, parasitic malinvestment in so-called renewable monstrosities only last 15 years before becoming toxic, heavy metal industrial waste that cannot be safely disposed of. Every solar facility, every wind turbine in existence will need to be replaced before 2040. What a windfall for the corporations that own this parliament. Tens of billions of dollars in construction and operational subsidies to rebuild a national generating capacity from scratch for no impact on Earth's temperature. A great reset, not just of electricity generation, of our entire economy. We're not transitioning from dirty industry to clean industry. We're transitioning from a somewhat free economy to a controlled economy. The winners will be large corporations. The losers will be every Australian trying to get ahead to survive. This is madness. This is inhuman. It is insanity. We will continue to oppose this nonsense. Thank you. Uh, Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. Uh, the Greens really need to get with the times here, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. They really need to get with the times there. They are falling behind the world. The Greens here in this place are falling behind the world because the world the world is, can't get enough, can't get enough of Australian coal, Australian gas from your area, Mr. Acting Deputy President. They can't get enough of coal around the world. The whole world uh, has record demand for fossil fuels right now. That is why, that is why 
uh, our fossil fuel prices are at record prices. Gas is trading at well over thirty dollars a gigajoule in, in our region. It's up three times from what it was uh, a year ago. Coal prices are absolutely through the roof at record record prices. No one ever thought they'd see them over two hundred dollars a ton for thermal coal, over six hundred dollars a ton uh, for coking coal from my area in central Queensland. Uh, each one of those trains that goes out past my place in central Queensland, they have, they've got five million dollars for our nation in each train at the moment at these prices. The rest of the world is just desperate for fossil fuels. Let's go around the world and see what's happening. Because we've heard a lot this week about other countries signing up to net zero, doing something in 2050. But I think the best test of what someone's going to do in 2050 is probably what they're doing today. Because talk is cheap. Mr. Acting Deputy President, countries can say whatever they like. Uh, what they do is much, much more important. So let's go around the world. In China, over the past uh, week, China Premier Li has come out and said that coal supply is crucial to people's lives. He made these remarks in urging coal power stations to go full throttle. They need them to fire up in China because they're running out of power. Their lights are going off. Electricity has been cut in many regions. At the same time, Premier Li also said that given these energy security concerns, uh, China would review its emissions targets. They would review when they are going to commit to emissions peaking. At the moment, China actually doesn't have to do anything. Their, their promise under the climate change agreements is to keep emitting until 2030, and then they say they're going to reduce it. They're going to do it in 10 years' time. But now they're saying that they might not even do that. They might not even do that. This whole climate cabal is falling before our eyes. Premier Li said that energy security would be China's priority. In India, in India the government uh, there has mandated that 10 per cent of all coal used in power stations must be imported. Typically, India doesn't import that much coal, or tries not to, uh, but it wants, it wants more imported coal to shore up their uh, energy security. Thank God an Indian company was allowed to build a coal mine in North Queensland at the Carmichael mine site. That was pretty lucky for our country because it's in high demand. It's going to make a lot of money when those first trains go out uh, through Carmichael out Abbott Point later this year. In the US, we hear a lot about the US. The US is apparently the reason we've got to sign up to net zero. Apparently, uh, Joe Biden's demanded that we do this. President Joe Biden's demanded we do this. Well, in the US, President Biden has actually asked OPEC to increase oil production. He's asked OPEC, he's asked Middle Eastern countries to, uh, to increase oil production. His, his administration itself has put more restrictions on oil production and fracking in the US. The woke Wall Street bankers won't finance the fracking anymore through Texas and Oklahoma and other places. But, but they need the Middle Eastern countries to, 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 to drill, baby drill. Once again, we've just been put, the Western world has been put uh, uh, at the behest of Middle Eastern oil shakes here. A disaster, an absolute disaster. And while the US wants us to commit to net zero and change our policy settings, demanding that apparently, apparently we're told they do, they can't even pass legislation to implement their own uh, climate commitments. It is very likely, it looks very likely, that the US will go to Glasgow empty handed. That is despite, despite the US Congress currently being Democrat controlled, controlled by the party of the President. They have. The President has a clean electricity plan. He's trying to get through the Congress. Uh, um, but, but Senator Manchin from West Virginia is holding us up because, in his words, in his words, Senator Manchin's words, we want to make sure we have reliable power. The coal mines are not going to close. That's what the people in the US want. That's what is probably going to happen in the US. So they can lecture us all they like. There will be no action. There almost certainly will be no action there. Let's go over to the UK, because that is the most actually instructive country here in this example. The UK, uh, in fairness to the UK, they have acted. They have actually done stuff. They've closed coal-fired power stations. They're shutting down their North Sea oil fields. They've banned fracking across the whole country. They have reduced emissions more than any other developed country in the world. Gold Star to the United Kingdom. How is it working out for them? Well, we've all seen over the past couple of months that the UK, in the UK, if you're a resident over there, you've got to line up for petrol. You've got to have, it's back to the 1970s for the United Kingdom. They're lining up for petrol. Their factories, factories have closed all around the UK. Power, power companies have gone out of business because of surging energy prices and locked-in retail prices. And in the most, most ultimate comical irony, 
They are running out of food because they are short of carbon dioxide. You need natural gas to make carbon dioxide, and you need carbon dioxide to refrigerate food and transport it from the country to the city. They don't have enough carbon dioxide because Vladimir Putin's not sending them enough gas. They are running out of food. The UK government has had to bail out uh, the major producer of carbon dioxide in the, in the UK, CF Fertilisers. Uh, so taxes will go up more to subsidise something that used to be done uh, without government subsidies. At least the UK is being upfront about this. As I say, they, they, you can see the costs on their economy. Last night, the UK government released modelling of uh, how much it would cost. Well, actually, sorry, they didn't actually outline the costs, but they did release modelling on the impact of pursuing a net zero agenda, and I give them credit for that. That modelling showed that modelling showed that to reach net zero emissions you would need a carbon price of 295 Australian dollars a ton 295 dollars a ton now that is <laughs> that is outrageous that will put a wrecking ball through any economy you put 300 dollars a ton on people's power bills on people's petrol uh, costs on farmers methane emissions it would shut down our cattle industry that is going to be an economic disaster and now, and they also revealed, they also revealed that there would be a fiscal shortfall thanks to net zero as well, because taxes on a variety of things would fall. That would leave them one and a half percent of GDP short. If that was in Australia, if that was in Australia, you'd have a thousand dollar a year impact to Australia's wages. Be, we're going to have to put up taxes just to offset the fiscal impact, not alone the power bills and your petrol costs. Just the fiscal impact will be an extra thousand dollars a year. That is the disaster that net zero emissions is 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 is, is, is spreading through the world uh, in any country that's trying to do it. Now, what you won't hear, you won't hear in the mainstream press. Just nine countries in the world have legislated net zero emissions. Just nine countries. As I said, the U.S. can't get legislation through. Those include those countries in Europe that are living through a disaster right now. Canada, Canada has legislated net zero emissions, but get, well, guess what? Emissions this century in Canada have gone up. Oh, they've gone up except for COVID. They've had a reduction due to COVID last year. But till 2019, 2000 to 2019, Canada's emissions have gone up under the Trudeau emission administration. You wouldn't really realise that if, if you just listen to our mainstream press. And in New Zealand, New Zealand, they've also legislated the net zero emission target. They have exempted their agricultural industry, which accounts for half of their emissions. What a joke. What a joke. The rest of the world is not doing this thing. They're walking away from it. We must get, we are lagging the world. The rest of the world is building coal-fired power stations. We're not doing anything. We need to build these modern, clean coal-fired power stations just like the rest of the world is. Four countries that have signed up to net zero are building together, combined, 129 coal-fired power stations. China's building, China's committed to net zero, apparently. We're told they're committed. And of course, I believe the Chinese Communist Party, they never lie. They are building 95 coal-fired power stations right now. Indonesia is building. They've also apparently signed up to net zero emissions. They're the uh, world's biggest, uh, between us and them, we're the world's one and first and second uh, biggest coal exporters. They sometimes get the top prize. They have committed to net zero emissions. Apparently, they are building 23 coal-fired power stations. Japan is building seven coal-fired power stations, even though we're told, oh, we're told, they're not going to buy our coal anymore. They're building coal-fired power stations now. Korea is building four. Demand for Australian coal has never been stronger, and it is going to keep growing for years to come. And we should. We should take that opportunity as a nation. We should be building more mines so that we can meet this demand, bring more people out of poverty. Because the biggest environmental issue in the world is not carbon emissions, it is air pollution in our region. It kills four million people a year, air pollution. And what we should do to help avoid those deaths is provide reliable electricity that does not create the smog and, and ash that causes these deaths. Our coal industry does that because it helps electrify countries and remove them from the use of, of organic matter that causes these deaths. To fix the environment, we should be building more Australian coal mines today. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, clearly we have in Senator Canavan a man who has the courage of his convictions, so much so that he's prepared to hold the whole government hostage in his race to get what he wants in his unscientific version of, of what is in the national interest. 
But there is no doubt that we are in a very real race in our planet across the globe to act in the benefit of both our environment and the economy. Leaving it, as some would argue, to 2049, as this government wants to do, it seems, uh, to decide you know, how you're going to get there means funeral bells for both our environment and our economy. Let's do this with technology, they say. Well, they haven't given any kind of indication of the framework that industries will need to lower emissions in order for us to reach any such goal. Happily, Federal Labor is well underway in planning a more ambitious medium-term emissions reduction target than the coalition, as well as committing to net zero emissions by 2050. We know that a net zero target by 2050 is not nearly sufficient. Targets have to be backed by policies and mechanisms that deliver the promised abatement that we need to get to that point. And we know that good climate policy is also good jobs policy. We also know that as we move towards renewable energy and move to lower the, lower the carbon intensity of our economy, that good climate policy is also good jobs policy. And it's all very well for Senator Canavan to bemoan, uh, from his point of view, the lack of, stabil uh, the lack of um, you know, the level of income that might be attached to such jobs. The simple fact is this is a government that undermines the industrial relations system and people's ability to get good wages in new industries. It's only the established industries with long histories of unionism uh, whereby we have such well-protected um, working conditions. And so the real challenge here is to, be in, is to enable our economy and those jobs to transition so that we've got those productive jobs of the future and the well-paid jobs of the future. We also know that regions in regional and rural areas, we know these places are the centre of the new jobs in a, climate, in a new climate future, in a new energy future. We don't need to be told by the Australian Greens about the urgency of this problem and the need to act now, but clearly, and I don't mind backing the, the, government, uh, the Greens up in their message to the government, which is, which is that we need to get on with our transition. We don't need to be told that Australia's climate policy doesn't matter because we only represent a small share of global emissions. We know that we have the high, one of the highest per capita emitters in the world, and I think probably my own home state of Western Australia is perhaps the highest. We know the livelihoods that are damaged by climate change in farming communities as weather patterns change, as bushfires rage through, as extreme weather events take their toll on agricultural production, tourism, infrastructure and so much more. Livelihoods in the regions. Australia should be in a position where we're able to persuade others on the world stage to take stronger action, stronger action on climate change. And to be credible, we must have our own house in order. The decarbonisation of the global economy is indeed the greatest economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. We've heard in recent weeks from the Business Council, the ACTU, the Conservation Foundation and WWF, who have asserted that there are 395,000 clean energy jobs that could be created by 2040. In fact, they've been, uh, the likes of the ACTU, the ACF and WWF and business have been banging on about this for a decade or so now. And the proof is in the pudding. There are already real jobs in these sectors, but we have a government that's holding us back. Every minute, every day, every year and every term that this gov of this government costs us jobs and brings forth more emissions, holds us back. 
In our nation, we know that the economic and environmental transformation of our energy systems will take time. The longer we leave it, the less advantage we have and the harder it will be. We need to take responsibility to invest in the opportunities that we have right before us, before before we have trade sanctions against us, before people don't want to take our exports because of our emissions profile as a nation. There are so many scenarios that this government refuses to recognise, some of which are already in play. As someone from Western Australia, I know what an energy-intensive and successful economy looks like. It's an economy that this country currently depends on to get through COVID. But in WA, we know we have to adapt. We have a bright future ahead in renewables, but will we be able to build those markets as a nation with the kind of leadership we see here now? Perhaps we'll be subject to trade sanctions. Perhaps the world won't be able to accept our gas or our clean energy and hydrogen because we'll be a pariah on the world stage for our lack of action. We can't stick our head in the sands like the National Party wants us to do. The rest of the world might not want always our gas and our coal, uh, despite what Senator Canavan says. This is bad news for both the economy and the environment. And I truly wish we had a better head start in adjusting our economy even now. We've already seen that green energy is cheaper than fossil fuels right here in Australia. So it doesn't help coal mining communities to put Australia behind in the race towards climate action. It will simply make their situation worse. Worse because we know there are well-paid jobs for our communities, but we can't deliver them if we stay doing what we're doing if we don't change, if we keep producing coal for fossil fuels until, of course, we don't and we're forced to stop without a plan to transition. We already have people who express concern about simple things, important things like accumulated leave entitlements. What happens to them if the coal or gas company they work for becomes a stranded asset? if we have houses that aren't worth anything because there's no job in their community. This is the kind of um, future that the likes of Senator Canavan would have us look towards. <coughs> but we know we can do better than this. Australian communities know that a clean energy and renewable future is inevitable. And the sooner we act, the better we reduce the cost of action, acting sooner rather than later. And I'm not against a uh, technology to help our economy transition, but we have to have a real framework to get us there. This government hasn't given us any. Eight years, eight years, and we still do not have a plan for climate action. Eight years. And even now, at the 11th hour, when Prime Minister Morrison is finally able to say, yes, I'll go to the international meetings about um, to Glasgow and I'll go to the international meetings, up to the 11th hour, and we're yet to see, even still, whether the National Party continues to hold the government and our nation to ransom, our whole economy to ransom. Eight years and we still don't have a plan. But is it any wonder why, when we look at the nature of the debate we've had in the chamber today, as we listen to the likes of Senator Canavan decry uh, a, a carbon-restrained future? Senator, your time has expired. Senator Cox, are you seeking the call? On the call. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make a contribution to today's uh, matter of public urgency. Uh, this week, the Prime Minister has made it clear that the Coalition uh, won't take 2030 targets to Glasgow. 
So don't be fooled by the coalition's sudden interest in those 2050 net uh, zero targets. It's all smoke and mirrors. Uh, 2050 net zero is too late, and worst of all, it's based on expanding coal and gas. Just this month in my home state of Western Australia, and also don't be fooled by the two Labor senators who have left the chamber who have already spoken about the wonderful Labor government in my home state, an exemption to a Texan company called Black Mountain to drill for gas in the Kimberley. Shame. This is despite having announced an onshore gas export ban in August 2020. So what's the point in having a, gas, a ban on gas exports if the government can just go ahead and overturn it and approve it anyway? It's estimated that fracking in the Canning Basin alone could release 13.5 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent gases into the atmosphere. Australia's emissions budget is compatible with the Paris Agreement, which is only 5.5 billion tonnes of CO2e, which is three times, just for the math. At a time when we should be dramatically reducing emissions, it's unbelievable that the McGowan government is giving the green light to new gas developments in Western Australia. The community don't want fracking in the Kimberley. The traditional owners are sending me messages saying, we do not want fracking in the Kimberley. No one in this community has invited gas companies into their region. Fracking poses a risk to the health of the waterways, our land, our country. The damage it will cause to the Kimberley will be absolutely horrific. And to what end? So we can wreck the planet? and line those pockets of those billionaires? As we move closer to the point of no return on climate change, we need urgent action and leadership from all Australian governments and all sides of politics. Although people in this chamber will argue, the science is clear. A safer climate means no coal and gas, and it must go. We need formally legislated 2030 targets of 75 per cent, and we need a plan to phase out coal and gas starting today. Action on climate, climate change won't hurt our economy, contrary to what others have said. In the UK, emissions have plummeted by 40 per cent in 1990, while their economy doubled in size. The UK have a population three times the size of Australia, and yet we only make two -thirds of the they only make two-thirds of the emissions that we do. A clean energy revolution will create hundreds of thousands of well-paid long-term jobs, enabling workers in fossil fuel industries to transition. To unlock this revolution, the government must lead the way with a public investment in renewable generation, storage and transforming the power grid. WA has an opportunity to be a powerhouse for renewable energy. Now is the time to start planning for a just transition in partnership with communities so we can harness this opportunity. And even national leader in Western Australia, Mia Davies, has talked about this only nine days ago, about committing to those targets. We even have Victoria, the National Farmers Federation, talking about these targets and committing to those targets alongside the Minerals Council of Australia. Last week, thousands of young people across the nation participated in the school strike for climate. I joined hundreds of those young people at the front of Parliament House in Perth, talking about and taking part in that collective action. Using their voice to, to demand change, young people are the next generation of decision makers and leaders, and they are our inspiration and our hope. So let's work together to kick out the Liberals at the next election alongside the, the Nationals. With the Greens in shared power, we'll be able to push the next government further and faster on climate action. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Thorpe, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of urgency today because we would not be here with a cooking planet and rising seas if you fellas cared for country the way we have always done. 
Like, you fellas brought this mess here, right? We looked after these lands for thousands and thousands of generations, and then what happens? The boats roll in, and let's dig up as much as we can and destroy as much as we can and make as much money, because money is going to save our lives at the end of the day, and it's going to give us oxygen, right? These big problems that have been caused by burning dirty, dirty fossil fuels need big solutions, so solutions that our people, the true experts, First Nations people, oldest continuing living culture in the world, right here, right here, right now, you've got two of us. We've been here forever. We know how to look after the land. We didn't dig the coal. We didn't frack for gas. In Blackfella Way, you don't do that. You don't pull your heart, the heart out of your mother's chest. You don't pull the eyes out of your kid's head. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible to think of that. But that's what is going on in our on our mother land, on our mother earth. There are resources being extracted that are equivalent to pulling your mother's heart out of her chest or, the, or your kid's eyes out of their head. The mother is alive. Our mother is alive. And every time you dig for coal or dig for gas, that is exactly what you're doing. Our mother is, to us, alive as a person. Our law and our moral, legal kinship and ethical obligations to country are older than your Magna Carta. To solve the climate crisis, we need to give country back its personhood. And this week, I promised the Greens' solution to care for country which is to give personhood status to the environment. That's one way of solving the climate crisis. Environmental personhood is about giving the environment or parts of the environment, like our rivers, lakes, forests and oceans, the rights, protections, privileges and responsibilities that actual people have. For our people, we are no different to the environment. We don't see ourselves as different from the lakes and the rivers, the animals and the sky. We are them and they are us. This is why giving the environment personhood is a solution that we must urgently adopt. This is not a new idea, despite some legal professors trying to pass the idea off as their own, as they do. This is how we've always done it thousands of generations. And if corporations, the word literally means to have a body, if corporations, which only actually exist on paper, if they can have personhood, why can't our, our environment? Of course, granting personhood to nature is a moment that isn't being led by academics or lawyers. Who's it being led by? It's being led by Indigenous people all around the world. In 2014, T. Arawira, a beautiful forested area in the North Island of Aotearoa, has legal personhood and, and owns land in its own right. It is also a special place for our Māori family, and I honour and salute them in the right to protect your country. The Wanganui River in Aotearoa was declared a legal person in 2017. The river is recognised as an in individual and living whole from the mountains to the sea, incorporating the physical environment and spiritual metaphysical environment. We need to do it, Thank and we need Senator to do it Ford. now. Your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those that against say no. Aye. I think the no's have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required.
Division, ring the bells. I didn't even look to see. Question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to? The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 7, noes 26. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, senators, I'll just allow senators to resume their spots. I will now move to consideration of documents. Ready to go? All righty. The documents are listed on page four to six of today's order of business. We'll go through those in order. Uh, documents on page four. Senator Ciccone. No, Senator Bragg. Are you seeking to table a report, Senator yeah. Bragg? It's not quite time yet. Huh. We will get there. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And it was just page uh, four. So We're just doing at this four. stage. Okay. Yes. Okay. So on page four, I'd like to take note of documents number five and seven, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, leave be, be, being no objection. Leave is granted. I'm just looking around the chamber. Any more? No. Uh, page five, Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I wish to take note of documents number 10, 12, 14, 19, 23, 29, 34 and 40 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Being no objection, leave is granted. Looking around the chamber, we'll go to the final page, page 6. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, I wish to take note of documents number 42 and 48 and seek leave to continue my remarks. Seeing no objection, leave is granted. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. I wish to take note of document number 44, the Office of the Special Investigator Report for 2020-21. And um, this body, the Office of the Special Investigator, has been established to thoroughly and independently address the alleged criminal offences which fall within our remit, i.e. war crimes in Afghanistan. As my colleague Senator Steelejohn said in November, it is alleged on the public record that innocent people have lost their lives at the hands of Australian soldiers. The individuals responsible must lose more than just their medals, and the Australian people must know to what extent those allegations are true. But the sad truth is beyond the war crimes that we've heard reports of, we need a much more honest accounting with the Australian public. And that goes to both Australia's role in the invasion of Afghanistan and Australia's response to the collapse. Australia invaded Afghanistan in support of the US and as part of a coalition. As my former colleague Scott Ludlam pointed out, if the goal was to align ourselves closely with the with the US, we have succeeded. We've seen more of that since, with our, our buying into the AUKUS alliance and the critiques that have come from all over, all quarters on that move. But if the goal was to stabilise a country or the region, we have failed. And not only that, the coalition forces killed thousands of Afghans, and the figures here are difficult to compile and even harder to comprehend. One estimate based on UN figures suggests that between 2006 and 2020, there were 3,610 civilian casualties killed by international air forces in Afghanistan. And that's merely part of a broader estimate of total civilian casualties killed by pro-government forces, 8,617 killed between 2009 and 2020. It's no wonder that we, didn't, that we failed to stabilise the country. It's no wonder that the result was the Taliban invading again. And all the while, Australia has denied asylum to Afghan people seeking refuge. We have turned away people at our borders and used cruel, heartless detention policies. And as well as the questions that have to be answered about Australia's invasion, we need answers to Australian, the Australian government's actions in the months leading up to the collapse of Kabul. We know from public information that the Australian government expected Kabul to fall to the Taliban months before it happened. At the same time, it was a chaotic, turbulent process of people seeking to leave Australia. 
including people who'd worked with the Australian government, including interpreters. And of course, we heard the tragic news this morning of an Afghan interpreter who had worked with the Australian forces who was murdered by the Taliban. He was killed. This is what the fate of people who have been left behind, who worked with our forces, this is, the, this is their fate at the moment. Yes, during the weeks after the fall of Kabul, we got 4,000 people out. But for those who are left behind, the situation is tragic and the outlook is so bleak. I want to just share one story with you, sent to me just a few days ago, one story from the thousands of stories that our Greens officers have received over the past months. This is from an Australian citizen whose wife is trapped in Kabul. And his letter told me how the Taliban has been going house to house in Kabul hunting for his family because they are Hazara Shia people. His wife was an educator for young girls. His father-in-law was a community leader who spoke out against the Taliban's crimes. This person, this Australian citizen, has applied for visas, has emailed and called upon our government and governments all around the world. He is desperate. His wife are desperate. Their whole family are desperate. But nothing. He cannot even get his wife an emergency humanitarian visa from our government. We know that since the airlift has finished, there have been so very few people that the Australian government has supported and been able to get through the borders. We know that the Australian government can and do more, and that must state with, start with committing to a special intake of at least 20,000 refugees. It's the least we can do. We invaded Afghanistan. We are part of the problem that is now there. The very least we can do is to accept a special intake of at least 20,000 refugees, at least matching the actions of other governments around the world. We need to be providing genuine support for those people. It's the least that the Australian government must and should be doing. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition regarding— uh, Senator Roberts, if you wouldn't mind resuming your seat. I don't believe we're at that part of the program, but it's clear to me now that you are not seeking to speak on the matter that was just discussed by Senator Rice. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Okay, just one moment. Thank you. The motion is that the uh, sorry. The question is that the motion put uh, by Senator Rice be agreed to. All those in favour, say aye. Against. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to table a non-conforming petition regarding mandatory sentencing for false allegations with 5,853 signatures. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is. So, Senator Roberts, I, I understand that perhaps this has not yet been seen by the whips of either of the major parties. Whips have seen it, and the, both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party have, have, have endorsed it. So, we, we have that by report from you, but not from anyone else. Just if you could just give me a moment to check with the clerk, unless Senator McAllister can shed some light on this matter. Yes. Look, I, I do appreciate. Senator Roberts, that ordinarily you, you know, we would seek to facilitate something like this, but we would ordinarily also expect to see it beforehand. It may be that there's some misunderstanding. Oh no, it appears we are now informed that, in fact, or at least on our side, we have seen it, and we're happy for this to proceed. Thanks, Senator Roberts. So, uh, Senator Roberts, thank you very much. We've been advised by the Labor Whip that the it has been seen and approved. We're just waiting for a quick approval, I hope, from the government on this matter. Roberts, if you would indulge the chamber by just. Uh, well, we have the answer now. So, yes, Senator Roberts, leave is granted. I, I table the document. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. It's the consideration of the documents listed on pages four to six. Um, the Senate will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses, and we'll deal with them in the order that they appear on the paper. So the first one, I believe, is the.
first one to, for consideration is the Select Committee on Australia as a Technology and Financial Centre. Final report. Call Senator Bragg. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the final report of the Select Committee on Australia as a Technology and Financial Centre, together with accompanying documents, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, can I Please proceed? Continue. Thank you. Yeah, continue thank, you. thank you. Um, well, um, thank you for the opportunity to make a few uh, remarks about this important report. Uh, this select committee was kicked off uh, late in 2019 with a mandate to look at financial technology and regulatory technology. It has delivered already two reports uh, with recommendations which have in large part been adopted uh, and implemented. Uh, and the whole point of having a parliamentary review of these issues uh, is to ensure that Australians can be availed of the, the latest and greatest choice and opportunities of uh, financial innovation in particular, uh, but also that we are appraised and aware of all the consumer protection needs uh, which come with those uh, techno techno technological developments. Uh, and hopefully we can get some people who can speak properly as well. Now, um, it, it, in relation to uh, this final report, which is amongst the first parliamentary reports into cryptocurrency or digital assets anywhere around the world, um, th this is a, a matter of interest to many Australians. Uh, one in five Australians already has cryptocurrency, and this is uh, a particular phenomenon which skews to younger people. Younger people are interested in digital assets and cryptocurrency because it provides them with agency and control uh, that wasn't available in prior generations. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, when you pair it all back, uh, we want people, we want Australians to have access to uh, the best ideas, uh, the, the best new options, uh, the most choice, the most agency and the lowest prices. We don't want people to be dependent on, upon great big institutions uh, like banks. We want people to be able to become the master of their own domain uh, to the greatest extent possible. And that is what I think cryptocurrency and digital assets offers Australians. But there's also, of course, a great dividend to the country if we can become a digital asset or a crypto hub. Uh, and that is, of course, more investment and more jobs. I have to say I've been blown away uh, by the amount of people who are working uh, in cryptocurrency in Australia already. Um, and I'm also concerned about the, the capital and the brain drain that we are facing because of a lack of regulation and a lack of sophistication in this space. Uh, I mean, the fact is that Australian businesses and Australians and Australian capital uh, is going to jurisdictions like the UK and the US and Singapore because they have a better regulatory system. Now, when I talk about a better regulatory system, what I'm talking about uh, is two key principles. The first principle is we want to protect consumers. We already have a system of significant financial regulation, uh, but cryptocurrency, which, as I say, is owned by one in five Australians, is largely unregulated. So we want to make sure that we protect consumers. But we also want to make sure that Australia is getting that investment which is going to drive dynamism and drive the options and the choice so that people can get away from the big banks if they want to, or people um, can get a lower price on an international money transfer to their family in, in another country. So the agency and the choice, I think, is very important here in this space. Uh, so this report delivers a, a suite of recommendations on cryptocurrency. Uh, we have recommended the creation of a, a licensing system for crypto markets. Uh, we have recommended a licensing system for custody uh, and depository systems. We have recommended a new company structure known as a DAO or a decentralised autonomous organisation. So we have recommended some significant corporate law changes. Uh, and we've recommended these changes because uh, we felt that there was a lack of regulation, a lack of certainty, uh, which could do a combination of things. It could hurt consumers, but it could also uh, drive down investment in Australian cryptocurrency. Uh, we've also decided to make 
recommendations to improve the tax competitiveness of Australian cryptocurrency. Uh, we have recommended changes to the capital gains tax regime so that capital gains tax only occurs if there is a genuinely definable capital gain tax or loss. Um, it has come to the committee's attention that the way that the CGT regime operates could actually be uh, damaging new products and new innovation in Australia because of the tax arrangements. Uh, the committee also suggested that uh, companies which are engaged in digital mining uh, should be eligible for a company tax discount uh, if they source renewable energy of their own making. Now, th that is, of course, I think a reflection of the fact that I don't think the Australian people would support uh, burning up of the grid and burning up of fossil fuels to uh, underpin Bitcoin or cryptocurrency mining. Um, and also, uh, we do need to significantly increase our investment in renewable energy if we are to decarbonise the electricity grid. Now, we have made great progress in developing solar and wind, um, including uh, just only in the past few weeks, the Senate has committed or has considered a bill to facilitate offshore wind. Uh, but the ongoing investment into renewable energy will be critical for Australia to realise our net zero ambitions. We've also uh, taken some significant recommendations in relation to a phenomenon known as debanking, and this has been a major issue in the committee's deliberations. Um, basically, the issue is that people who have been involved in fintech or been involved in cryptocurrency um, have found it very hard to get a bank account. And if you can't get a bank account, it's very hard to be in an innovative country because um, that is the basis for so many things that you need uh, to be able to do. Uh, some people have been debanked 90 times uh, and there's been a merry-go-round of small businesses uh, and large businesses which have been debanked just because of the business that they are in, which in many parts um, is actually um, a legal business and has been semi-regulated by Austrac under their digital currency exchange regime. So in, in summary, uh, this is an agenda for Australian leadership in cryptocurrency. Uh, it would put Australia at the top of the list in terms of countries with a sophisticated regulatory framework, one that can drive those benefits to consumers, but also one that can attract investment onshore. Um, but unless we address the issues of debanking, uh, we face a major brain drain and a major capital drain. And so the solutions we've put forward in the, in the committee's report uh, don't seek to force banks to bank any particular person or any particular company. I mean, we wouldn't force a bank to finance a coal mine, and we, we wouldn't force a bank to finance a digital miner. So these are uh, liberal solutions uh, in the form of uh, more disclosure, but also um, forcing the Australian Financial Complaints Authority to have a role here in this space. Um, finally, I wanted to make a couple of uh, points about the process. Uh, this has been a process which has garnered huge attention, more than 100 submissions just for this past six months, public hearings and a huge amount of interest from the cryptocurrency community and beyond. Now, these are bipartisan recommendations, so I'd like to place on the record my thanks to Senator Mariel Smith, who did a terrific job uh, in being the deputy chair of this committee over um, the two years, for the most part. I also wanted to thank uh, the other members of the committee uh, and offer my, my thanks to Lynn Beverley and uh, CJ Sontel of the Secretariat, who um, I think have uh, worked extremely hard um, with a very, di very difficult uh, chairperson uh, at times. Uh, and I think the, the product of their work is very, very good. Uh, and it, is a, it is a good example of the parliament going into places where it perhaps doesn't always uh, go. And I think that there were probably some words put, in, put into Hansard which probably haven't been seen before and probably shouldn't be seen again. Uh, but um, I do think that um, one of the problems we have is that we are a long way away from the market in general as a parliament, and I use that term in the broader sense. And, and in this place, uh, on, in relation to these issues, we are a very, very long way away from the, the, the dynamism um, and the, the rapid pace of innovation. So we've tried to listen, uh, we've tried to respond with a plan that would put consumers first, but also try and maximise 
the opportunities for Australia to capture this innovation, which is irresistible, hugely dis disruptive and, I think, full of opportunities for our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. And I understand Senator Marielle Smith is seeking the call. Senator Smith. Yes, sir. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I also speak on the final report of the Australia as a Technology and Financial Centre Committee. This report provides the committee's findings for its third inquiry into the financial technology and regulatory technology sectors in Australia. Before I speak to the work of this committee and to this report, I want to start by thanking the Chair, Senator Bragg. We have uh, worked well together, I believe. We've found plenty of agreement. Probably we've found more disagreement, but I've enjoyed the process and I've enjoyed working with Senator Bragg. I also thank the other members of the committee for their participation in our hearings and deliberations and the wonderful committee secretariat, particularly Ms Lynn Beverley and Mr CJ Sawtell, who have provided what has been absolutely world-class support to participating senators and their staff. And I, for one, have very much appreciated their wisdom, their advice and the support they've provided to the committee. The first inquiry of this committee sought to investigate the barriers and challenges that Australian fintechs and regtechs are trying to overcome in attempting to grow their enterprises, grow the sector and grow their respective industries. We have identified many challenges that Australian startup fintechs and regtechs are, are confronting, which have only worsened during the pandemic. In fact, these developments and the economic crisis that has ensured encourage the committee to resolve to bring forward the tabling of that interim report so it could immediately deal with COVID related topics, as well as dealing with other evidence that have been provided to the inquiry at that point in time. And while there wasn't unanimous agreement for everything in that first interim report, there was much we could agree on and it provided a solid base for our committee to conduct its following two inquiries. On that note, I'd like to pass on a word of thanks to Senator Kitching, who took over from me as Deputy Chair while I welcomed my daughter into the world and oversaw the passage of that second interim report. The, this report now finalised a lot of the work the committee wanted to include in the first report, but couldn't because of the need to expedite the first interim report's release in response to the pandemic. However, that report was also brought to the Senate by a committee under a different name in terms of reference. Um, its work is relevant here. Now, we expanded the terms of reference of this committee to allow for a broader examination of the fintech sectors here in Australia, and that's where this report uh, comes to today. The major focus of which was to investigate the policy environment surrounding the cryptocurrency sector in Australia. And this is obviously an area of huge issue, of huge interest for Australians. We've heard and received evidence about the increasing uptake of crypto assets by everyday Australians. And I note this is especially the case for younger Australians. We heard from stakeholders about why this interest necess necessitates greater regulatory intervention in the crypto asset sector to drive further growth and establish Australia as a global leader in financial technology. Most people these days know about Bitcoin, but this is just one of the many crypto offerings out there that are presenting new and ever evolving challenges and opportunities that countries all over the world are grappling with. I hope that this report serves as a point to promote greater discussion about this growing sector and how critical it is that as a parliament, we ensure that any reform uh, has the best interests of everyday Australian investors and consumers at its heart, that these interests are protected and that we are always thinking about Australians making these investment decisions and making sure that our laws and regulations reflect their needs and their interests. Labor senators have provided additional comments to this report which speak to this issue. Um, I note that Senator Bragg said this is a bipartisan report. I'm, I'm not sure that's quite true. We have provided additional comments which speak to um, some of our concerns and some of our policy areas of interest, which I would point to as well. I won't go through them in detail because they're there in the report. Throughout the proceedings of all inquiries of this committee, I've been mindful of the need to balance the desire to encourage growth in the fintech and regtech sectors, whilst also protecting the needs of consumers and of Australians. Upon the tabling of the first interim report, I noted the responsibility that our government has to ensure in particular that the financial literacy needs of Australians are keeping up with the availability of more financial products. This was an ongoing theme throughout all of our inquiries, uh, whether we're talking about buy now, pay later products, digital finance or cryptocurrency investments. 
It remains a huge issue, issue in Australia, and I would like to see more funding and more support for financial literacy so that we can make sure that consumers are protected, that they have the education that they're seeking, and that these organisations, which provide fantastic services for Australians, are able to support consumers as they need to. Evidence to all of our inquiries has suggested that there aren't nearly enough educational tools available for Australians to better understand the digitalised financial products they are seeking to use or invest in. As I've stated previously, not addressing this new phenomenon will only further widen the digital divide which we know exists in our community. With respect to those who have access to or an understanding of um, the, these technologies, how to benefit from them, how to use them, how to apply them, and those who don't. This will only serve to further disenfranchise vulnerable groups in our community who feel shut out by this digital divide. And I believe the true opportunity, the true potential in fintech and regtech will only be fulfilled if their availability results in a narrowing of the digital divide in Australia, brings more people into the fold of being able to participate in these technologies, to participate in technology more broadly. To do this, they need access, they need education, and we need to make sure that these products are accessible. I want to conclude my remarks by thanking all the various stakeholders that have participated over the three inquiries, particularly those who have invited me to come see their operations, to visit their businesses, to brief me, whether it be in person or remotely as the pandemic uh, set in. I've absolutely loved meeting you, talking to you, learning more about your industry and learning about the reform challenge we have ahead of us in Australia to make sure your industry can grow and flourish and to make sure that consumers engaging with your industry are protected and have the right educational tools at their disposal. Our work as a committee has only been possible because of the evidence that stakeholders have provided to us. They have often done this at a uh, con considerable donation of their time and energy and resources. Um, many of the people who submitted to this um, inquiry into our hearings had never participated in the Senate process before. And I want to thank them for the care and attention they put into their submissions, for taking the time to speak with us in these hearings and also taking the time um, to offer personal briefings to make sure that we all had the information we needed as we were considering um, our, our inquiry and getting to our report. So thank you for that, particularly thank you to the South Australian fintechs. I think there's a very promising future for fintech and regtech in our state of South Australia, and I look forward to working with you all uh, to ensure that you have that opportunity to grow your businesses and are supported by Australian regulation in order to do that. I know there is so much more that the fintech and regtech sectors will offer over the years to come. In me, I just want to say you have found an admiring ally and an advocate. I look forward to working with you in the future and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on this report. Again, I would highlight our additional comments from Labor senators um, reflecting our position and again, thank everyone who's been involved in the inquiry for your work and support. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, the question is that the, re the Senate take note of the report of the Select Committee on Australia as a Technology and Financial Centre final report. All those in favour say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Uh, I believe there's another document to be tabled, a report to be tabled. Is that you, Senator Ciccone? Yes. Thank, uh, you. thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee, on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I present the report of the Committee on Independent Assessments together with accompanying documents, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. And uh, I understand that Deputy Chair Senator Brown uh, wishes to speak on the motion, but uh, if she's not online, um, I'd also move to seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Brown, I don't see her on the monitor. In that case, I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Um, I understand there's been an indication from Senator Steele, John, that he will seek call on this matter. Um, Senator Steele, John. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just to, to clarify, we're now on the uh, report in relation to the independent assessment, uh, the independent assessments report. Is that where we are, Chair? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Proceed. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, the work that has been done uh, by the Joint uh, Standing Committee on the NDIS um, 
as it considered its report into the government's um, so-called independent assessments proposal, uh, has been, I think, some of the most important work done by parliamentary committee in recent times. Um, it was a very long and thorough investigation um, that benefited tremendously in bringing in the voices and experiences of disabled people across our community and indeed across our country to analyse um, and examine in detail the proposals and assumptions being put um, to us as a committee um, in relation to one of the most significant changes uh, in the NDIS's history. In fact, I would argue the most significant proposed change to the NDIS since its creation um, nearly 10 years ago. Now, let's just recap on what was being put to us as, committee, as a committee. We were asked to explore a proposal uh, placed, to us, uh, placed in front of us um, by the government uh, that spoke uh, to a plan which had been formulated, uh, which uh, constituted in many ways a fundamental change to key in aspects of the scheme and key principles upon which the, the scheme was founded. Um, the NDIS was created to ensure that disabled people are able to get access to the supports and services that we need to live our lives just like everybody else. And those supports are to be, are to be guided uh, by the key elements of our lived experience, um, the information and evidence provided by our trusted uh, health uh, care and support professionals and the goals that we have set as disabled people, as participants in this scheme uh, within the plan. Now, the proposal put before us by the government was one uh, where those principles would be undermined um, and shifted so that instead uh, the amount of money that you received, the amount of money that was allocated in your plan would be determined based on the outcome of an assessment by a so-called independent assessor um, that would be somebody you had never met, uh, that would be somebody you may not meet in person, that may have no relevant experience, no relevant uh, connect, no past experience with you, and no relevant expertise in relation to uh, the disability or impairment that you have based on their singular assessment, uh, information would be sped into a so-called budgeting tool that would then allow, uh, result in a, a pot of money with which you would have to make do and mend as a disabled person. Um, it was a disastrous idea um, and it was one which was opposed from the very beginning by disabled people and it was in that context we began our investigation. Now, all these many months later, I'd like to draw the Senate's attention to some key aspects um, of what we as a committee discovered um, through the process of our investigation. Um, first of all, I think probably evident to many people, but um, the government and the NDIA in putting forward this proposal demonstrated a complete institutional failure to consult and engage with disabled people at nearly every aspect and element and uh, moment creation process. The design, the trialling uh, and the attempted implementation of this policy was completely out of touch with what the community expected or needed. And the outcome of this failure of a process was the causing of great distress um, to disabled people, thousands of disabled people uh, across the country. Basically, after spending uh, as much time as we did as an inquiry looking into this, uh, this proposal, it seemed pretty clear that the government was attempting to shift um, the result of its own mismanagement of the NDIA, the result of uh, the failure to lift the staffing cap, the result of poor training among uh, planners um, and officials provided by the agency, uh, the result of directives, uh, implicit or explicit, um, to reduce plans. Um, all of these things were coming uh, together 
a degraded and NDIS experience, which was bad for people. And the result of that uh, was then attempting to be shifted um, on to the participant themselves. Now, it has to be noted that through the course of the inquiry, we as a committee, a picture or were presented with a picture of an inquiry of an agency rather, which was almost institutionally unwilling to be open, transparent and accountable to the people that it serves. It became very clear that instead of genuinely engaging with and co-designing the biggest reform in the scheme's history, um, the NDIA and the government took a forceful top-down approach that not only wouldn't work, but would also uh, go on to exacerbate existing inequalities within the scheme and force people to be subject to deeply inappropriate and unsafe assessment processes. Not only was the proposed assessment process uh, and the tools selected for it rejected and opposed by disabled people and their families, but it was seriously scrutinised and rightly critiqued by the very sector expected to pick up this workload, this workload, the allied health profession. We heard evidence uh, from the community that spoke to the inequalities experienced by people accessing the NDIS or attempting to access uh, supports for the independent uh, for the NDIS. Uh, importantly, we heard very clearly um, the connection uh, that was being drawn between these experiences um, and the solutions uh, that were proposed as uh, being solutions uh, by the government. The oversimplified uh, to the point of being wrong approach that the government took when, engage, when designing this uh, policy fit, fix design, relied on deeply flawed data that reduced the diversity of people's experiences within the NDIS to average statistics that poorly reflected uh, the reality of the lives of the people within the scheme. We know that there are big challenges uh, to overcome uh, to ensure that the scheme is equitable. But at no point throughout the process was the government's proposed solutions the obvious and logical answer. In fact, it was found to be the antithesis of progress in the scheme. The crux of the evidence we heard and the findings made throughout the inquiry uh, can be boiled down to a very simple message. Disabled people led the push for the creation of the NDIS. Disabled people are the experts uh, who understand how the scheme should operate, and it is disabled people who are the ones uh, that should lead any reform process that occurs. Uh, before concluding, I'll just briefly uh, bring the Senate's uh, attention um, to a very concise uh, diagram created by the uh, committee to illustrate uh, the differences between uh, how the agency and the government approached this process of reform versus how they should have done. Um, this is listed, I think, in chapter four. Um, we laid out very clearly that a proper uh, policy design process for the NDIS should involve a process by which we go first to policy design, then to extensive consultation, um, then to revised policy design, then to trials and pilots, uh, then to policy, uh, revised policy design, and finally through to the announcement of a decision. Now, this logical um, co-design based process uh, stood in stark contrast to what the agency and the government ended up doing, which was designing a policy, uh, making an announcement in relation to the decision that said policy would go ahead, um, the implementation of trials, uh, then consultation on the results of those trials to be followed by a kind of surface redesign, which finally ended up with the proposal being dropped. Now, the result of this uh, broken policy creation process uh, was that many disabled people during one of the most stressful periods um, of recent years for us going through the COVID-19 pandemic also had to fear what would be next in relation to our NDIS schemes, whether we would keep the supports uh, that we so desperately need. This must never happen again. And as we move forward with the NDIS, we must cling to that principle of nothing about us without us. Thank you.
Thank you, Senator. Uh, I believe we need now to take note uh, that the Senate take note of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme Report Independent Assessments. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes. Uh, Senator McAllister. Yeah, thank you. As we do so, may I seek leave to continue my remarks because I imagine other senators may wish also to speak on that. Indeed, as a later Senator point. Brown, unable to participate this afternoon, but at another point of time. So uh, that's noted. Thank you. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Uh, sorry, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. And did I put the vote or not? No. Great, thank you. Uh, so let's move on to government responses. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present two government responses to committee reports as listed at item 17 on today's order of business. In accordance with the usual practice, I seek leave to have the documents incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Uh, is, to incorporate the documents into Hansard? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. Senator McAllister. Uh, I just wanted to quickly remark on these government responses. Um, I understand that um, the opposition hasn't had time to look closely at the responses and that we would like the opportunity to respond at some future time, so I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you. Leaves granted. Thank you. Senator Colbeck. I there are no ministerial statements, so we'll proceed to committee memberships. The president has received letters requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed in the dynamic red. I believe we have messages from one message from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021 and Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and now read a first time. The question is that these bills may proceed without formalities be taken together and now read a first time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Clark. Customs Tariff Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021. Customs Amendment Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement Implementation Bill 2021. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister? I move that the debate be now adjourned. And the question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister? I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. The question is. Uh, the question is that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. All those in favour say aye. Those against declare it. The ayes have it. Thank you. The clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion Number 2, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, relating to a reference to the Environment Communications References Committee. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I I understand you're seeking leave to advance this for Senator Wish Wilson, is that correct? That's correct. You have the call, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator Wish Wilson, I move business of the Senate notice of motion number two. And do you seek leave to Senator, I can see you down there. So Senator Wish Wilson. Thank, you, thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Chair. The Great Barrier Reef is big, it's beautiful, but it's in danger. But this government doesn't want you to know that. That's why the Greens have initiated this references inquiry into the World Heritage Committee, UNESCO, 
attempted listing of the Great Barrier Reef to be in danger. The whole country is talking about COP26. In fact, the whole world is focused on Glasgow and how the international community are going to come together and reduce emissions. If I had my way, Acting Deputy President, I would commandeer COP26, at least for the first day. And as a matter of urgent priority, I would have the world look at the latest science on the Great Barrier Reef, the exact science that the IPCC report to recommend the reef be downgraded to in danger. I would recommend that the entire COP26 entourage had an urgent briefing on the Great Barrier Reef, the sad and tragic decline of this world's greatest natural wonder. Because there's nothing complicated. There's nothing complex about the tragic decline we've seen in the Great Barrier Reef, particularly in the last decade. We're not talking about numbers here. We're not talking about pathways to net zero by 2050 or what's required by 2030. What we are looking at is a stark reminder of our failure to take climate action. And I believe that if the world was to see the true state and the real science that tells us that the Great Barrier Reef, if we continue along a trajectory of business as usual, will be gone in this century. And I believe that would trigger a significant global action because if the Great Barrier Reef is in severe decline, that means most of the world's coral reefs are also in sad decline. Now, Acting Deputy President, the Greens initiated this inquiry some months ago, uh, and we have uh, brought it here this afternoon or this evening to debate, and if we can, to put to vote. But I understand that's probably not going to be possible. This attempt by the government, this attempt to deny the science, to put politics above the science, this attempt to postpone the inevitable, and we all know the Great Barrier Reef is in danger, must be exposed. The government's excuses, their deceptions, in fact, I would say they're downright lies. Their panic when the World Heritage Committee apparently blindsided them by saying they were going to list the Great Barrier Reef in danger. This august chamber needs to look at the process. It needs to look at why UNESCO was going to list the reef in danger, the science behind that. We need to speak to the experts, but we also need to look at the government's reasons. How was the government blindsided when UNESCO has been talking about this potential downgrade for nearly 10 years? How are they blindsided Senator when they allocated... Senator Wish Wilson, uh, it being 7.20, the debate is in, uh, I propose that the Senate now adjourn, um, and I call Senator Askew remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Good health is something many of us once took for granted, but the coronavirus pandemic the world has lived through over the last 18 months has forced us all to stake, take stock of our health and wellbeing. To some, it has been a distraction, and regular health checks may have gone by the wayside. That's why it is important we all take extra care to keep those appointments and have any medical concerns that we do have checked out. October is both Breast Cancer and Dyslexia Awareness Month, and tonight I would like to touch on both. Many of us are familiar with the pink ribbon that signifies breast cancer awareness. Despite our familiarity with the pink symbol and our unwavering support for breast cancer events, breast cancer remains the most common cancer diagnosed in Australian women with one in seven likely to be diagnosed in their lifetime. It is also one that my family is all too familiar with. The good news is that survival rates continue to improve in Australia, with 91 out of every 100 women diagnosed with breast cancer now surviving for five or more years beyond diagnosis. One key factor in these positive survival rates is early detection, which also opens up more treatment options. The Cancer Council estimates that in Australia, nearly 20,000 women and around 164 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer this year. It is important for both women and men to look for breast changes 
and see a doctor if you notice anything unusual. Do not ignore the signs. Another condition that benefits from early diagnosis is dyslexia. The Australian Dyslexia Association explains it as a persistent difficulty with reading and spelling, defining it as a specific learning difference that is neurobiological in origin. The association says dyslexia is characterised by challenges with accurate and or fluent single word decoding and word recognition, and there can also be difficulties with spelling. Dyslexia affects 10% of the Australian population, however the actual figure could be higher as many individuals are not identified. Even with early intervention, dyslexia can remain a challenge throughout life. It can impact reading comprehension and experience, impeding vocabulary growth and background knowledge, and cause social and emotional issues. Children with dyslexia learn in different ways, often excelling in other areas like creative thinking and leadership. The University of Tasmania's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Rufus Black, around the world solo sailor, Jessica Watson, entrepreneur Dick Smith and author Jackie French are just some of the creative and innovative Australians who have been diagnosed with dyslexia. Jackie French wrote a letter to fellow dyslexics urging them not to give up because reading helps you understand your world, yourself, and what you and the world one day may become. This month, I urge my Senate colleagues to help spread awareness of breast cancer and dyslexia in their communities. It is through those conversations that we learn more and share that knowledge. And now I want to take you back to where I started, the global coronavirus pandemic. After a long run with no COVID-19 cases, Tasmania has been in the news in recent weeks due to two people breaching quarantine, spending time in the community and testing positive to the virus. Tasmanian residents stepped up and got tested and vaccinated in record numbers, knowing that vaccinations are the best way to protect ourselves and our communities. In the past 24 hours, Australia has passed a total of 33 million vaccine doses administered. That is 85% of the eligible population aged 16 and over now protected with their first dose. And pleasingly, both nationally and in my home state of Tasmania, we have reached full vaccination for 70% of those aged 16 and over today. I want to thank each and every Australian who has been vaccinated, and I urge those who haven't to make an appointment today. It is also worth noting that a variety of treatments have been secured by the government for COVID-19 in the form of oral antiviral drugs and intravenous treatments. These medicines will help protect those who contract COVID-19, but they do not replace vaccination. Quite simply, vaccinations are the way out of this pandemic. Madam Acting Deputy President, special acknowledgement and my sincere thanks go to our health workers at hospitals, GP clinics, pharmacies and community and mobile clinics who have worked tirelessly to ensure as many people as vaccina are vaccinated as possible. None of this could have happened without their incredible dedication. Let's work together to reach our vaccination targets so we can regain normality in our lives and reunite with our family and friends. And please, do not, do not overlook those other regular health checks. They are important too. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Askew. Call Senator McAllister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm joining more than 50 of my colleagues in this place and in the other place to mark Youth Voices in Parliament Week. This is a campaign run by Raise Our Voice Australia. And this organisation is encouraging young people from diverse backgrounds to participate in politics and policy making. Now, in the same way that our country has benefited from having more women elected to parliament, so too will we benefit from ensuring and promoting greater diversity in other areas. So I think this is a wonderful campaign and I am very honoured to be part of it. I'm going to share with you tonight a powerful speech written by Annabel Thompson. So firstly, a big hello to Annabel, uh, her friends and her family who might be watching. Annabel is 10 years old. She lives with her family in the electorate of Page in the Northern Rivers in New South Wales. Now, this beautiful part of New South Wales is also where I spent my childhood. And growing up in a small town on the north coast really helped shape my values. My neighbours, my classmates, my teachers, my friends, my sports coaches, they taught me a lot. They taught me about community, about acceptance and what it takes to build a stronger, safer and fairer society. And some of these values are also visible 
in Annabel's speech, but I'll let her words speak for themselves. So here we go. My vision for Australia in 20 years is for there to be no abuse or violence and much more equality. My name is Annabel Thompson and I am 10 years old and I will be 30 in 20 years. My electorate is Paige and today I will be telling you about two problems in Australia and how we can change them in the future. I would really like the people in Australia to accept the LGBTQI plus people in our community and to make sure that women and men are treated the same. This would include giving women the same payment as men and for LGBTQ plus people to be accepted for who they are and who they want to be. Having more equality would mean when I grow up and my friends grow up, we can get paid well and can be who we want to be without worrying. Abuse is not nice. I'm sure you wouldn't happen, want it to happen to any of your friends, family members and pets. There are many forms of abuse, including animal abuse, domestic violence and cyberbullying. In 2020, one in five kids have been cyberbullied, one in four women experience domestic violence and, lastly, up to 60,000 cases of animal abuse have been reported. People should be jailed for abuse or fined a lot of money. Having no abuse when I am older would be great because I will be safe, my children will be safe and so will my pets. This is my vision for Australia in 20 years and hopefully most of it comes true. Well, thank you, Annabel, and congratulations on your vision, which is so obviously born of a deep compassion and respect for the people who live around you in your community. I hope all that comes true too. Senator Thorpe. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr President, and congratulations. Uh, this week the Jukan Inquiry Report was tabled. We have heard from so many of you in this place about the importance of protecting First Na Nations cultural heritage. Well, guess what? It's happened again. Not, it's not you know, in the newspapers, you're not screaming about it in the chamber, but it's happened again. Where did it happen? In Queensland under the Labor government this time. The Kabi Kabi people of the Gympie region in Queensland who are fighting to protect their sacred site, the Jaki Kundu. The Jaki Kundu is an ancient, ancient healing site. And as the sovereign native tribes of the Kabi First Nations say, it is connected to the creator, Birul. And it is the place to learn about the sky ancestors, the seven sisters dreaming story and the creation of Kabi at the beginning of time. Protecting and using the site to perform ceremony is an important part of the Kabi people's spiritual and religious practices. The site is under threat from works by the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads for the Bruce Highway expansion between Kuroi and Kulla. These works have been signed off by native title applicants over the area, and the department is ignoring the Kabi cultural heritage exists at the site. The groups under the native title claim have changed over the years, surprise, surprise, and we have learnt during the Jukan inquiry that native title alone does not tell you who has cultural heritage links to the site. We know native title's dodgy. We heard that. We need to learn, or you need to learn, to listen to all traditional owners that are concerned not just the ones that will tell you what you want to hear. And you know that's part of the sophistication of how you manufacture consent. You go to the, the yes people and you leave behind the people that are trying to fight for country. In November 2020, a court found that the Kabi people have a right to protect their country. 
That's all Kabi people, not just the native title claimants that you choose. Yet Minister Lay refused a Section 10 application under the Act over Dejaki Kundu. Kabi people themselves have been busy carrying out scientific studies of the area to document their cultural heritage. Yet the Queensland Department of Transport and Main Roads had six traditional owners arrested and imprisoned. The bail conditions now prevent them from returning to their sacred site. Their tribal camp, including their bush food and medicine gardens, were destroyed. And we don't know what happened to the sacred cub bay bees. Tribal elders are now separated from the ancestral spirits and country at Dejaki Kundu. They have seen their sacred fire extinguished. They are removed from their spiritual home, are traumatised and in sorry business. Research materials and tools and tribal artefacts recovered during the scientific study of Dejaki Kundu were taken by the department. Dejaki Kundu has thousands of Kabi artefacts and other evidence, as it has been used for ceremony by Kabi ancestors since the beginning of time. This again is a sign of the continuation of the colonial oppression of our people, where government departments intentionally destroy our heritage and interfere with processes to protect it. Minister Lay, I call on you to make use of your ministerial powers and do the right thing and protect the Jackie Kundi. We all said never again when Jukan happened. When will we actually mean it? Senator Smith. Mr President, I rise this evening to give a voice to the views of young people in my home state of Western Australia. Like many in this place, I believe it to be of the utmost importance for all senators to have at the forefront of their minds the attitudes, aspirations and concerns of our nation's youth. Of course, we know it's the young people of today who will inherit the decisions that we take in this place. In the spirit of this, I'd like to present today the views of two young West Australians who participated in the parliamentary Raise Your Voice competition. Put simply, they were motivated to share their vision of Australia in 20 years' time, and I'm delighted to share that vision with the Senate. For the record, I have consciously chosen two young West Australians, not from our cities, but from regional Western Australia. The voice of regional Western Australians should always be amplified, and it's a task I bring to this Senate on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis. The first of these is 15-year-old Frank Stevenson, who is from the wheat-built town of Cundedon, 156 kilometres east from Perth. Frank shares these comments. In 20 years, I see Australia having environmental strategies that will prevent further population and damage to our environment. This is important to me because I want a stable future for the next generations to come so that they can have similar experiences to those that we enjoy now. I'd also like to see improvements to health facilities in rural Western Australia, as it's necessary as accidents occur frequently and access to a hospital can be difficult. Live export is another strong part of Australia's economy and is very important to livestock owners around regional WA. Keeping live exports will help support the regional people of Western Australia and flow money back into our regional economies. This can be achieved by political reform, awareness of climate through events and actions from Parliament. What a great, refreshing perspective from Frank. My next comments are from 16-year-old Lockie Forshaw, who is from a cattle station 200 kilometres away from Broome in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Lockie Forshaw writes, In 20 years, I expect Australia's rural areas to have similar facilities to those available in the cities. The ways that this can be achieved for by example, covering rural areas with good internet, probably 5G or 6G by then. I believe this is important as currently kids and families grow up without communication with the outside world and often have social and educational issues when they're older or leave home. 
easier access to food would also greatly benefit our rural areas by placing more roadhouses along highways and in more remote areas. Growing up in a cattle station, I know that it can be expensive to simply drive to a town or your local community often 100 kilometres away just to get food. If we don't resolve these issues, families living in rural areas will be forced to leave and move to the city, and food production and the identity of true Australians will be lost. Well done, Lockie. And as someone who's a regular traveller across the Kimberley region, I know well the very long stretches of road and the isolation that can bring to pastoral communities across the far north of Western Australia. I commend these two young West Australians for their concern and, their for, and for their vision of Australia. I remind my Senate colleagues from across the chamber of the responsibility that we owe to young Australians. They are the national leaders of tomorrow. Senator O'Neill. Sure, Mr President, and I want to acknowledge that today um, a great trauma came to the communities around Kembla Grange in New South Wales where a train was derailed. Um, in response to that, I know that the RTBU, ably led in New South Wales by the Branch Secretary Alex Classens and nationally by Mark Diamond, the National Secretary, uh, reached out to support the workers who were on those train and provide the support to wrap around that community. And that's just one of the things that that union would have done to support Australian workers today. I understand the, points, uh, the place has been declared a, a crime scene and I hope that that community can recover from the shock of that experience and I know that they'll look after each other as best as they can. I also want to acknowledge that um, at the recent New South Wales Labor conference, a contribution was made by uh, the uh, branch secretary of the USU, Graham Kelly, OAM, and he acknowledged the amazing work of our council workers, particularly in the context of the pandemic. And uh, he said very, very true words when he spoke that council workers continue to deliver the services that our communities rely upon every single day, and our local communities and their families rely upon all of these people, those who provide childcare, aged care, the construction of munip municipal roads and infrastructure, public amenities, parks and reserves, recycling, waste collection, recycling, uh, green waste collection, uh, development and planning, footpaths, drainage, road maintenance, swimming and leisure centres, regulatory controls, parking, lifeguards, regional water and sewerage, animal control and welfare and sale yards. He said they're just some of the many services that are consistently delivered by council workers. And I want to add my thanks to those who undertake those important roles in our community and acknowledge the support that they're given by the union, the USU, who make sure that those 55,000 uh, New South Wales council workers and 365,000 council workers across Australia get the support that they need by having a great union. So unions supporting people in a time of crisis today, unions supporting people who are vital to our community. And finally, I want to make some remarks about another great piece of work that the unions do, and that is researched into our community. And I want to acknowledge the leadership of the New South Wales branch by Mr Bernie Smith of the SDA, the Union for Workers in Retail, Fast Food and Warehousing, um, also the Northern Branch leader, Barbara Niebart, and the federal leader of the SDA, uh, Gerard Dwyer, for this amazing piece of research. 6,500 people responded to a survey. It's called The Challenges of Work, Family and Care, and it documents the, really the significant challenges that are being faced by Australians uh, in this Who Cares report. It outlines the dilemma for many workers uh, of how they struggle to balance casual and often insecure work with family obligations. 55 per cent of all participants in the research did some sort of regular unpaid care, help or assistance to a child or a young person or to an adult person with a disability or a person with long-term illness or health condition. Many of the workers surveyed are in that sandwich generation, sandwiched between their kids and their increasingly elderly parents. Yet the report shows that they lack genuine choice about their childcare arrangements, that their shifts are shaped by their employer's thirst for profit rather than taking care of their staff and enhancing their business in such a, in such a sensible way, and that insecure and irregular work only adds to the stresses around care. Um, the quotes from the workers in this report are shocking. Um, one, reported, uh, one worker reported it was hard to jump straight back into full-time work while juggling a sick baby. 
I had no sick leave entitlements. It was hard. I was made to feel like I had to get straight back into it full force or they'd find someone to replace me, said the mother of a child with a disability. Another related her situation plainly. I'm a single mother that gets no child support and lives week to week on my wages. These women and their colleagues carried us through the pandemic, yet they are still, at this point of time, incredibly insecure in terms of their financial well-being. Even for part-time workers, the low base hour rate on, con on part-time contracts, as short as three hours in some cases, are simply not enough to base their life around and manage their very important care obligations. This report uh, talked about the disadvantage for kids uh, who cannot participate in sport or extracurricular activities because their parents can't get a regular shift. These are vital findings about the reality of working people in Australia in the retail industry, and I commend all of those unions, the SDA, the USU and the RTBU, to this Senate. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr President. I rise to note International Pregnancy and Infant Loss Remembrance Day on 15 October. And I'm pleased that earlier this year we moved that the Senate itself recognises this day. This recognition builds on the work of our 2018 Senate inquiry, where we heard devastating evidence about the six babies who are stillborn in Australia every day. Our inquiry learnt how First Nations peoples and peoples from diverse communities have much higher rates of stillbirth, and how listening to women's experiences and voices can make such a difference to medical outcomes. The government adopted the recommendations of our inquiry, and it's good to note the progress that's been made implementing them. And it's critical that this progress continue because stillbirth is a tragedy. And my heart goes out to everyone who has experienced losing a baby. I thank those in this chamber and in the community who have taken the time this week to note the day, to share stories and to reach out to those of us who have experienced stillbirth. The loss of my daughter Rose 26 years ago will never leave me. Supporting each other and sharing our stories and taking the action we can to help reduce the rate of stillbirth is truly life-saving work. This week is Anti-Poverty Week, an opportunity to learn more about the experiences of poverty in Australia. And no one needs more of an education on this issue than our Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. I recently heard from Melissa, a 39-year-old woman from Adelaide who's on Job Seeker. She lives with chronic illnesses and severe mental health issues that make it incredibly difficult for her to work. So she's been relying on Job Seeker for many years. She told me, I have absolutely no savings at all. Basically, you just have to wish for the best, that the fridge doesn't break, that you don't need new shoes. Anything like that puts a strain on the budget. Every day, millions of Australians like Melissa are being forced to make choices that no one should ever have to make. Like, do you buy food or medication between keeping a roof over your head or having shoes that don't have holes in them? But it doesn't have to be this way. Last year, when people started receiving the COVID supplement, we finally saw what it could be like if we designed our economy to work for everyone, not just the mega wealthy few. For Melissa, receiving the COVID supplement transformed her life. She told me, a lot of amazing things actually happened to me. I didn't need iron infusion, infusions because I could actually afford to eat properly. It's actually life-changing. It's being able to do things. It was the first time in five years I was able to buy a winter coat. It shouldn't be like that. People should be able to buy winter clothing. But once again, the government has left Melissa and hundreds of thousands like her out in the cold, plunging the rate of job seeker back to a measly $44 a day. Poverty is a political choice. It's a policy choice. Prime Minister Scott Morrison is choosing to abandon his citizens, choosing to trap them in a cycle of poverty, choosing to give tax cuts to billionaires instead of raising the rate of job seeker above the bloody poverty line. This morning I read in Food Bank Australia's annual food hunger report that one in six Australian adults haven't had enough to eat in the last year. And on top of this, 1.2 million children have gone hungry in this period. And the two main reasons reported for food insecurity were unexpected expenses or overall low income. Why is it 
that we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet adults and children go hungry due to financial insecurity. It's because the Morrison government has made a deliberate choice to keep people on JobSeeker below the poverty line. They don't care that people are literally starving because of that choice. Research shows that unlike in 2007, when job seekers were typically able-bodied young men looking for work, today people on job seeker are likely to be older, to be women and, importantly, to only have a partial capacity to work due to chronic illness or disabilities. People like Melissa. People who shouldn't be demonised by their own government. It's not right and it does not have to be this way. I call on the Australian government to permanently raise the rate of job seeker above the poverty line to at least $80 a day and to end this cycle of poverty once and for all. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. I rise tonight to speak on the Raise Our Voice in Parliament campaign as some of my colleagues have done so uh, previously. This campaign gives the youth across our nation the opportunity to have their voices heard within the parliament. I'd like to thank all of the young people who have participated this year. Some 600 submissions were made and they've partnered with 46 members of parliament and 22 senators from across the political spectrum. We may have our points of difference in this place, However, I believe that each and every one of us all acknowledge the importance of involving young people in our political processes. I believe that we should always be open to the idea that there is more that we can be doing to involve young people in our political life and engage with them. Having said that, I'm very happy to be standing here tonight to read a speech that was put before me a speech with some very topical and current observations. This speech has been written and submitted by a young man, Mr Alexander Batchen from Macdonald College in North Strathfield. I commend Mr Batchen on his thoughtful and observant comments and I hope that he will continue to take an active interest in the goings on in this place. So without further ado, this is Mr Batchon's speech. 2020 was a challenging year for young people and 2021 has shaped to be much the same, albeit with a light at the end of the tunnel. Vaccination. Young people have felt the brunt of coronavirus restrictions and were most affected by lockdowns. This was the case due to their employment often being in industries impacted the most by lockdowns, be it cinemas shutting down or wearing masks at Woolworths. While young people have been left at the end of the queue for vaccinations, although on sound health advice, with more of the general population, including young adults, becoming eligible to be vaccinated, I implore young people across Australia and especially in my home state of New South Wales to take this incredible opportunity afforded to them and protect themselves, their loved ones and their communities from the vicious scourge of COVID-19. Our generation has the capability to act based on science like none before. It is time for Australia to move out of the darkness of the past two years. Characterised by disunity, lockdowns and fear, and for us to move forthrightly as a nation, not divided but united, around a shared set of democratic values to tackle the big issues that this place was meant to debate without the spectre of COVID haunting us any longer. Vaccination is the path out of this pandemic, and it is up to each of us how far we walk. Now, after reading that, I think you'll agree that what I've just read contains some extraordinarily perceptive commentary. As a mother of teenagers myself, I can attest that the pandemic and the accompanying restrictions have taken a very heavy toll on young people. I'm very sympathetic on this issue 
And I think in this place we should all be mindful of the challenges faced by our young people, particularly those at school or who have just entered the workforce. I am particularly alert to the difficulties faced by our senior students who are trying to sit their final exams this year, and I wish them all the best, the very best. And uh, They should take pride in the fact that after two years of lockdowns and school shutdowns um, that they will be able to graduate this year, hopefully, and hopefully um, lead a very successful and fruitful life. This speech also touched on the employment and economic challenges of the pandemic for young people. And I know that's been very difficult, so I commend Mr Batchon and all his counterparts and friends, and I thank them for their patience, and I thank them for rolling up their sleeves and coming forward. It is a good reality check for us to be hearing from young people, because there is still so much more we can do. Thank you very much, Mr Batchon. Senator Sheldon. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Well, transport workers have been the def definition of essential workers throughout this pandemic. They have kept supermarket shelves stocked. They have put vaccines and medical supplies into hospitals. They have continued to work day and night to keep Australia moving through lockdowns, often pulling their own health and well-being at peril in the process. They don't ask for much in return. But they do want the same thing that every worker in Australia wants, job security. Over the last few weeks, with the support of the Transport Workers' Union, transport workers from across Australia have taken legal strike action to protect their job security. They have taken strike action over attempts by transport companies to undercut them by bringing in outside hire and labour hire and lower rates of pay. As soon as companies can bring in a second class of worker on lower rates of pay, we know they will eventually be used to squeeze the existing workforce out. We've seen it happen in the mining sector, where companies like BHP have booted workers onto labour hire contracts to cut their pay by up to 40 per cent. At many mines in Queensland, labour hire now accounts for a majority of the workforce. At Toll Group, FedEx, Bev Chain, Lynn Fox and Star Trek, employee drivers and owner drivers have stood together and fought for their job security. Their collective voice and power has been brought their, these larger employers back to the negotiating table. The toll group, Lynn Fox and Bev Chain, have reached an in principle agreement with their workers while talks are ongoing with FedEx. Disgracefully, there's one holdout, Star Trek a company fully owned by the Australian government. The two ministerial shareholders, Mr Fletcher and Mr Birmingham, should come out here and explain why their company is fighting tooth and nail against the job security of the Australian workforce. In some yards in South Australia, Star Trek is already using labour hire to perform 70 per cent of the work alongside other outside hire. Last week, both Star Trek and the Transport Workers Union appeared at the Senate Select Committee on Job Security. We heard from Matthew Spring, who had worked for Star Trek for the last seven years. Here's what Matthew had to say. When I first started working for Star Trek, we had very little outside hire. What we have now is 20 regular outside hire people who come in every day. When we talk to them and we question them about what they're getting paid, they tell us that they're on $25 an hour flat and on an AVM. If one of them has an accident, they no longer come to work. That's the last time we'll see them. If someone brings too much freight back, that's the last time we see them. The company dismisses them. If they talk to me as one of the site delegates and um, talk to me about also the strike action that's going on, we don't see them again. They just disappear and new people come in to take their place. Now we also received evidence that these labour hire firms, these labour hire workers and outside workers are engaged on sham contracting arrangements 
in order to circumvent the temporary migrant visa restrictions. Now, this is an outrageous situation for a government-owned agency. Rather than engage in good faith on these issues, Star Trek has been launching slurs and lies at their own workforce. The TWU promised that industrial action would not disrupt medical supplies. This is a long-established process that has worked smoothly on numerous previous occasions. Star Trek showed up to the job security hearing last week and claimed that 1,500 medical deliveries had been disrupted. But here's the truth. If there are any medical deliveries disrupted, that is a sign of the incompetence and lack of foresight of the Star Trek management. Star Trek workers are going back on strike at midnight tonight. I stand in solidarity with the TWU, Star Trek workers and all drivers who are fighting for their job security. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Rachel.